compared to the civil war in Nigeria, where the virtually every decision the Fulanese has taken in Nigeria somehow most time doesn't emanate from them. It comes from the metropole, you know, because I don't know. It's still a complex thing to explain why you know the British feels that the best partner they could have in Niger, in Niger area is the Fulanese. But like also the moderator said, it's still also uh, a puzzle to solve that when they got to the old Indian area where you had India, Pakistan, and then uh, uh, Bangladesh and the other little, little countries around them, they choose the, you know, the Muslim Pakistan as against the, the Hindu India. You know, the same thing also happened even when they were in the Middle East after the, the First World War. Uh, somehow, they, they, were, they still left the place, you know, promising to hand over everything to the Muslims in that area. Before the Zionist uh, declaration, you know, was able to say, no, we we'll have to also take what belongs to us, which I feel, you know, we're supposed to do here in Nigeria. No wonder, therefore, we could see that uh, good luck at some point as president of Nigeria could not actually uh, procure arms from, from the West, not from the British, not from the America, you know, and um, trying to do it through the black market. Somehow uh, it was termed um, um, financial smuggling or arms smuggling or, or corruption and so on and so forth. But we have, we've seen it in Buhari that most time he gets if not of late, that uh, the performances of a particular helicopter will, would be restricted. He gets it anyhow he, he wants. But the puzzle is not difficult to solve. It is because um, Nigeria, especially, because that's where my, our attention is, is source of solution to their own economic problem. You know, emanating from Berlin Conference was less than 100 years after French Revolution. And when it appears, though, the whole of Europe will go under a revolution if nothing is done. The strongest man in Europe then, Otto von Bismarck in Germany, you know, had to put all of them together. And they agreed that, listen, for us to allow ourselves to implode and have our major population kill all of us, let's help them, you know, channel them and let them go to Africa and flex their muscle with, the, with these Bush people. So, and the outcome of that... Uh, non-consultation decision that took place against the African people is still what we are, we are suffering today. You know, so much so that it's quite difficult that even the British could not say, it's easier for, for them to always say, these are sponsors of terror in any other, part of the, any other part of the world. They publish the names and everything. But when it comes to Nigeria, we just don't know. Initially, the Fulanese were not viewed to be of that skin like us because they are descendants of the Beba people, or you call them the Tuareg, you know, the original owners of um, North Africa, you know, before the Arabs took over what belonged to them. Maybe as a loss to Arab, they came down and somehow, through hybrid mating and marriage, they gave birth to the Fulanese who are now doing to us what we have allowed them to do to us. And not that we are incapacitated, but because we have refused to to be united. So uh, this also led to during colonialism and after colonialism, they they, they made sure that the hedge money that they met, um, they feel that the Fulani should have is is perpetuated and left behind. And. If you go through uh, uh, Max Leon's book, I saw, there's a page where Max Leon mentioned that the, 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 the British told the North to put all their children in the army, that the, the strength of Nigeria as an underdeveloped country is not in its democracy, but in its soldier. So, so no wonder why, though they did not have much of the non-commissioned officers, but their foot soldiers were uncountable, even those that could barely just write their own name. And they were all there. So eventually, they were we had independence. Independence did not last long. It was a civil war. And we all knew how the civil war went. And up to today, Nigerian problems still persist. 
Some people believe that it's not only economic reason that made British to put us together, but I, some of us who also have some knowledge on economic history, you know, still know that economy was the main reason. Some also believe that there's a prestige that they want to also appear as the owners of the biggest um, uh, colonies in Africa, as they called Nigeria the most populous black nation. So our problem still persists and um, the problem is still full and, and it has been what it is then. What, what, what was it that it was then that is still now? Just like Bonka rightly explained, they never wanted a Western kind of education. The most colonial authority after Lord Lugard, up to the little thing, you know, little thing constitution that came last, they all hated it. Well, apart from that, they, of course, the hate, their hate on Igbo people is not is not uh, is not up for discussion. But they very much also hated the Yoruba people because the first kind of local um, own locally owned newspaper came out in Yoruba land called Iwe Irui. Iwe Irui was printed by Yoruba people in their own language to educate their people about what was happening then. So the British felt that the local people were knowing too much about them, and then. Um, the feudal system in Yoruba land is not the same thing as it was in Hausa land. The, the Yoruba land has a feudal system that is, that has, that is endowed with checks and balances. You know, where, of course, we knew that lots of um, um, uh, traditional rulers in Yoruba land were forced to commit suicide, like uh, the Yoruba women's riots that were pioneered by Fela's mother. It, part of the problem was also an, an arbitrary kind of taxation. Somehow, even Yoruba people were partially used to paying tax. How do I mean by tax? It is in traditional Yoruba uh, constitution or authority that the people will even take care of their kings. Somehow, they will, every year, every month, they put finances together for their king. In Igbo land, the king works for himself. Everybody works for themselves. So with the, in Igbo land, the taxation became a, more, a much more failure in Igbo land because Igbos has never paid tax before. Um, Yoruba somehow have been able, because I call it taxation, for you to contribute for, for, for people you have chosen or the tradition has selected to lead you. Uh, it's a form of taxation. But the British now brought a very high-handed one that they have never seen before. And a commoners, you know, a popular opinion in Yoruba land caused um, the leader of Yoruba people to open the calabash and kill himself. And we all knew that such a thing cannot happen in, in, in Fulani owned house alert. Instead of the, uh, an Emir to, to kill himself, the Emir rather kill like 1,000 people and nothing happens. So these are part of what actually amazed the British about the, the people and the cultures of the Southern Nigeria. So their hate knew no boundary then. Until today, it's still the same thing. And that is why. It, when he appears, though a brilliant person will come to, to lead Nigeria, especially from the south, you know, they will, they, they, will, they will permit an environment that will scuttle everything. Is either the person is killed? Yes, um, MKO was killed, but we all also knew that the, the Abacha and Abdul Salam and many other people that were in that, um, in that cabinet that led to MKO's death, even though Abacha had died before them. The British cannot claim to be innocent in that because till today, people will tell you that they were following others. But we know that all that is a handbook of British. The Nazis people in Nuremberg trial that actually killed the Jewish, many of them were following others, but eventually many of them were executed and some life imprisonment and so on and so forth. But when it comes to Nigeria, it is that they are following order and the dead is dead and we just fold our hands. There's nothing new that is happening today. Sometime in 1966, what was happening then was worse than to me what is happening now. It, they've mastered the art of betrayal, divide and rule, and nobody who they've actually used for dividing and ruling their people that it ended well with, nobody. Starting from 
the Afonja and so on and so forth. They will always find a way to use you when it's convenient and mess you up when when the time is due and once they get another person. Zig foolishly joined them. Forgive me for that language. But eventually himself was also frustrated because at some point in 1962, Nigeria was for three days without a leader, no prime minister, because it's the duty of the ceremonial president to call the, the prime minister, to call the parliament, and also then they'll pronounce the prime minister the leader of the country. But eventually, when he saw the handwriting on the wall that the British were on the side of of Tafua Balewa, Zik subpedal and government of uh, Nigeria was eventually empowered to do their job. And they don't care. They always do it to have their way. That was what led to Western Nigerian uh, political riot, where a lot of people were killed, even in the face of truth. Someone who the, whom the people voted for would be announced the loser. Um, and and nothing happens. If you check Max Elon's book, uh, in one of the books, we, because I, I remember to say that when, when um, Bunker was talking about how they want to mess up Zeke and also his financial institution, and one thing that the Fulanese has learned is that they learned very well. They just do it as though they are the British. They know how to tackle the strength that is making you to be an opposition or to do what you do. They, they, they just disable you. At some point when the Western Nigeria was the most developed, almost region, indigenous region in Africa, let me say Sub-Saharan Africa, the first television, the first stadium, the first uh, universal free education, the first universal uh, primary health care, everything, everything our world did in the West was the first, the first. He was a trailblazer, the first, the first. Tafel Baloya just woke up one day and, you know, came out with 1961 Banking Act. The Banking Act was, target, was targeted at National Bank of Nigeria, an Udua group of company. That is the bank that actually harnesses the income of Western Cocoa and every other thing that comes from Western Nigeria. From nowhere, you know. But thank God then Nigeria had a bold, a bold, um, uh, legal practitioner in the name of uh, Oyama. I think his son is the, the, the Buhari's uh, foreign minister person now. Oyama ruled Oyama against. Oyama. Uh, yes, Oyama ruled. Yes, Oyama ruled, ruled against Tafua Balewa and said that no, it is wrong. This this banking act is illegal and unconstitutional, and that was how our war and the Western Nigeria continued in what they were doing. They did not rest until they messed up Western Nigeria. They did not rest. And one thing is constant. Anytime you see them down south, it is to divide and rule us. The same thing the British did, creating of um, uh, eastern region away from the western region was so that, the, so that the markedly difference between an average Yoruba man and average Ijo Ibo and the Bibio Efik and Co. would become glossy. And the minute they did it, it became glossy. It became obvious that we're actually not one as we believe we've been. And quarrel started. And not long they, you know, they also follow the Tafabella also copied them in doing the, the, the Midwestern region. Not long it became obvious that oh, the Midwestern people are not after all as complete as Igbo as they are supposed to be. You know, they kept brainwashing us. Oh, all of a sudden, ah. Okay, um, you know, the worries are not very much Yoruba as they are supposed to be. If these are the same thing the British taught the Fulanese, they've been doing it today. If you remember today, they are preparing for an Ambre election. Sorry, Echo. Yeah, go on, Matt. We're listening. Okay. So it, it hasn't changed. That same um, uh, dotted colors of leopard is still what it is. Now, the 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 wonder, the wonder among all these things is that we the southerners.
have refused to do Okay, Max, I think we're having issues with your internet. Max? We're, we're having... It's not as it. if what they're doing is new. What Max, they are doing you're, is you're new. in the matrix, Max. They did it to our great-great-grandfather. They did it to our fathers. And they are gradually Max, can you maybe you can leave and come back? Max, maybe you can leave. We have a constitution that reads with the people. But I Max, we're not hearing you very well. That none of us was was involved. Uh, not in the last twenty seconds, sadly. Um, yeah, you might want to maybe step out and come back. Um, uh, in the meanwhile, Max, um, it's clear from all that you have said that there is a consensus that colonialism was an ideology uh, founded starkly on divide and rule, and that colonial powers created ethnic boundaries and differences to suit colonial administrative aims. These things have been well documented. Uh, but in the meanwhile, let's bring in D again to tell us about industries that dominated Nigeria in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. D, are you there? Thank you very much. So I'll continue. Um, I don't know why network is really attacking today the moderators. It's really affecting the running of the program, but hey, it is what it is. So I put here the picture, and this picture will tell you, uh, you see a map, and you know, we can talk about agriculture, and we will talk about agriculture, but I wanted us to talk about industries, because a lot, uh, a lot of the time, uh, they tell you about all the great, maybe we talk about cocoa, we talk about palm oil, palm canyon, granite, but a lot of times we don't even talk about the agriculture or industrialization of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it's so... It's so sad because if you if you see what if you understand what was happening then, and you put it side by side with what is happening now, you would probably be very frustrated as to why we let go of all those, you know, industrializations or industrial ideas of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and we pretty much regressed from 1966. And I'll start telling you why. Uh, let's talk about canning. So canning is what we now know as uh, bottle production, right? Uh, in the night, and I'm reading specifically from page 300 of the book. So in canning, uh, food canning started in Nigeria in, 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 uh, in 1949 with small hand canning uh, machines and hand canning factories set up in Lagos. And it's very interesting because they really wanted to start doing things like sardines. So they wanted to can fish, they wanted to can fat. And by 1951, a factory in Ibadan, had successfully started canning grapefruit and grape juice. In fact, in their first year of production, uh, they produced um, 392,000 cans of grapefruit and 58,000 cans of grapefruit juice, and also 5,000 cans of pineapple crush slices, crush and slices, and 2,000 cans of other uh, unclassified stuff. So this was the earliest, um, you know, uh, production of canned goods in Nigeria and it was it was even for exports you know uh, it was so large that it was it was the entire business was set up for export and I think we were sabotaged by the British because after we started to reach like commercial quantities they now uh, made the UK government the sole importer and they, they set the prices so low that it meant that we couldn't you know they it's called like an economic sabotage so if you want to, if you want to, what do they call it now? Make sure that goods can't get into your country. Just increase, um, crash the prices. Tell your um, your colonial territories that this is the price we are going to ban, um, buy the things from you and all of that. So the British are very clever. They sabotaged our canning industries, but it still tried for local markets up until the time it failed. And as a matter of fact, by 1954, there were two factories in the West, and the North was already uh, setting up a, a factory in 1955. 
So that is scanning. The next thing we'll talk about is boat building. And this is something we, we don't do in commercial quantities anymore. As a matter of fact, one of the, one of the biggest um, um, uh, indi uh, indicators of how far we've regressed economically is that Nigeria is one of the few coastal nations that is still a net importer of fish, despite the abundance of fish that we have in our sea. So one thing we've not been able to do is to invest uh, significantly in the fish uh, industry. And that particular industry is something that can actually be like a protein supplement industry that can reduce our dependence on uh, on cow, fulani cows to be specific. But for some reason, we've, we've killed our boat building industries. And I'll tell you what, in, a, in um, 1956, there were three boat making uh, factories, all trained by British boat builders in Okobo, in Makodi and in Ekwe, and they were building 15 tons uh, trolling vessels, and it was self propelled badges, and these were real, like, very decent things to have at that time. Many of those, you know, great economic developments have since been eroded since the 50s and uh, since from 1966 going forward. Another sad one is that we were also a textile... Um, we're also converting cotton to textile. So we're not just exporting the cotton, but we're also, we also we had a huge bills of cotton being produced. And the demand was gradually drying up in Lancashire. So we started to, you know, refine our cotton. And we had, like, um, um, what did they call it? Uh, cotton training centers, textile training centers, where you could be taught how to, you know, convert this tech cotton to textile and all of that. And it was in Kano, Sokoto, Ilori, Adoikiti, or your Aochi and Aba. And they were all very successful. They were even milling as much as 60 mils, you know, a day. And this was some of the things that we have since we used to do. And it was very, very successful for in the Northern region because what basically meant was that they are, huge expanse of cotton were, were basically converted into uh, uh, a textile. It was so successful that they set up uh, the Lancashire company, they came to set up a, a company in Nigeria just for the purpose of exploitation of the, uh, the uh, textile industry. And they even set up one another firm they set up, they set up with a share capital of one million British pounds in um, with, with um, the Northern region as one of the development boards, and also Kaduna as one of the development or Kaduna textile company. So this is just to give you an insight into what we have done in, in textile. One one area again that you know that we can see how far we've regressed is in cement. Cement was was first discovered in, and I'm sure uh, somebody from Ebony State is about to smile in a, in a, in a, uh, Ishelu local government of Ebony State in a place called Nkalagu. And I do hope I got the pronunciation correctly. And it was it was so good at the time it was discovered because it was going to complement like the factories that were going to, you know, mine the extensive limestone deposits. They were taking coal straight from Enugu, so it was a coal factory setup. You know, you know, if you know a lot about converting limestone to cement, it's something that requires a lot of heat. So in that process, they were they were they were taking local coal using it to 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 to, to um, support the cement factory in Nkalago, and it was a very big thing. It actually led to a lot of... Um, the, 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 the cement was taken for a lot of road constructions in the 1950s, uh, you know? It, and um, also, um, in um, very not long after that, there was also considerable deposits found in... Um, I think it's Ewekoro and some other places as well. This, uh, this, there was also, um, so when the, the second, the Inkalago factory was followed by another factory called um, the Associated Portland Cement Manufacturers Limited, which is what we later know, uh, and, and it was after the West African Portland Cement, which was when they, they found um, significant limestone deposits in, in Ilaro community, very close to the Daume border. And of course, they found more cements all over the place. And in terms of, and this was something that really contributed to large road production, large construction. The construction boom of the 1958 to 60s was largely supported by cement coming out of Irikoro, coming out of um, Daome, coming out of Ngalago. And the best part is that all these things were like public-private entities, where you know a percentage of it was held by the regional board and a percentage of it was held by the foreign investors that were sort of you know coming to set it up now compare that with what we have today where you have cement and and the entire you know ownership of the cement is owned by individuals you know after they paid the the you know the 
you know, the mining rights or whatever through monopolies. So you had a situation whereby if cement was discovered in a region, the people of that region were the greatest beneficiaries. Let me give you an example. That away Koro cement that was discovered, the, let me give you a breakdown of the, the ownership. So private sector owned about 61% of the, of, the, of the ownership of the company, of the cement company. So associated partner cement manufacturers cement owned 51%, and United Africa Company Limited owned 10%. Why West Africa or West Nigeria Development Corporation owned 39%. So it was like a public-private partnership, in which case the cement will belong to the people, but it will be developed with funds from, you know, the external people, and then the profits will, will be shared in that um, percentage sharing, you know, in that revenue, which means that at every point in time, the, 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 West, um, the, the like, regional governments got a, a chunk of, of the revenue from their natural resources. Now, compare that to what we have today, where... You know, we have super monopolies where people can own the cement of the entire country, produce it, set the prices, and they just pay, you know, the influencers or the middlemen, the government, a, 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 tax, a tax that they can even decide that they are going to underpay and, and you know, get tax credit and all of that. So there's been a lot of manipulation of the system since the 60s. And I think that maybe Wang Bonka Kome will give us a lot of insight into that. In terms of cigarette too, you know, the, the situation is the same. If you look at soap, we're producing soap in Aba. There was a factory in 1957 called uh, the Patterson Zucchini uh, uh, and Zucchini's uh, Company Limited. And this was one of the uh, um, factories in Aba that was producing soap. And it was, it was producing about 5,000 tons of plain and carbonic soap per annum. So these are real, like, spots of industrialization happening in all over the country. Uh, we also had... Um, Nigerian breweries in, uh, in 1949, they were producing stab beer as far back as then. Same thing as um, uh, a brewery exhibition in London. And it was um, a branch of the company also opened in Aba just for the purpose of uh, d domestic production of beer, right? In, um, in terms of um, margarine, and there was a company called Van de Berge Nigeria Limited. And by 1954, they had begun the production of margarines in Nigeria. And this was, uh, they, they, were, they were producing so much margarine that it was, they, it, was an, it was a surplus, like butter was surplus in Nigeria. So margarine was being exported. You know, these are some of the feats of the, of the 1950s. So you can imagine in Nigeria where blue band is surplus, so much so that blue band is being exported from Nigeria because our production for our production in comparison to local demand was excess. So this are, and they took advantage of the abundance of palm oil and palm canyon. They refined it into uh, margarine and exported the excess. So these are just some of the feats of our founding fathers. I can talk about plastic as well. The first plastic factory was actually uh, uh, in 1957. Don't forget that rubber production had been going on even since the 1800s. Uh, the entire, I was going to read a portion after Gunka mentioned it, but I just decided to skip it. Do you know that the rubber of the 19th century that built Europe, like most of the uh, bicycles and motor cars, they, they got their rubber from Nigeria. In fact, it became so bad that there was a lot of competition that they were sending, you know, the, the, the demand for, for, for Nigerian rubber was so, so much that they had to send, like, European people to come and train our people how to properly tap you know, uh, um, 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 the, 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 palm oil, um, the rubber trees. As a matter of fact, there was this um, story about how, you know, the Brazilians were, were basically the, the ones that had, like, a dominance of that trade. But after a while, the, the quality of rubber they were getting from even the untrained, you know, West African or West Nigerian, uh, Nigerian um, rubber, rubber people was so good that they had to say, you know what, rather than buy this, um, like, low quality rubber from Brazil that will go to, to West Africa, train these people and then buy their rubber. And the rubber largely built the bicycles and the, 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 the cars of the 19th century of Europe. So that is how, just, just to give you a perspective of just how important the country was. Now we'll talk about the, the, 
the biggest, you know, the good and the bad. Of course, oil too came. In 1953 was actually when they declared that they actually saw oil first. Even though they had discovered oil as far back as 1935 in the eastern region, but they had claimed that it was not commercial quantities according to documentations, even though they had been exporting the oil through uh, the, the sea badges, which was one of their incentives to to, to to develop the boating industries in, Opo, in Opobo so that they could cargo it out, you know, from the interland. But one thing that struck is that they said that there was a lot of disappointment until they got into the um, 1956 when they discovered, you know, Oloibiri and they started to, you know, export it in commercial quantities. In fact, they laid pipelines and all of that to export oil, to export coal as well. And they also got tin oil from Middle Belt as well. So I put a... a a, a, pic, a picture of the map of Nigeria on my PTR. So you can see where all the um, major factories and what, what was galvanizing them. In terms of the, let's look at the, the north now. Let's look at it from the northeast now. So in the northeast, there were tanning factories for, of course, ice and skins in Maiduguri. In Kano, there was a granite milling factory. There was a cotton spinning factory. And there was a iron factory, you know, rot iron factory for making like things like oars and cutlasses and stuff like that. And they had also started a printing press, mostly to support Islamic education and all that. In, in Sokoto, there was a tanning factory. In Zaria, they were manufacturing sim, uh, cigarettes. So I think that was one of the um, ma manufacturing uh, places for British American tobacco. And in Zaria as well, there was also a railway engineering company to basically rail rail tracks from, from the north and you know, assist to take it all the way to the south. In Kaduna, there was a cotton spinning and textile uh, uh, manufacturing factory. Ironically, in Joss, and this is something that would just, I don't want to say to make us sad, but if you just think of how far we've come, you know, there was a tire making factory in Joss, and it was a tire retreading factory. And there was also a tin smelting factory in Joss as well. As well as uh, in Abuja, there was a pottery factory. I already talked about the 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 um, fruit um, fruit canning factory of of, of the west of of um, of Ibadan. But I also I also wanted to mention that there was also brewing, there was cement, and there was cement manufacturing. So these are some of the factories in the west at that time. If you look at the eastern region, there was a boat building factory. There was a pottery in Obududen basically to refine uh, cow produce and all that. There was a cement uh, manufacturing factory in Ungalu. There was a coal mining factory, the pottery factory, and a terra terrazzo tiles making factory in Enugu. You know, there was a, a new manufacturing factory in Onicha, which was a very big deal at that time as well. There was in, in um, Sapele, there was a um, plywood manufacturing factory. In Benin, there was a uh, sawmill, uh, sawmilling factory and a rubber processing factory. In, um, in Ikorodu, there was a pottery factory. In um, Potakot, there was an iron mining factory, a cigarette factory, soft drink manufacturing factory, uh, cool oil extracting factories, of course, and the metal and uh, metal doors and windows production factories, all in Potakot at that time. And of course, in Lagos, there was the railway engineering factory. There was a lot of foundry works, a lot of brewery works, uh, textile manufacturing, furniture manufacturing. All of this was coming from Lagos. So this gives you an idea, you know, as to, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to call it the industrial age of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but the industrialization and to the degree that it existed. You know, it's, we are coming to a situation whereby now we are so import dependent that, you know, people, ministers will be making a uh, jest of Nigeria too, we import toothpicks and this and that. But this was not always the case. So if you look at it clearly, when we had the regional system of government, there were attempts by our founding fathers to lay some, some blocks, you know, some foundations for us. Look at the type of factories that, you know, they went out there, they established, and many of them were very successful. When I mean very successful, you can imagine even being a net exporter of things like butter, juice, and all of that. And these were things that we were able to do without, you know, just from having a regional structure, you know, just from having our, our destinies in our hands, so to speak. But of course, all of this development has been corroded after 66, and it just can't continue to get worse. And by the time we get into the economies of that time, you, you will now see it clearly in the numbers. So where we missed it, where we, I don't want to say where we, where we just, you know, when, when the old world was, you know, driving forward, we just went on the other side of the road and we started to destroy our, our, our industrial age. So now we are, we are going to, I'm going to take a pause for now, and I'll let, um, 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 yeah. Uh, 
It's Bonka <laughs> back. Okay, Bonka is uh, not back. I'll, I'll no, pause for now so we can take oh, Bonka is back, thank God. So I'll pause for now. Can you hear me? Bonka, yes, we can hear you very well. Please proceed. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry, I missed out for, for a second. Yes, but I was listening in, in, off and on and for a while. So what um what D was talking about was a very hello. Bonka, we can hear you. We've lost Bonka again. <laughs> Network Once again. Net Network has been very interested today, honestly. And and okay, I didn't want to talk about agriculture. I wanted to take it in the second section. But if Bunka is not in, let me just talk about agriculture because Please now we can... heard me. Yeah, yes. So we've talked about industry. You know that in most economies, like the breakdown of every economy, you know, you have your agri, you have your industry, you have your, you know, trade, uh, and all of that. And you've seen largely how we fared in terms of that particular. In fact, it got so bad that our canning industry will have gone so far. I didn't mean that we didn't get like trade sanctions from 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 the UK government trying to you know set lower tar tariffs lower than industrial margins. Okay, okay, fine. You cannot uh, destroy our 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 food juice factories in in the UK because there's a demand for uh, West African canned pineapples and grapefruit and grapefruit juices. So they started to set prices that they would buy from the, the local canning factories in Nigeria. But let's talk about agriculture because we hear about it a lot. And it's just good for us to know, okay, which parts of the country, uh, you know, did what, you know. In um, the north, there was excess of sugar. There was sugar production. And we're talking about the 40s to the 60s now, and even early parts of the 70s, sugar production, coffee production. There were some spouts of rice production that um, I remember reading it that they wanted to develop in the mid, the, the savannah regions, right? Uh, livestock production, there was eyes and skin as well, all in the north. Now, if you go to the Middle Belt, that's when you start having soya beans. Soya beans were so well grown in Benue State, for instance, that it was... Um, it was um, the 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 price was costing like a, a region a, a a a recession so to speak for other soya beans planters in the um in the in the whole of West Africa. That's how much soya beans was doing well for Benue State and Benin State. And then there's also cowpea seed as well, wild growing soya bean seed, all growing from Benue State. In terms of rubber. Uh, Bini and Sapele and most of the Miss Western region led the development of rubber. They were so good, and it was something that really brought a lot of, like I said, the industrialization of the 90s, especially for Europe, in terms of their bicycles, their cars, you know, even their their earliest forays into lights and all of that. It was all because of the, in fact, the the rubber of um, rubber ensured that it was so in high demand because they used it in boat boat uh, making. And they said that it helped to, um, to, to like a wedge to ensure that there was stability in the boat so that it couldn't go off tight. So rubber, rubber was actually in high demand. In tobacco as well, it was in high demand. It was not just for local uh, consumption, but also for exports. And both, and there were even tobacco, um, um, how do I say, tobacco refining factories now that converted it from from the tobacco leaves into cigarettes and such like British American tobacco in the north and also in the west there were small spouts of tobacco. Uh, a lot of things that a lot of people don't say is that cotton was only grown in the north and that's not true because if you do some research you find out that there was small cotton production in the west and there was a lot more in the north. Yes, very clear. Oil refining, uh, they, were, they, they started refining not just um, um, Palm kernel, palm kernel processing was as far back as 1965 in Ikeja and also in the Midwest and in Port Harcourt. You see several um, 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 palm kernel refining settlements. As a matter of fact, I remember reading also in this book that there were donations of and and kernel crushing machines strictly for uh, the western part of um, the southern part of the country because of the volume of palm that was coming out of there. So if you look at that, if you go to for granite now, four states dominated granite production. And this is something that granite had been produced in the north for more than a hundred years. So 
by that time it was like it was getting to a stage where it was being refined for exports to to suit the british market and it was kano borno castina and sokoto they were net exporters of of granite now 98 percent of the cocoa uh, crop production at the time was coming out of just two states or your states and on those states um more than um one million acres was planted the cocoa was such a blessing to the west uh, that it was you know, not just exported to the U.S. and to U.K., but also to the Netherlands. So the Netherlands had a lot of interest in, in the cocoa production in the West. They would even oftentimes do excavations, donate seeds. And I also remember in the earliest, um, what, one thing that led to cocoa to come in was um, in the 1900s, early 90s, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, the British um, missionaries, especially to the Christian population, were giving them cocoa like after conversion. So if you, if you, if you like take Christianity and all of that, they would just give you some cocoa seeds that go plant it, that there is a lot of benefits, but where they are coming from, that those things are not known to grow well there, but they were able to give them some seeds. And before uh, you could tell, uh, cocoa had overtaken, you know, the entire West in terms of Oyo State and uh, and on those stage, uh, in terms of cocoa production. So now you understand the agri products that dominated that time. Now you understand the industries that also dominated their time. And to the degree that it dominated it, I think maybe uh, in the next submission, I'll talk about the GDPs, I'll talk about the percentage distribution between the 50, uh, between 58 and 62, and between 62 and 66, so that you can start to see the percentage changes in things like agriculture, in trade. Then I'll also talk about, very important, the role that um, the foreign uh, aid, you know, how they were able to spike the economy, you know, uh, for themselves. You know, a country wants to do more trade with Nigeria, for instance. They will now come under the guise of foreign aid. And I know I've always been very suspicious of all this, like UNICEF, United Aid, Christian missionaries. I've always been asking myself, why are these people coming to your country to just give you free money? Well, it's never free money. They use it to drive imports from their countries. And I'll explain some in some chapters of the book. In, uh, so please, if you've not downloaded the shared book, please, this will be your last minute because in a minute time exactly, I'll be up updating it to the second book. And in the second book, that's where we talk about a lot more about the economies of the 60s. So thank you very much. Uh, I think our guest speaker is back. Boka. Yes, I really apologize about today. Uh, uh, for some reason, my internet packed up for me. I think it's the full and juju working. I don't know, but <laughs> so I, I, I'm not sure if I can be heard well That's now. That's messed up, Bonka. Just proceed. We can hear you. Okay. All right. Very well. So we cannot always look at uh, the economics, how the economics failed, without looking at the political failures. The the economic failure is a result of the political failures, now not the other way. It's so now, um, so you can see that the poverty or everything that you see wrong with Nigeria, they're not natural, they're artificial. And one of the things that makes it artificial is because we have someone else, some group of people that are still in Nigeria that think the same way the British think. So the British did not look at their colonies as places to develop. They looked at their colonies as places to get the raw materials that they needed. So it was a place that was designed for exploitation. Now, in the 50s, that started to change. It started to change a lot in the 50s. And what was the reason for these changes? Uh, the 40s and the 50s was the time when the British was not in control anymore. People were in, in control of their future. People were in control of their destinies. So it was also the age of idealism. So unlike today, where either you're PDP or you're APC, you don't represent a political philosophy. Now, if you if you listen to, what's his name? Um, the president of the United States, he represents a political philosophy, and that's because he was is a member of a particular party. So parties are usually um, planted based on ideologies. So that is why there used to be very important sociocultural groups that always fed into certain parties. For example, in the in the in the eastern region, there was the Igbo State Union that used to feed into the politics of that time. In the western region, there used to be Egbe Omo Dudua that used to feed into the politics of the time. And in the north, there was the Arawa Consultative Forum that used to feed into the politics of 
politics of that time, they had the, a blueprint, they had a clear blueprint. And now, for instance, I will all represent a political philosophy called democratic socialism. So we used to have a mistake of confusing democratic socialism to socialism. Now, the concept of socialism stays rob Peter to pay Paul. The concept of socialism says, give as much as you can, but only take as much as you need. So this is where it becomes very, very different in, in, in concept. Now, let me give an example. If you are a doctor and you make one million, but your need every day is 100,000, 900,000 will be taken from you. That's socialism. If you are a, a bricklayer, and you you earn fifty thousand, but what you need to survive is a hundred thousand. Fifty thousand will be added to you. If you ask me, it's a ridiculous way to to build a society. It kills in initiatives. It kills incentives. It kills drive. So that is not what democratic socialism is. Democratic socialism believes that all factors of production must be enhanced, and every factor of production includes human capital. So that is why you see that concepts of democratic socialism always builds very importantly on human, physical, and mental health. That is why you don't see anywhere where democratic socialism is being, being practiced, that there's no emphasis on mass education and mass health. Another very important thing that democratic socialism is, is big on is industrialization um manufacturing it's really really big on that and that was why in the 50s when Awolowo emerged and and showed up he started to build a lot of industrial bases you will see that most of the house uh, the estates the housing complex he built included a lot of industrial estates the keja house the keja industrial estate was built by him Akpapa and Olioli, they were all built by him. So all the blue chips companies that is around the Kedja, from Cadbury to Coca-Cola to Pepsi to Nestle, all those companies were brought by Awolowo in, in those times with an intent to turn the region into a manufacturing hub. And something else that they were doing at that time was that as they were inviting those companies, they were also equipping their agricultural base. So all the raw materials that were being used in those manufacturing companies were not being imported. They were being sourced for locally. And so that is why the Guinness, for example, the Guinness that is being sold in Nigeria is better than the Guinness that is being sold in Ireland. So if you are in any Western world and you want to buy the Guinness that they, they, they sell, that was produced in Nigeria, it's going to be sold to you at a higher price because the raw materials that came from Nigerian soil is more rich, is way richer than the ones that come from the other regions. This is where those situations came from. Now, um, from that thing, from that situation, he was able to build a very powerful manufacturing base in the Western region. And the person that will take over and initially in the Eastern region, he was concentrating, that was Zeke, he was concentrating on education. And um, that, that was the bigger thing that he was, he, he, he was big on. But the man that came after him, that was Michael Opara, also embraced another form of democratic socialism, but it was known as African socialism. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead, yeah. So, so it, it was known as African socialism, and that was how he was able to also build a lot of industrial situations, like the, like the. Um, of course, they used to credit Donald Duke with the Obudu Ranch situation, but that was actually at Opara. He also started um, building a lot of mass industrial estates, like the Trans Amadi and all those, all those situations. He also concentrated on big democratic socialism, but he now tilted his own to be homegrown African socialism in that he did not believe in bringing in foreign companies. He believed in a manufacturing hub from base. And shortly before the end of that situation, Opara was trying to transform the Eastern region into a mechanical hub. 
a place where they can build um, mechanical stuff, mechanical machines, cars, automobiles. That was what was going on shortly before the, the Biafra war. And that was one of the sentiments that went against that war in the West because they do not want any part of the region to, of, of, this, of the colonies to be a manufacturing hub. So you can see that all these things was going on in the South, but to be honest, nothing was going on in the North. With an ex exception to Amado Belo, it was not a place where they were planning to build a manufacturing hub. They didn't want to, they wanted a feudal structure that existed to remain in the North. They didn't want to transform it the way the South was being transformed. And the British was more comfortable handing over to them because they realized that with the Fulani people and the North in power, the, the region will never develop. And that is why um, Ahula was said in those days that the North is a dead weight on the South a slow but sure dead weight on the fast moving south. He said that in 1958, because he realized that their blueprints, what they were out to do was to turn Nigeria into the same thing that the British was doing. They just want to have a nobility class, the same way they're doing now, where they're just in Abuja. And I mean, if everybody here, when Tony Nandi was here, you will see that he was talking about the constitution, how to make sure they're not liable to you, all these things, but this is an exploitative environment. Everything about the constitution is just to exploit and distribute the wealth and legalize it, be it security votes, be it NNPC, be it fuel subsidy, everything you see is designed to exploit the system. So that was why when they, what they were trying to do, what Amadou Bello was trying to do was to create a permanent full and in supremacy over the whole country. And then to have the two regions in the south. So now, with with the British being able to now get um, Zeke to be on their side, the next thing they wanted to do is to bring Aulawa on their side. So what they tried to do, hello, can people still hear me? Yes, hello? I can hear you, Bonka. Yes, yes. You. sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm going into metrics. That's why I'm checking. So what they tried to do was now to bring Aulawa on board and said, okay, Aulawa, bring your party, let's destroy your position, and then let's just distribute this. We will be on top, and then we'll distribute ministerial appointments between the East, dominated by Igbos, and the West, dominated by Yoruba people. And Aulawa said, oh, no, I can't do that. They were going to give him the post of deputy prime minister and then give ministerial slots to... AG party and he said no what you guys are trying to do is to take Nigeria back to what the British was doing and just enjoy the benefits of off it and exploit the system he now started working with the middle belt that was when they created the UNBC and was now working with the um with Opara who was the successor of Zeke and had a different philosophy as well and he was also starting to see that it was really dangerous thinking to have um, that coalition. So he was turning his back on the coalition Zig had with, with um, the North. And so that was when they built the UPGA. But once again, the Mesujamba strategy came into place. The first thing they did now was to equip Akintola and then use Akintola to, to checkmate the Western region and use him to steal power away from our lower and then use him to retrace all the things they were doing. And from that time on, they made sure that the country will be designed in a way where the South will never be able to be in opposition to the North again. That was why they changed it from a from, um, parliamentary system to pre presidential system. That was also why they now destroyed the powers of the region and then they turned it into states. So the way Awolowa was able to build the whole Yoruba people as a formidable block, the way Opara was able to build all of them as a formidable block, that is not possible anymore in our time. So the more we get sinking, we keep sinking into Nigeria, the more we are losing our identity, and the more we are losing our powers to fight back by alien people that came from Futajalon with an intention to exploit the same way they exploited the Hausa lands, that's the same way we're being exploited now. 
That is why taxes can be taken and redistributed. That is why oil can be taken somewhere and redistributed in a way that it favors the colonial masters. Anybody that wants to have power in the South today does not need the consent of his people. He doesn't need their votes. All he needs is to go to the North and bow down to the, to the cabals, and that will be so. When the Oba of Benin was trying to get his artifacts back, he had to go to the north to go and meet. <laughs> I mean, somebody was talking about it yesterday. I was skeptical to get involved, but that's how bad things have become. You know, even the Alafi of Oyo, the same way that he fought so hard, really, really hard, to not be under the Shokoto Caliphate, right now, because he's a Muslim, and the, which of course, something that they're trying to deny as well, and the Sultan of Chokoto is the head of Muslims. He is subordinate to him. And so he bows to a throne that did everything to destroy his homeland, sacked his homeland, took a lot the people who like i've just been thinking this conqueror this mentality of or oh, this feudal type system do you see that in many countries in the world and the system that we're operating in nigeria now do you see that in anywhere else like for example when i look at the american system i think people have forgotten that this land was previously owned by indigenous people now you now see some sort of supremacy behavior with the white uh americans obviously they came from england right so they conquered local people took the land and now they are the conquerors like the ones that the ones in charge and there's there's this sense of we've conquered you know i mean they're not saying they're conquerors, but they're saying that they own the land kind of thing. So is there, this, I'm American, I'm proud to be American kind of thing. But is it that they, they are not aware that that land originally did not belong to them? And then the second, second thing is, when I look at that, and I look at many other nations, I see we had the conversation about Turkey, how people came from other lands to Turkey and subjugated the people or, or enslaved or you know, did genocide of the indigenous people. And then we go to other parts. Uh, Ethiopia was another one where they came from, I don't know where they said they came from, you know, but they were not originally indigenous. They settled and then the Yamara, they conquered. Yeah, right? the Amaras. Yes, the Amaras. And there's this arrogance. I mean, we've spoken to the Turkish people, the same arrogance, the same arrogance of the Amara when they speak to us, like they say, the, the, you know, in fact, the, the Turkish people said um, that they are warriors, you know, so they don't believe in, in the self determination of local people. The Amaras also, when they spoke to us, said that the land belonged to them, you know, by means of conquest. And now we have a situation where we have this arrogance of the Fulanis in Nigeria. So I'm just really beginning to try to piece together, is there a relationship between all of these places? And then the last thing is, are there any other nations? Could I look at Russia, for example, or China? Those are people who have kept their lands, right? And they've built their own military in such a way that nobody can even dare. So how come is it that we, who are indigenous in our land, are all of a sudden not allowed 
to protect ourselves, right? If you try to hold guns, you're 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 criminalized. If you're looked as an, an as a criminal, if anybody catches you or if people, do you understand? So I'm thinking to myself, sorry, it's a bit a long-winded question, but I'm really trying to piece everything together in my head. How come is it that we that are being threatened are not allowed to protect ourselves? So that's the the third question. One is this arrogance. Do you see any relationship amongst all of these? And, you know, all I'm just beginning to see is some sort of arrogance from these people. And the same people are telling us not to protect us. So anyway, go ahead. Sorry, Bunka. I don't know if my question was clear, but it's a question and comments mixed together. <laughs> I'm really trying to make sense of it all. Yeah, thanks, Queen Sheba. Bunka. Okay. I think maybe yeah. Bunka has... Yeah. Monka, are you there? Okay, maybe we can come back to him, or maybe anybody else can answer the question. But for me, I just see there's a lot of similarities. Can, and this I, can I, can I um, try to do that, if you, if you don't mind? Okay. On the books, go ahead, man. Okay, now I'll start with the, you know, the American mentality, you know, which is basically white supremacy. You know, I think that this whole uh, uh, conquest mentality or arrogance, it didn't start today. Basically, you know, go back to, you can know... Can people hear me very well? Yeah, you yeah, can hear you now. Bonka. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, my internet is really messing up right now. So this is what I have to say, Queen Shiba. You see all these three people you mentioned, right? All the three of them have something in common. They have a messiah, mess, messianic, um, they have a messianic um, complex agenda. Yes, they have a messianic agenda. You see, the Turkish, the Turkish were the Ottoman empires, right? They came as the protector of Islam in that region. The Amarans were also creating this orthodox Christian philosophy. In fact, the, the, the people cleverly, the, the kings, Menelik and all of them cleverly wired themselves into, into um, Solomon's DNA to just give it a messianic feel. The Fulani too as well came with a, with a messianic complex that they are the um, protectors of, of, of Islam and are the successors of the Shungay Empire. And in fact, Usman Namfordio as well cloned himself into the um, DNA of one of the greatest Arab um, warriors of that time from Turkey. So this, this, is, this is one thing they all have in common. That's, that's one. So two, they always want to make sure that that religion remains. Because the moment that religion is gone, the hold they have on the people is, goes with it. As you can see, the, the, the Vatican, right? When Constantine created the Vatican, he created the Vatican with an intention to use it to hold the whole empire together. Especially when he saw that there was a grassroots Christian movement that had gone into Euro Asia. And at that point, they were trying to conquer Asia. That was during the time of the Sasanians, but they were having a tough time. So he, he created the Vatican and the Catholic Church with an intention to use religion to hold the whole empire together. And it did succeed for a while. But eventually the empire crashed. But as you can see, that Vatican church is still very powerful till today, long after the Roman Empire is gone. So that's what happens. When people come with that messianic complex, they always go a long way because they use religion to kind of mentally enslave people. But the, the real agenda is always to take your lands. The real agenda is always to take your your wealth. That is why they are always big on Pan-Africanism. It makes it easy when they make all of you sing Kumbaya. See, Pan-Africanism was big in Ethiopia. In fact, Addis Ababa was the capital. Pan-Africanism was also big in... Um, anybody you see kind of advocating Pan-Africanism, from Marcos Gavi to, to, to Zeke to, to Hale Selassie, they have an ulterior motive on mind. They're trying to see if they can conquer a whole big land and impose themselves as a master race. 
That's what that's what it's always about. So that is what it is. And the Hausa people today, they still do not realize it that at some point they need to fight this thing back and, and get their lands back. So we are fighting back against this messianic complex. That's why I turned my back against Christianity and Islam, anything Abrahamic religion. So if you tell me that's the way to heaven, I probably then maybe when you get there, you're not going to be finding me in that heaven. You probably will have found, find me born in somewhere else because I'm not going to use that religion to join to mentally enslave myself. That's my own. That's my own philosophy. Now, if you look at our ancestors, you will see that they were able to fight these people better. They were better equipped. Look at your ancestors. Look at the Arochukus. Look at how easy it was for them to fight. Now, look at them today. Many Christians how um, they've been indoctrinated with this turn the other cheek. Look at Adi Faransin saying, hey, everybody have a plan B, run out of the country. Compare it to your ancestor that is saying, okay, mobilize, get your guns, we're going. Compare that, would you think Daja Wokubo will ever tell his people to, to leave their base or someone like Kibali Yoli? That's what the danger of these things have done. So that's my own answer to it, uh, Queen Chebra. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think Anna Books also had something to say. Um, yeah, all yeah. Right. I want to talk more of the, uh, the American part of the question. You know, uh, um, I think it starts with the, the story of the conquest. They sold to everyone. You know, when, when the Europeans talk about their conquest, the Roman Empire and the, 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 the Greeks, you know, they sell it like it's so romantic, you know, glory, glorious. But they did basically what the Fulanis did to the Alsace. That's what they did. They killed and killed and killed and killed until they couldn't kill us. But they'll, they'll sell it to you as, ah, glorious, just like the Americans, Abraham Lincoln, this one. But nobody talks about the millions of uh, the, uh, indigenous people they killed and they slaughtered and they pushed out of your land. You know, so that, that meat is what I've sold generations and generations. And that is why you see a, a white man in America and he feels because they've sold him that lie. They fainted uh, everything, so they should have quoted everything. The, the blood of the people, they, 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 they've like turned it upside down and, and made it look like glory. We are glorious. We are strong. You know, that European war mentality, you know, of conquest, that is what, which is basically uh, the, 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 basic, the base or the foundation of white supremacy. You know, that is what, what, you, what you find there. And that is what they sell to everybody. And, and, and the, the, since it maintains their, their, their status in the world, it keeps them up there. You know, uh, nobody wants to be, come down with you. Nobody wants to be equal with you. And, uh, they, they want to be up there. You know, they want to control the, 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 the economic, you know, uh, 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 power, you know, you know, of the world. Because when they come down it, it, on a plain field, you beat them naturally. You know? So now they have that advantage. <laughs> They're not coming down from there. So that, that is basically the reality. Yeah. Thank you, Anibox, for that. Um, anyone else on stage wants to chime in on that before we move on? Bo, yeah, what do you have to say? Yeah, uh, yeah. My well, my chime is very simple. Right? The examples, um, I can't remember. I think Queen Sheba gave the commonality and the Nigerian situation is these. You know these oppressors ha believe they have conquered and the reason why you can't carry a gun is because you don't have your own government right so they have conquered you and put a government in place what is going now is we are refusing to acknowledge that conquest and th uh, this goes to everybody that says participate in elections this and that elections any form of government that's in place now is what the conqueror has put in place. And you participating is you accepting that conquest. So until we start educating our people and letting them know that it is uh, a, a conqueror mentality that we're dealing with, and the conqueror can never give you the tools to fight off, your, fight off their conquest. So if they give you the tools and say, go and vote, it is not for you to free yourself. It is for you to further enslave yourself. So I guess what I'm just trying to say is let us let us paint the stark reality that the people we're dealing with see us as a conquered people, and they see that we should accept that. And that is why they would always promote those that say, yes, let's just go with the system in place, et cetera. Maybe we can change it from the inside. 
And those of us that say, no, I am not a conquered person, my peoples are not conquered, then we become the terrorists, the aggressors, etc. Because we see it for what it is. So let us continue to educate ourselves and let our people know that if we accept things as they are, we have accepted the conquest of our people and our lands. And if not, let us see for what it is and let us resist it. That's just my submission. All right, Bonka. Yes, sir. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on something that Bo was talking about. See, election is not bad. Going for elections is not a bad thing. But in this kind of situation, it is suicidal to even, it's a way of numbing your pain, right? This is about the cat before the horse. The reason why people go into elections is to protect a constitution or a democracy that represents them. But if you're going into an election for a democracy or for a constitution that does not represent you, it's, it, it's ridiculous to think that anything good can come out of that. Let me tell you the history of constitutions in Nigeria, and I will rush it through. When this, the, the first constitution that was made was Clifford's constitution. And the Clifford's constitution now created a kind of senate. It limited only need to Lagos, and it said they were only going to have advisory roles. That, that was all it said. So these people, and the person who was the top politician at that time was Herbert Macaulay. So he did all his lobbying and arguing and everything, and they told him, hey, no, that's not, that's what's going to happen. And it happened from 1922 to 1946. How many years? 32, 42, that was about 22 years. They kept doing that, and those guys refused and said, this is how it's going to be. So and elections happened three times within that time. It is near madness for anybody that would have wanted to agitate at that time for you to tell that person that, oh, no, 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 just participate in the next election. When you get in there, go and push from inside. That is, the, the, the cart has been put before the horse. The horse must always go before the cart. You go into elections and go into, an ele uh, into a political party to protect an interest. But you can't go there with chains in your hand. When, when someone becomes a senator or a governor in, in Nigeria, it's like asking someone into a boxing match and they have put chains in your hands, put chains in your legs, and you don't have any boxing gloves. But you're like, anyway, I'm in the ring. I'll do my best. I will do. That is how, that's how stupid and ridiculous it sounds. Now, in 1946, they did another constitution. They had um, Richards. It was written by Sir Otto Richards. And these, these guys went to England again. That was when um, um, NCNC, they, 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 they financed people to go to England. They were led by Zeke. Madam Kuti was also part of, part of that movement. They all went to England. They were like, oh, we don't like this constitution. The British people rubbished them and told them, hey, you guys, go back home. What are you doing here? Go and participate. They went in there, joined in the elections, I saw that it was not going to get them anywhere. That was when agitation started. That was when people started going into, like, you know what? You don't give us the constitution we want. We are going to start holding the country hostage. That was when the coal riots in Enikul happened. That was when the labor union strike started. That was when the Zikist movement started. Not until these guys started doing that, the, the British started behaving themselves. That was when they eventually gave them the first constitution that would give them parliamentary powers. That was the 1951 constitution that now produced the great leaders we celebrate today. Leaders like Awolowo, leaders like Namdi Azikwe, and of course, among the northerners, like um, Amadou Bello. That was when they started giving them. And guess what? Even at that, they were still saying this is not good enough because Although they've given them their parliamentary freedoms, they've not given them their financial freedoms. So that was when Oliver Lilliton happened and they decentralized the federal force, which um, Iran brought back together with the unification decree. But they decentralized it. Western region got their, their wealth, all the money that comes from their region, it came under their control. All the money that went to the Eastern region, it came under their control. Same thing on that note. That was why they were able to do all the things they did at that time. 
So it, it's it's if you now tell us to go into into elections with this kind of constitution and with no guarantee that anything was, is going to happen, it's like asking the blacks that were fighting for civil rights in America to go into elections and go and solve things from inside rather than marching on the streets, rather than having someone like Malcolm X stand his ground. What, how would that have turned out? Where would that have gone if these guys, the, 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 the civil rights guys in, in America, they did a lot of economic sabotage in America. They did a lot of boycotts. They did a lot of don't enter the bus, don't enter certain restaurants, don't buy. They nearly held the American economy hostage because America is built on their back at that time. I don't know, but even as that now, they're still, they're still a big part of the economy. So to tell them at that point that, oh, you don't have to do all that. Just go and do elections, select your representatives. When they get to the Senate, they will do what they need to do. I, I'm not sure they will get to where they went. So cut before the horse is not for people like us. It's for people like Governor Abbey, who has a who is singing for supper, literally. Who has a boss somewhere that is gingering him because he's hoping that he too will get there and eat his own share of national cake. That's not what we represent. That's not what someone like me or someone like many of us in the Rubicon represent. We want genuine welfare for our people. So anybody that is telling you now to participate in an election is for two things. It's either his ignorance to a point of sickness, or he has a personal stake he's desperate to gain from. So from Macnoon to Prince, to to um to governor, you will see that they all have political stakes, and that's why it's more important to them. It's more of a personal thing than what benefits the people as a whole. Thank you. Could I quickly just say one sentence? Uh, okay, that? but yeah, go ahead. So, so, go. Yeah, just one sentence. So uh, uh -huh. you know, Bonka said, you know, we want um all of this is about the welfare of our people. For me, it's even a little bit different. It's not just the welfare of our people, because if you say it's just welfare, these people can come back and say, well, we can create a welfare system even within this imperfect system. For me, it's the fundamental justice. Let's not lose sight of that. The fundamental justice and the right to self-determine and the right to freedom. Now, whether I choose to have welfare for myself or not within that fundamental justice and freedom is a different topic altogether. But chances are, if I have my fundamental justice and my freedom, then I will cater to my own welfare. But so just to say that, let's not make it just a welfare argument alone, because they will can tell you that, yes, I can do better for you in this system than any other system. No, I want my freedom. I want my identity. I want control of my land and my resources. I want to self-determine myself. I want to determine what my own welfare is. It is very simple. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo. Can I bring something uh, in terms of uh, what people might want to consider? Maybe an, um, a question that someone can answer as they make a submission. Please, please, Queen Shiva. Is, is there ahead. any country, does anybody know of any country that has its indigenous people in place, running a very good government that has never been conquered or never been, uh, or never faced their genocide? that has all the ones that have faced genocide and have been able to thrive with their own indigenous people without having an external power or external Rwanda uh, conquer them. Okay, so Rwanda, okay, Rwanda is a good example, but they have faced a genocide, right? They faced war. Have we got any other country that has indigenous people that are able to function without, um, you know, an external power or, or a conqueror power that is part of the system. In, 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 in Africa, Germany, or, 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 Botswana. In Africa or everywhere? In Africa, it's in, Botswana. In Botswana's, Botswana's indigenous people, they are 70% of the population. Their GDP per capita is one of the best in Africa, and they are a largely peaceful people. And I think they've not had too much, uh, in terms of, um, how do I say it now, problems with the uh, uh, indigenous, uh, non, non, I think the, indigen the dominant tribe is the Sawana people. 
I was doing a reading for them, but I'm not yet ready for it. Just like <laughs> we still, we're still some weeks ahead of the Botswana story and also the South Africa War of Liberation story as well. Um, it will get to it eventually, yes. But Botswana is a very good example. Thank but, but you. But they were colonized, right? Yes, they were colonized. They, they were colonized so by that, that, England. That, that means that, uh, that they don't qualify for what Michelle was you know, looking for. Yes, but they Germ Germany is a good example. They've been able to reverse neocolonialism. So we are still victims of neocolonialism. We have um, countries like um, Botswana, they're not under neocolonialism anymore. So, so it's, it's, it's Ethiopia, Ethiopia. No, it, Sorry. Ethiopia is going through a lot of. <laughs> Ethiopia is not what you see. Oh. When people say, I don't know, maybe you're going by the story of. Uh, the, yeah. Um. So Ethiopia is going through a similar thing that we're going through. If when people say Ethiopia was never colonized, that is a big lie from the people who push that line, the Western people, right? They or were the... colonized, but it was internal. Yes. Internal. So, so it's, but, but Bonka, what we found out was that the internal colonization was, was uh, facilitated by the West. So the uh, Menelik, what I understand from their story was that Menelik, who came from Israel, I believe, or somewhere, he was a Jewish person, I believe, settled in a particular small location in uh, in Ethiopia and then started conquering lands around it, right? So you had indigenous people who were African indigenous people living their own lives, like the way we were, where we had our own culture, our own you know religion, traditional religion and all that. But then at some point when they were doing the Berlin conference, he wrote a letter to, to the West, to, to Brit I think it was Britain or so. Anyway, to say, to, to basically say to them that he would help with the conquering if they can sponsor him and give him the guns so he can, he can colonize the, the lands all around. So the West actually gave him as part of that Berlin Conference agreement, uh, what's it called? Um, guns and, you know, firearms and all that, which he now used to conquer lands. He was already said the conquering, conquering of people already before Berlin Conference anyway, but he told them that he was going to be able to do it. So through him, they did the sort of indirect colonization. So, you know, fighting local people, killing people, bringing them under that uh, empire other than the Ethiopian Empire. That's what I found out from their people, just by speaking to them. So, yes, it was not a West, direct Western colonization, but it was an internal colonization by, by, and by a foreign person who was not indigenous to that land. That's what I understood. I don't know, Bonka, if, if you think that was, uh, that's correct. It's yes, absolutely what we well. got from speaking to them directly, right? And it gets even deeper. Let me let me give you a deeper perspective. So as we all know, the three dominant tribes in Ethiopia. That's why it's it's always good for us to talk about this thing so that we can you know educate one another. The three dominant groups of Ethiopia: the Amaras, uh, the Oromos, and I think the Tigrayans. Now the, the irony is that despite the the conquest of the Amaras, they they tried to as they were assimilating, they still maintained some sort of relative homogeneity of their own bloodline, just like you have with the Fulanese. So you have the way you have the Aousa Fulani. Well, in the uh, Amaras, they also tried to assimilate the smaller tribes in Ethiopia, but they were never able to, you know, um, lord their ways. They even banned, like, the indigenous language of the other two tribes, the Oromos and the Tigrayans. Even you couldn't teach their languages, their religion, their culture, their history. They basically tried to paper over it with hope that the Amaras will continue to conquest their way through. But eventually, the country fractured along the ethnic nations. One, the Oromos want self-determination. The Tigrayans want self-determination. There's even the old Tigrayan army and all of that. And, um, um, what makes it even uh, another level is that they have been able to smuggle self-determination into their constitution whilst they were presidently 
or whilst the other ethnic nations were in, in power. And as soon as they were done with the, their own tenure of presidency, they basically uh, wanted to go for secession. And that is why there's some sort of war in uh, Ethiopia right now. So I find it very curious because of um, Mulumba Lumba, that is like a Pan-Africanist, who has also been predicting it that Africa is going to experience a, a series of um, um, ruptures in these nation states uh, in the next um, 40 years. And he predicted that we might have an additional 40 countries also. And he mentioned in particular Ethiopia and Nigeria, some of the nations. And I think a lot of people, a lot of African leaders are, they are very conscious about the, the, the indigenous people of uh, Biafra, like the East, because they always see, you know, if you look at unrecognized countries in Africa, you definitely see that one there. That's the Biafra, uh, you know, in terms of uh, country within uh, Nigeria. And if you go to Cameroon, too, there's one there as well. And it's all over several countries in Africa. So, yes. And another thing, I never really got a chance to add that to the earlier submission, but you're absolutely spot on. The Amaras and the Dinkas of southern um, Sudan and the Fulanis, they have this um, superiority complex, especially in context of Africa. Like, they are the one true chosen blood. And if you notice, in terms of any kind of conversation you have with them, diplomatic conversations, all over social media and, and all over, even in Nigeria, if you ask a Dinka, for example, in South Sudan, the Dinkas and the Noirs, they are going at it toe to toe, right? And the Dinkas will always say that they believe in political solutions. They believe that they can still make things work. They believe that the country can be great if they just put aside their differences and, you know, they they, they just come to rewrite the constitution to favor each other. While the Noirs are saying they don't want to have anything to do with the Dinkas, they want to go. Same things with the Amara and the Roma and the Tigrayan. The Roma and the Tigrayan are saying they want self-determination, they want to have their own countries, they want to stay in ancestral land and be uh, fine with it. The Amaras, on the other hand, believe that we must come together, write a constitution. Nobody is going anywhere. We are going to die here Same together. thing in and Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing in Tokyo. So, and then, of course, you have the, you know, you know, you know, you know your people up north. We're not going anywhere. We're going to die here together. And that's their belief. Like, if you try and talk about self-determination... And one thing, one thing also so common that you didn't mention is that all these people exploit the others and they're not so indigenous bunker they are not they, indigenous. not only are not, not indigenous they take the wealth from these lands and enrich themselves with it and so they are saying no we are going to stay together but at what cost on 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 what terms yeah in which conditions and and, the, and according to what yeah exactly the conditions is that your wealth belongs to us we would exploit your wealth as much as and, and for example you know it even gets worse with the amaras they said that even though the constitution allows self-determination uh i think we're coming to you i think i see your mic fly mic, uh, flashing um that even though the constitution says uh you you have a what's called the right to self-determination you can have your right to self-determination you can go Amara is saying that, but you will not take the land with you. So the <laughs> land that is indigenous to you, you can go. And he said it with so much arrogance that that land is theirs it, as, as per conquest. So you will leave the land. So what we are dealing with in Nigeria is not even like... A joke. It's the same it's thing that the Fulani people are saying. They said their father, Osman Danfodio, already said the land belongs to them. They say that. G guys, we are speaking too much English. I have it a question simple. on people. Sorry. Hold it's on. simple. They have conquered, they, they believe they have. I think we need to choose very simple language to educate our people. They say they have conquered us, and we are saying we are not conquered. All these who are quoting constitutional right to self-determination were confusing our people with grammar. So these people today have conquered you and were saying we are resisting. Let's keep let's keep it very straight and straight, you know, short and straightforward. Educate our people. So this is a fight for your life. As in, as, as, as sometimes I feel we 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 lose ourselves in the intellectualism of analyzing the whole situation and we get our people lost. Everything you guys have just said is very simple. These people believe they've conquered you and we must defend ourselves and Resist the conquest. Simple. The, the, <laughs> Thank you, that. Thank you for that, bro. The, inter the interesting thing, sorry, Shields, the interesting thing is that 
they have managed to demonize the right to uh, defend yourself. They've demonized the right for you to bear arms. So the reason why I asked that question earlier is that which country is it in the world that you have indigenous people who are faced with a threat that do not have the power or the arms to f defend themselves and still are able to, to progress? I cannot find one. The ones that you will find that are doing well, maybe like Botswana, you have the indigenous people who are, you know, are in charge of the country and all that. But there is, I, don't, I can't see any other country. I'm looking out everywhere. I can't see any other country in the world where you have a, 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 a um, someone or people who have come into your land, who are not indigenous to your land, who are in control of your government and in control of your resources and in control of your army, and you are still, and you're just able to thrive. And you're not able to, do you understand, that you don't have, like for example, in, 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 um, in Ethiopia, you have all these indigenous people with arms. They have their own, own army, right? So why is it that Nigeria refuses to allow indigenous people to protect themselves from non-indigenous people who are invading. I, I, I don't get it. Because, because you are conquered. Because, because you are conquered. You are conquered. Very simple. Apart, apart, apart from that, apart from that, the, the point here is that if they let you arm yourself, can, can, can I be heard? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, you, yes, yes, yes. It's quiet. Yeah, so if, if, if you arm yourself, that means you will defeat their gatekeepers. Who are the Fulanese? This is I'm, I'm talking about the British. Uh, like that, you, you have to reduce to a state where you don't have a say. That is why Fulani man will come and tell you uh, Nigeria in India, Nigeria is not negotiable. Like which, which is actually very stupid, but they know why they're saying it because they know then, they are the gatekeepers. Then why is it that we from the south are brainwashed or? have accepted that narrative i'm going to come to you jaja Vokobo, musa Biodun. i see you flashing sorry shielded i don't i hope you're taking note of them they're flashing yes of course yes of course why is it i think why that, is... that is where uh... yeah one minute why is it that southerners have in their minds been let me use the word brainwashed or have accepted that anyone who's carrying a, a, a gun or carrying or, or defending themselves is an enemy or someone who's that, you know, that something is wrong with you. For example, if you find that someone has a gun or a, a uh, community have arms, they are a target of the government. Now, I'm not saying that on, the, on one hand, the conqueror will not want you to fight back. But the South, what is wrong with us? Why is it that we cannot see that we need to start taking these things seriously, that one, our resources is taken, and then we don't have the power to defend ourselves. And yet, they are still all over the South killing people. Um, children, I'll stop here for now. Maybe you can take more people. Good. I know Jaja will. Yeah, they've been waiting to, to comment. Uh, so we'll just take comments or questions from Jaja of Opobo, Borden Wells, Musa for Gate, and shall not been named silent. Baba Alawo, you are going to bring up the rear. Uh, Jaja of Apovo, please ask or comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm always in this room, but uh, at the audience, because I like to listen and learn from the many intellectuals on this platform, especially uh, Brother, Brother Bunker, or Bunker. Sorry if I have your, your name wrong. So my, my comment, or basically a question, is, is because uh, what arises from the position that um, I, I align with the idea of Pan-Africanism, uh, that is to say, I believe in the uh, United States of Africa as espoused by uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, I'm a Ghanaian, and so that is uh, totally consistent with uh, perhaps my roots as a Ghanaian. And so my fear is that, and I'm totally for self-determination, but perhaps this is a selfish uh, point of view, is that if Africa is further uh, vulcanized, 
that is to say if countries um, further um, further dissociate into individual entities whereby uh, tribes and, and regions are able to self-determinate uh, how does this uh, affect the bigger picture of remaining a united state of africa because i believe uh, especially as uh, conan Kumar says our independence is meaningless if it's not linked with the total liberation of the continent and so as we are trying to um, push our own agenda for our people i, I would like to uh, ask or, 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 or question if that is also in line with the bigger picture of moving the African race forward. And perhaps uh, Brother Bonka can, can help with this question. Thank you. If, if Bonka is not, Bonka, are you there? If, if Bonka is not there, quick one, Europe, that is one thing you should look at. Europe okay. is a perfect okay. example of ethnic nations. Bonka, are you there? Or maybe someone else can go in. Yeah, let, let me. Let, I, th I think I think he answered the question himself already. He, he made a, a quote by uh, Nkrumah. I think he said, uh, "The independence is nothing without the how did he say it again? The you know freeing all the nationalities in uh, in, in Africa. That basic that is that is the thing for you to have pan pan African is it's good, but not at this point. So not not with near colonialism. You can be pan African a pan Africanist when you've taken your power from from the Europeans." When you do that, you, know, you cannot come back and form unions and call yourself a, a United States of Africa. Not now. Not when you you, the, the, you have all your lines have been infiltrated by Europeans. So how do how, how will you how will you do that? It's not going to work. So first of all, take your power from them. How how are you going to take your power from them? Self self determine. Take take care of your resources. Take control of your defense. Take control of your economy. Then when you when 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 all this is done, you cannot come back with your neighbor. See on the table, like as equals, and have a conversation. If it works out, fine. You come together and, and be whatever you want to be, but not like uh, what, what we see in Africa, not, like, not the way Africa is kind of structured now. It's not. It's never, never going to work. And that's why it has always failed. So, that, that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I assist? I don't want to take Bunker's talk, but I know Bunker is going to say everything I plan to, uh, even better, but uh, I don't know, is, is it okay <laughs> for me to go? I, I think you should go first. I'll just come up with uh, economic... Outside. No, it, just... it's fine. You can go. You can okay. go, D. Oh, oh, all right. So one thing you have to understand is that a lot of the, I don't want to say misconceptions, but some of the things that we don't quite get is that, you know... Um, Pan African is quite incredible. I mean, I don't want to, since it's somebody that you owe there, I don't want to talk about his record in terms of what Please he did. Please talk about you know? it, MD. I mean, <laughs> let's, be, let's be factual here. Take, take, take no prisoners. I know. I, 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 a lot of people know my my my, my feelings about Kwame Nkrumah and, and, and what he has way. done, you know. I'm, Uh, two clear examples. He built a world-class um, mango canning factory in an, in a region that didn't have any mangoes. In fact, it took them almost three years after the factory was completed to be able to get their first mangoes. They had enough mango. The, the factory was so big that he had enough capacity to serve the uh, European demand for canned mangoes. So these are some of the uh, um, contradictions of economic uh, justification for Pan-Africanism in a country of one, just in one country, which is to say that you make sure that everybody benefits in the growth for that country. Similarly, that his ministry, ministry of the University of Transportation in Castina, in Daura. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Navy, Navy, Navy school in, in Kano, you know, very, very daft economic policies. That's what Pan-Africanism tells you to do. Another example of Kwame's Pan-Africanism was that when he, he set up, um, uh, what did they call it, leather, leather factories. And in the north was where the leather um, was um, being, the eyes and skin was being grown. In the south, they had the tanneries. And in the middle of the country, he had the, where the demand was. So 
one thing that Pan-Africanism does is that it misplaces the very fundamentals of who we are. We are ethnic nations, and for that reason, ethnic nations should be allowed to thrive. They should be allowed to set up policies, trade policies. For instance, the Fulanis might say that they want to trade with their brothers in Mauritania and Mali. Why are you forcing them to bring in and import their goods through Lagos and pass through a Christian population when they can take it through their brothers in Mali and Nigeria? And that is when, when they are in charge of power. They did not think of building a, a, a rail line to connect all the uh, economics. Or, and um, For example, if, if I was a Fulani economist now, and I do not have a Fulani jihadist agenda, my train station would be to where? To Aba, so that we can carry all our cows, kill them, convey them to eyes and skins, and send that directly to Aba so that they can start making shoes and exporting to the whole of East and West Africa. And then we'll be the biggest beneficiaries of that trade because all our cows will no longer be used to what? To sell for food, they will just be converting to eyes and skins. I will be cashing out. But when you are, you know, a jihadist, your first thinking is to create $2 billion worth of wealth and take it to the most unproductive neighboring country in Niger Republic. That is also Pan-Africanism thinking in a way, right? The real way for ethnic nations to develop for the next century is for us to take our individual ethnic identities and then we classify into our areas of strength. Let the Easterners be Eastern trade country. Let Biafra happen. And then they can use that, their superiority in trade, to negotiate trade treaties with all the countries in Africa. That is the only way to build Pan-Africanism. That whole attempt about people trying to um, bring uh, Africa down to smaller numbers, then, then build it back up to say, no, 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 it's not going to work. And also, people always worry about ethnic nations' ability to thrive. The GDPs of our, first of all, our populations are smaller nations, are very good. Take Nigeria, for example, 200 million population. Big shame. Doesn't have any GDP that anybody can be proud of. If you look at it, and I'm going to give you the data so you can compare. Tanzania has a population of 62 billion. But they have, a GDP, they have a GDP of 62 billion, and they have a population of 60 million. Their GDP per capita is $1,105. And Nigeria has almost four times the population of Tanzania and almost four times the economy of Tanzania. And our GDP per capita is not, not, it's not that much better. It's 2,000. Now, compare that with Seychelles. Seychelles has a population of 98,000 in Africa, and they have a GDP of $1 billion. But their GDP per capita is $12,000. So to put it in perspective, the average Seychelles and for or the average citizen of Seychelles has an economy or has a GDP per capita that is six times better than the life of Nigerians. And doesn't it make sense now that here the Nigerians are going to take their vacation in Seychelles? Same thing for Mauritius. Mauritius has a GDP or a population of 1.26 million people. And they have an economy of 11 billion. But they have a GDP per capita of $8,950 per citizen. To put this in perspective, they have a GDP that is almost, what, smaller than, smaller than Benue State. Benue State has a GDP of $11.4 $11 billion. Uh, Seychelles has a GDP of $11 billion. Um, um, what they call it? Kaduna, $14 billion. Abia has a GDP that is bigger than Mauritius. Uh, Botswana, uh, Abia State at 19 billion has a GDP that is bigger than Botswana, 15 billion. A Boeing State has a GDP that is um, just 5 billion shy of Botswana. You understand? So, Imo State, for instance, has a GDP of 18 billion. This is bigger than the GDP of Botswana, Mauritius, and Seychelles. You know, Aquaibom has a GDP that is bigger than Mauritius, but Aquaibom is locked in Nigeria with unproductive citizens. GDP per capita is deadlocked. But if it was individual ethnic nations, they would thrive. And that is just the justification for balkanization. If you come to the South, for instance, um, the Southwest of this country, is Yoruba nation, has a GDP combined of 133 billion. That is bigger than the GDP of Botswana, Ivory Coast, Seychelles, Mauritius, Tanzania combined. It is just uh, at 133 billion, it is just about maybe uh, 60 billion share of the GDP of Portugal. And it is twice the GDP of Luxembourg. So the point I'm trying to make is again, the mere fact that you are looking at it from the prism of are we weaker? No. By balkanizing it, then you cannot have the real, like, I don't want to use the word, but the dead weight will be lifted and the ethnic nations will start to thrive. And everybody knows where the dead weight is. Even the dead weight knows that they are dead weight and they are not arguing it. And that's why when they tell you that they want to balkanize it, they will tell you that be your brother's keeper, be your brother's keeper. But the, the point of the matter is that if you look at all the GDP per capita of all the African countries, we are just getting worse. In terms of 
Nigeria compared to Luxembourg. Nigeria's GDP per capita, 2,210. Luxembourg, 120,000. Portugal, 36,000. Croatia, 29,000. Greece, 31,000. Botswana, 6,500. So Botswana GDP per capita is three times that of Nigeria. Yet Nigeria has uh, 198 million more people than Botswana. So breaking down the ethnic nations, the second question is that if, if uh, Luxembourg, a country of 613,000 people, are not afraid to be a country, if Liechtenstein, a country of, of 38,000 people, are not afraid to be a country, if Cyprus, less than a million, is a country, if Montenegro, less than a million, is a country, then why is Yoruba nation of 40 million or 60 million people too small to be a country because of Pan-Africanism? And the sheer numbers is, by the time we look at the trade data, I, I, I want to, I don't want to talk too much on this thing, but Pan-Africanism really upsets me because if you look at it, let me just close with this. Look at inter-African trade in 2020. Let's look at the data. Africa only traded 13% with Africa. Now look at that. Look at Europe. Europe traded 60% within the European Union. That means European countries traded 60% with Europe. North American countries traded 40% inside the North American bloc, and the Asian country traded 30% inside the Asian bloc. So what did it tell you? At 13%, Africa is trading the least with itself. So that in itself flaws the Pan-Africanism argument. 61% of our goods were traded, imported goods came from EU, not Africa. 61% of the goods imported into Africa came from the European Union, and 70% of the goods manufactured, um, exported from the EU came, 70% came from EU. 61% of our uh, imports from the EU were from, for primary products. 61% were for primary products, food, drinks, and all of that. So the point I'm trying to make is, we're not even trading with ourselves enough at 13% to be making Pan-Africanism arguments. So we need to go back, build stronger ethnic, in, uh, ethnic nations and ethnic kingdoms, so to speak. And then from there, we can begin to rebuild and trade with each other. The current fundamentals are flawed, and it will only be left in one thing wars, strife, and all of that. And if you look at it, let me now close by telling you, look at um, the Tanzania. They have 16% of the, dom the most dominant population is 16%. In Ivory Coast, the most dominant population is 30%. In Nigeria, the mo most dominant population is 25%. In seashells, I, I, you previously remember when I told you that seashells as one of the best GDP per capita in Nigeria. Guess what? The, the most dominant population in seashells is the Creoles, and it's seventy percent. In Mauritius, the most dominant population is the Tudo Mauritius people, it's sixty percent. In Botswana, the most dominant population is the Sawana people, and it is eighty percent. Do you notice that the countries that have a higher ethnic domination? Are equally very successful in their GDP per capita. While the companies, the countries that have anything that the ethnic domination is, there's no clear majority. They are mad in conflict and their GDP per capita is significantly poorer. Daring lies the economic justification, even within Africa, to build newer African nations where there is a stronger ethnic nation that that the value system of that ethnic nation would determine the economic, uh, uh, political, and social cultural policies of that country. I hope I've been able to explain it. I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, listening to all that has been said, it's necessary to appreciate the interplay of Christianity, Islam, and British colonial authorities in colonial Nigeria. Yes, it is necessary to appreciate the undercurrents guiding that relationship. So we'll take Musa for gate and then go on a short break with his bar. So Musa. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. And um, I, I, I can't, I, I've stopped thanking Dakwa because I've seen that um, Dakwa is not really doing this because he needs to educate people. I think this is just me being himself. He keeps rolling out these figures every day. And I didn't I don't just know why people are not seeing this. Uh, my my brother that I was talking about, um that's Jaja Wokobo, right? I, I, I see where you're coming from in terms of the larger picture. But once again, the reality is what that was just broke down. And I would just like to add to that before I bring up an issue that uh Queen Shiba also mentioned slightly that we're also as southerners in Nigeria, we're not paying attention to. So um, in addition to Dakwa's figures, right, uh, Jaja, 
I want you to, in the Nigerian context, um, within the space of the president asking for, and I want you to see this in the larger picture that you are referring to. So, and I want you to explain to me, maybe in practical terms, how you think this will work out. Okay, we have a country where, um, like the North, the the including the government, they are claiming um, um, open grazing route, right? While on the other hand, which actually means that they want to be able to have access to every part of Nigeria within the larger picture that you're saying, right? They are, are citizens of Nigeria, and so therefore they must have access to every nook and cranny of the country because of their uh, predominant trade, which is nomadic uh, cattle rearing, right? They move around. However, on the flip side of it, you have um, excessive land in Sambisa Forest that um, these same edders are not making use of. Instead, what we have now is bandits making use of it, right? For their home territory, collecting taxes, et cetera, et cetera, right? But based on that larger picture of, you know, one Nigeria pan-Africanism, these same people that has mass, um, mass, um, what's it called, of land, not maximized for this, um, for this their predominant trade, but on the larger picture, claiming access to other people's land. And that brings me back to, so I, I just want you to explain how that can be simplified in that larger picture, aside from those people sticking to their own land and practicing whatever uh, business venture they believe in, in their homeland, while the uh, Southerners, who are predominantly farmers too, that are being affected now because of this open grazing, are able to practice their own um, farming too within their land. So I want you to just explain that aspect. What do you think? Do you think that based on the larger picture, that the Southerners, uh, the landowners in the Southern uh, Nigeria should allow open grazing while the people practicing open grazing has Sambisa forest and should cease that to uh, terrorists to inhabit. And once again, uh, the part that I said Queen Shiba mentioned that I want to bring out is, um, I don't know which country she was citing the example that uh, the, the Fulani people there are saying that uh, if those people want to break away, they should break away but leave their land. And I think if you look at the Nigerian context now, I think that is what is happening also as to horse Southerners as well. Because a um, couple, of, couple of months back, there's this issue that um, was it Saudi Arabia or UAE that came to Nigeria to uh, recruitment consultants to recruit uh, professional doctors consultant doctors in nigeria M musa just to and, just to correct you that so that was not the full of the people that's the amara people oh you okay know? sorry yeah the amara people yeah so like the the recruitment for uh nigerian doctors i think that happened in the south and we all knew the the number of uh consultant doctors that immigrated emigrated from Nigeria based on that exercise before the government moved in to stop it. And likewise, we are also, all of us here are also just practical evidence again. Um, among us here, we can count the number of Southerners, we can count the number of Northerners. And I believe that majority of us here are outside the country. So for me, I think it's also important to put that into context. We've already left our land right we've already left our land now just imagine three four generations of all of us here you know not having to go back home not knowing all these stories all this history that bunker is um, rolling out to us and you know there's no way they will be able to lay claim on those lands again because they don't even know the ancestor stories behind those lands so i think it's a reality of a threat that we have there and I'm just surprised that a lot of our people are still not seeing it. How many, how many Northerners uh, leave the North and go abroad? I had an experience when I was doing my NYC. You know, we are served in the North, and you know, years back. So we 
we actually had um, like an executive treatment, kind of, because we, we stayed in an hotel. So, but by virtue of that, we had to scot so many other coppers, uh, youth coppers from, from Southern Nigeria, some of them that we knew each other before. So we we're practically like um, 10 in a room that we're just cutting ourselves. You know, we just hang out together, we sleep together, and we do stuff together. So we had these two friends that are not on us, you know, and they came to us one day and they were like, why are you guys suffering? yourselves like this and we're like oh, we need to get the certificate the nyc certificate because we can't we, we can't work without it and the guy said yes you know but the thing is it's not like that here in the north that before you you don't have to suffer yourself look at the conditions that you guys are in because of nyc certificate that here in the north all you need to do is you just excuse me get across to someone that there will always be someone that know someone in Abuja, that know someone in the presidency, and you know they will bring the certificate down to you. And that is also in practice. If you check the number of coppers that are posted, you know compare the numbers that are posted up north from the south to the numbers that are posted from uh, the north down to the south. You know it doesn't it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. So I I just think that um, all those. Um, similar threats that we're seeing all across Africa, they are all evident in Nigeria too right now. And uh, the earlier we start taking it serious, the better for us as a people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Hizba, mm -hmm. over to you. I think Musa asked me a question. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know if anyone was going to... Okay, go ahead and respond and then we'll have Hizba. Yeah, okay. th thank you. Thank you, Brother Musa, for asking that question. So what I, what I believe is that uh, Pan-Africanism and sound economic policy are not uh, mutually exclusive. They can coexist. So for example, you give an example, or you, you propose a scenario whereby uh, herders from the north uh, in the Nigerian context uh, come to the south to graze and, and do stuff like that. But from what I've read or what I know is that this is not without challenge, right? They usually go beyond their boundary and uh, graze on um, on farmers' lands, right? They destroy crops, so that is uh, that is not positive. That is anti-economical. That is anti-economical. Like this, it doesn't make sense that you should leave your own region and come and destroy crops in another person's region, right? When we both need agriculture, we need crop production, and we need animal husbandry simultaneously. So if it is, makes more economic sense for you to um, perform an economic activity within your region, then do such. What Pan-Africanism proposes is that if it makes more sense for us to buy rice from the Benin Republic as against importing from China, right? let us do that. Let us support our, our neighbors. Let us support uh, the economic- But that's, that's, that's common sense. Why do you need Pan-Africanism yeah, to, to do that? Yeah, why that's that economic- sense. Economic yeah, integration. That, that, is, that, that is common sense, than... but that, that is not the order of the day, right? Do you, do, you know, the do you know where the concept of Pan-Africanism came from? And those who started it, what they had in mind? Maybe we should start from there. So you can see how ugly the concept is. So it, this is part of the things that fool, they take to, to fool black people. They have a way of romanticizing terrible things. So when you think of Pan-Africanism now, you are thinking of something very romantic. In this same, this same Nigeria, there were how many tribes? See all the problems we are going through. Look at all the things that happen in Congo. Look at all the things that happen in Ghana. We weren't even able to finish it. All the things happening in the nuclear countries that Berlin Conference put together is messing us up. All the way to South Africa, all the way to Kenya. Instead of talking about how to fix that, we are even thinking of adding more to the problem in the name of Pan-Africanism. The concept of Pan-Africanism talks about a centralized government, right? That's something people are not talking about. Those who started Pan-Africanism are African-Americans. They've been totally disconnected from their ethnic heritage, ancestral heritage. They look at what they believe that what makes you and I the same is because of our skin color. Our skin color is just pigmentation. I don't have anything in common with a Zulu man. 
I don't have anything in common with a with a Kikuyu man. We are just in that part of the world where there's more sun, less snow. That's why we are dark skinned. Simple. So to, to think that that's the condition with which um we should be one is a ridiculous concept. If if I have Yoruba nation and it makes more sense for me to trade with Australia than to trade with South Africa. It's ridiculous to say I have to choose South Africa because we are both blacks. That's that's my own philosophy. Okay. Somebody that greatly promoted Pan-Africanism was Marcos Gave. And if you read about Marcos Gave's concept, he is no different than the white oppressors he's talking about because his philosophy is that blacks that have been in the West Blacks that have ex been exposed to white man's kind of education are superior than blacks back home. So if they come back to Africa, they should be the new guys in government. They should be the new guys that are presidents and are ministers. And we, the, the people back home should not be subordinate to them. And the experiment was in Liberia. If anybody sees what happened in Liberia, you will understand where the concept of Pan-Africanism came from. I think it's a ridiculous... Um, it is a ridiculous idea, and we are actually going to open a session on it. That's my, that's what I. I think we should open a session and give a historical perspective. Thanks. Oh, okay, Th thank you very much, Bonka. I, I think just to summarize, uh, Jaja, you're speaking more about uh, e uh, economic integration, much more than any ethnic political union. Um, so we're just about to go on a short break, but uh, I see you, Borden Wells, Bola shall not be named silence, Baba Alawo of Lagos, uh, Patrick Harvey, we'll come back to you guys, but let's just go for a quick break with Hizba. Hizba. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody joining us on this um in this room, uh, please kindly follow the club, the Rubicon. If you're not doing that, then you're not supporting what we are doing. Kindly follow the club so we could get this information to a larger space and get it out there. So we go on a quick break and we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Are you under pressure, my brothers and my sisters? I don't know about you, but I already am. My grandfather was, my father was, and now I am. Under pressure, Nigerians, under pressure. Under pressure, Africans, under pressure. No food, do we belly? No money, in our pocket. No bed, till we eat. The people, they must suffer. Everything is so fucked up. It was fucked up in my grandfather's time. It was way fucked up in my father's time. But now, it's now super higher fucked up. I am so under pressure, my brothers and my sisters. I don't know about you. In a ghetto, in a city, everywhere that me go, me see them. Some are crying, some are dying, some are weeping, some are wailing. Ask yourself if you're under pressure, my brothers and my sisters, then you see the reason why you need to liberate yourself from mental slavery. Continue to follow the Rubicon Club, where we help you to do that as much as you can do that for yourself. I'm so under pressure because I can't see the future for my kids and I don't want my kids to spend the rest of their life here. I'm so under pressure to get things working for my people. I don't know about you, my brother. I'm a kid, my name is just a chatting to you. Chatting to you. 
Please continue to follow the club, continue to follow the moderators. Shout out to our able moderator and Bonka and D for keeping it real today. I was born under pressure. I'm still living under pressure. I don't know when this will end. If you truly you are under pressure, please continue to follow this Rubicon Club as we march and raise this movement. This is where we converge to tell ourselves that truly we are under pressure. We are not going to lie to ourselves. We are not going to deceive ourselves on this platform because truly and truly we are under pressure. Continue to follow the club, continue to follow the moderator so you could be getting more of this club. Shout out to Philip Desmond, the man and her books on everybody that is here to join us. Everyone in the audience, we see you guys for keeping it real with us. brother Tumba, I hail you, I hail everybody that's joining us together to make this work. Even my brother Zijaz, I hail you now, make you no verse for me too much. I'm so under pressure, that is why sometimes I have to say it the way it is. I apologize for being hurtful or having said anything hurtful. Now make it better, make all of us feel jolly, make we feel come up for this pressure. Now I make with the drum. Verse for me, bro. No two verse for me. I beg you, make we join hands together to come up for this pressure. Thank you so much, my brother Bunka, for being here with us and doing it like you've always done. I am under pressure, my belly, they pay me, my head, they hurt, all my body, they ache me. Under pressure, black people, under pressure. Under pressure, I can't even wake up to see any good news for my people. I'm so under, under pressure. pressure Nigerians, under pressure, under pressure, Africans, under pressure. No food, be rebellious. I say make I go my other African country, may we go jolly. I enter Ethiopian house, I see, say them too, then they under pressure. No money, in our pocket, no bed, we eat, the people. I come out there, I enter Turkish room, whether that, that place, at least I feel relate. I realize that uh, even them too, they're under pressure. They must suffer, in a ghetto, in a city, everywhere, that me go, we see them. Niger, every part of this country is under pressure. My people, when we feel come up for this pressure, it's too much. My belly, my body, they ache me. Some are cry, some are die, some are weeping, some are wailing, everywhere, now I'm going. When will the black man ever see something good? When will the black man ever walk and gain and, you know, just have a good life? When, 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 my people? This pressure too much, I bet. Under pressure, we will, under pressure. Under pressure, everybody, under pressure. Under pressure, black and white, under pressure. Under pressure, Europeans, under pressure. Young and no food, if we go free with belly. Believe it, you too, no, I'm no mother. Believe it, you too.
Continue to follow the Rubicon Club as we bring you more of this to come. No, no, Everything is so fucked up where we want to start from, my brother. This pressure too much. I day Europe, I see they under pressure. Every day my phone they ring. Back home, everybody. Pressure, pressure, everybody. Join hands together as we march for freedom, as we raise this movement. Continue to follow the Rubicon Club. If you want to be part of this contribution, kindly come up tonight as we move, as we continue to elaborate on how we feel come up for this pressure, because it's too much. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, beat your chest, say, this pressure, your children no good day, dear. You no good get pressure finished, my brother. May your still child, your children still carry this pressure. No, 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 be no go happen. Touch your head, say, this pressure, where I did so, my children no go inherit her. That is why you need to join hands together, continue to follow the club and the moderators as we rub minds together on how we feel come up for this pressure. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hisba, for that interlude. Um, it is quite evident from everything that's been said that the British have relentlessly pursued cultural, economic, and political uniformity and sameness with as much vigor as they have emphasized the difference between African peoples in order to rule them. So at this point, we'll take comments and questions from Borden Wells, from Wola, shall not be named, Baba Alawo, Patrick Harvey, in that order. And I will take the others that are just coming on stage. So, Borden Wells, please go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, okay, first, I would just want to touch on uh, the Pan-Africanists. I don't know, it might sound like a bit of a stretch, but I personally, I feel Pan-Africanists are white supremacists, you know, in black skin. Just point blank, um, simple. Because, you know, I find it ridiculous that you, you need the whole continent to come together to fight this, you know, this imaginary race that is so troubling you guys. You know, it's, it, it, they, they really do present black people as weaklings. Because it's just so, it's so disheartening that you need Nigeria, Ghana, ev like every single body to come together and then you have this one army that represents it. It's, it's just bullshit. So I, I see them as, um, many of them as um, white supremacists in black skin. And to what um, Queen Sheba said um, about the South, I, I, I think um, I think many more people in the South have been, um, they've been defeated me uh, mentally. Like I feel they've been subdued mentally because I at times I try to imagine if our ancestors are like us, like the way we are presently and our ancestors were like us. Many of us would be picking food from the dustbin. We, there would be no difference between us and the Amalgeries. Point blank, simple. We, we wouldn't be different from Amalgeries. We'll be picking, we'll probably have our plates in hand and we'll be queuing up at one of the Hobbers palace and you know we'll line up there and we'll be begging for food because that's what i just see in the south like we are so and christianity and islam i don't they've done us so, so much damage and that's why we the idea of even defending yourself comes across as a sin like you you literally believe defending yourself you protecting yourself you know it's it's a sin and 
as sad as sad as it might sound, um, you know, you even have educated people, you know, educated people in the South, like very educated people that still believe even everything that Bunker has said now, like they, they literally still believe that he's just talking out of his ass. They, and they are on this stage here. None of none of what Bunker has said makes sense to them. So those kind of people, of course, they've been mentally subdued. They are not different from Ausa, who, who have been mentally subdued. So that's just what I believe that. Um, Christianity and Islam has done more damage than good to us. And if our forefathers were Christians, it would definitely be our majorities today. You know, we'll be picking, we'll be even picking up food from the waste bin and all that. That's just my submission. Yes, that's a brilliant submission, bottom wells. Uh, Bola, are you there? Because you've been on for a bit. I don't know if you're there. But oh, if you're can not... you come back to me, please? Okay, good, good. Yeah, so we'll take. Right. Shall not be named. Uh, okay, we'll move on. Should we lost you for? I think your network is. <coughs> okay, up. sorry. Shall shall not be named. Are you there? Shall not be named. Silence. Okay, we'll move on to the next person. Um, Philip. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, it's your turn. Oh, thank you. Uh, each time I come to this room, I learn something new. Because like they say, knowledge is power. I've been in and out because I've been like running around. And you know, I want to commend you guys once more. Uh, I want to commend Bunker, especially. I'm forced to call him the walking encyclopedia of uh, African world history and everything. Knowledge, you say, is power. It's not, it's, it's still true till tomorrow. I want to employ everybody in this house to, to, you know, let's continue to seek, you know, knowledge because it's only with knowledge we can fight this battle. You know, knowledge and strategy is very important. I want to start from the, uh, somebody uh, spoke about, you know, this open grazing and, you know, the quest for the full and ease to, you know, declare, you sure they've already declared it, you know, the Ruga, the Ruga, if Buari has been consistently on it since, you know, he became president. And if you ever want to throw a little bit of light into the real situation, it's a lot of, a lot of us know it, but when you see a government that doesn't even believe in the law, the constitution that they feel that they've imposed in us, they don't even believe in it. You know, that's real, real crisis. As it is today, when Malami came out and said that uh, the gazettes that has to do with open grazing, they're going to set up a committee to go and trace those grazing routes and implement it, it was, something really really absurd a lot of people know it but you see nobody is coming out to challenge this this these monsters because as it is in nigeria today it is not even possible legally even if we know that the constitution that we have is flawed it doesn't emanate from the people but if we if, even if if we even decide to go with what the law says it's not possible because before uh, 1978, when the land use decree came in, the states, uh, the states and the regions had their own respective, you know, land use, you know, laws and edicts, as it, as it was in the military era. But it was Obasanjo that came in and set up a committee that harmonized all the land uh, laws and put them under a decree called the land use decree. And in 1999, this land use decree was not inserted in the 1999 constitution. What that means is we all know the, 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 the basic provisions of the land use decree, which is it is the state governors that have powers at all public lands, all lands in the state, not just public, all lands in the state, you know, reside with the governors. And that was draconian because indigenous people were not consulted. 
these are the, 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 the evils of the military. It was draconian. But as it is, in every state today, if you want to get a land, there's what they call governor's consent and all that. The only exception to that is when it is overriding public interests. And it's only the governor that can come forward and say, this piece of land, we need it for this kind of project, and it's for the general interest of the people. So the question is, how as uh, grazing um, ranches or ruga become an overriding public interest? So we need to know all these things so that when we engage in conversations like this, we, we know what to do. I was just going uh, through, I saw, was it yesterday, I saw a judgment from a high court in Ohio State, which, which was given in July, because when uh, Igbo was uh, arrested, his lawyers went to court. And there's already a judgment of the High Court in Ohio State, which has clearly stated that Nigerians have the right to self-determination. Looking at our domestic laws, international laws, and all the uh, treaties we've signed, to, we've signed uh, onto. So that judgment is still very, very valid. The court did not even stop at that. The court awarded the board the sum of 20 billion naira. The only objection of Malami, who is not even fit to be, I, because of course, this kind of sonship they have is a uh, quota system senior advocate. The only objection they brought was that the board doesn't have a locus, but the court threw it out. That today is a standard judgment. So. When we are doing when we are doing this and this self determination and all that, it is very 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 legal. But a lot of us might not take it serious because we've all lost faith in our system in the court system. But as it is today, it is legal to go into to do self determination. So what I'm saying all this is that we might say we might come here every day and you know rub minds, share knowledge and everything, but. I'm a, very, I'm a very realistic person. I think it's very important for us, if we've been coming together for this number of days, it's very important. If it's, it's, it doesn't have to be everybody for us to have our own kind of line of action. Because at the end of the day, it's not just going to be we talk, we share ideas and all that. What is our own line of action that we can take and vindicate our conscience that we did something. On a lighter note, when uh, Isba was during the interlude, I really enjoyed his commentary and all that. And something came to my mind. I said, Isba, it's high time you do something like a Rubicon radio to broadcast to the world about <laughs> what you feel and our, our agitation. Thank you. Again, yeah, I reckon, thank you so much, uh, Philip. I, I reckon that will be considered by, by his part. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> nice one, <laughs> nice one, his bar. So we'll just move on real quick to the next person, which is Ola Matusa. Okay, Ola is not here, so we'll see Shay she, Shina. Shay, are you there? No, Ade, 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 you're not there. Okay, Bo, let's have Bo, please. Bo is not there. Ola, um, are you Shay, there? Shay Shay in case if you still, if I can still Okay, go. Shay Shina. Okay, Shay, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just have a question for the scholars in the house. Um, I'm trying to make a correlation between a book that I read. I'm not sure if many have read it. Um, it's called The, um, the Economic Hitman um, and to what is going on in Nigeria. Um, as in, is Nigeria just being handicapped by the, by the elite, you know, Whatever it is, um, Yoruba, Abusas, whatever the case may be, or are they being, or are our leaders being threatened by the by the West? You know, just like for example, um, let's say Saddam Hussein, for example, because he didn't want to play ball, um, his country was invaded, he was he was killed and stuff like that. Like, um, can we, or am I am I too out um out far too far out there with my thinking? Um, with the economic hitman is you know whereby. Uh, the West, let's say America, for example, will probably threaten a leader of a country um, if they don't play ball with them and they will take them out. Um, you know, they will, they will make them feel too rich, whatever the case may be. And, you know, and they can have possession of land or 
or resources of that part of a particular region. But if they refuse and they want to be a nationalist or whatever the case may be, they will find a way to, you know, get their people against them, create chaos in their country, and then eventually get rid of them. I don't know, is Nigeria kind of going through that or do we just have greedy leaders that don't have on um, prospect and just want to control others? Thank you. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any response to that, because we're almost rounding up, we've got about 15 minutes, so we just want to make a, a quick run through the questions and comments. G Baba. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. I'm here listening to everyone. Just to do a quick touch of the question that be, that has been asked by the last uh, speaker, Mr. Shay, right? Yes, uh, the, the truth be said, there are so many factors why nothing is changing. Of course, uh, there are definitely a foreign influence. And with the foreign influence to those that are in power, it's a lot easier to actually, you know, go by the foreign influence. For example, if there's such an influence from the European hand, a person like Buhari, if he had gone against it, he would not be able to have access to medical care. And, uh, you know, in order for them to have that kind of access and protection and privacy, you know, they have to do the wish of the colonial masters. And if you pay attention, Tinubu is on the line. It looks like if you want to be president of Nigeria, just be sick, be uh, admitted to the London or UK, whichever hospital in the UK, and you're, you're on your way to Asorok. Then secondly, uh, the beneficiary of those that are complying to the external influence, they are actually more or less a beneficiary. Like if you are getting something for free for a very long time and you don't have to, all you have to do is just obey, I'm, I'm sure you will not ask questions. And for those of us in the South, I think there has been a lot of long systematic brainwashing that's gone on. It's been true religion, it's been true, you know, shaming us, calling us, uh, uh, you know, they will call us tribalists. They look for all sorts of names. I mean, think about it. If you get called certain names that are demeaning, I mean, sometimes you don't even know who you are anymore. So that's where we are, and that's why it doesn't matter who becomes a president. I mean, Jonathan, you, I, I mean, of course, as in, I think Jonathan is not as intelligent as I thought he should be. And the man might even have a little spine, but if you pay attention, it's always like you feel like he's carrying a huge chain on him. And uh, it, there's nothing they can do. It doesn't matter who's in there. And that's why we have decided at this moment that, you know, giving us our own space is the right way to go. And even amongst us, the greatest resistance we have now is those that are among us. We don't, we don't, we don't have the majority participation. We still have a lot of our people that are still in the brainwash. Most of the resistance that I have right now is mostly from my Yoruba people. They don't get it. They actually cut through to the, to the north. And I'm actually carrying out an experiment and I begin to see some of them begin to develop some people's you know, sentiment. And as soon as you twist that into the north, they are very much more defensive. And shortly, you know, I, Bunka gave me some kind of challenge the other day. And I started digging my head like, man, this African history, you know, so I started looking at the Benin Kingdom, and that's what's actually on my PTR, right? So I was digging into what I can see in the Benin Kingdom, right? The kings and, you know, those has been the ruler of it. It shows or the, the pit civilization. And out of curiosity, you know, I was able to come up with a list of the people who have ruled the Benin Kingdom, dating back to 40 before Christ. And my next thing is, when, when these people in Benin were actually civilized, you know, the British was... All, was at that time still under the Roman rule. There was nothing like Britain until 1066 when Williams, you know, the conqueror conquered the land and they became an empire. At that time, we were close to the end of that particular dynasty, almost at the beginning of Eureka one. This is just to put in perspective how far, how long we have been. And this is just taking one civilization. Honorable, off your mic, off your mic. You have bashed the British enough. Okay, anyway, so to, 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 to go away, right? So if you look at the state of Nigeria today, I think that's where we are. And 
it's so much more that um, we've we've become so de we have become we have come to a point where we de dehumanize ourselves. I mean, I, there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a video going on in on on the social media now about this school children. So I, I reached out to some of my guys to show them this is what Nigeria represents. And one of them had the audacity to send me the response of the government saying this is a low cost private school. Yeah. That's how far we have gone. We are citizens means nothing in the hand of those that are meant to serve them. I, I, I it's anyway, um, I think I'm switching my response to ranting. So I think it's item I, I dropped my mic. Yes, thank <laughs> Thanks you. For so much. That, that's quite passionate of you. Justice, please. It, it's your turn. Go ahead. Justice, are you there? Okay, let's move on to Ola Matusa. Ola Matusa, are you there? Ola, Ola is not there. We'll take uh, Emmanuel Ikem. Hello, Emmanuel yeah. Ikem. Yeah, Hello. just uh, final comment. So try to keep it not too long, okay, please. Yeah, um, thanks. We're not fine. Well, um, I, I, I wanted to respond to the King Judge of Popobo. Uh, just to confirm, Emede uh, uh, say is from Ghana. Ghana, Bibo. Yes, he said, he said he's from his Ghanaian. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so, um, so why I ask this question is this, uh, I I, I'm opportune to you know to it, um, to know many Ghanaians and they, I, I work with them and not only Ghanaians as well some African countries um, I, I work with them but there's something that most of them do say about Nigeria they hold Nigeria in high esteem and most Ghanaians that have had this um, discussion about Biafra they say no. That they don't want us to go our, our separate way. That Nigeria is a big country. That 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 one would that uh, if we break apart, you know, it will be, um, 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 uh, we be in different chunks. That that Nigeria should never break. And and these are Ghanaians telling me this. And I say to them, Do you understand the structure of Nigeria? Do you understand how Nigeria is? They said to me, oh, that Nigeria is a great country. Oh, look at the kind of houses, you know, look at the road. I said to them, oh, it's like you, you watch uh, 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 so many Nigerian movies that there are things that you people don't understand. And I finally had that, you know, for them to, you know, to have that notion about Nigeria, that Nigeria is great, that we should not break. And so, I'm not surprised that is it King Jaja will make um, such a uh, statement, but I understand where it's coming from, but, but it's now I'm now beginning to understand that with few Ghanaians that I've spoken with, all of them have this opinion pan that we are wired, we are tribal in nature, and the, we always play that tribal sentiment. So whatever we do should be based on the way we are wired. And I need our African brethren to understand this. It's not that we hate anybody. I said to them, listen, we can have our different nation. Then we can come together, sit down on a round table, and then we can have a trade deal. You know, we can do things together like EU. Okay, look at what Ghana is doing to Nigerians today. You know, they are chasing them away, particularly Igbos. You know, they're pushing them away. And you want pan-Africanism. Uh, uh, and, and what is happening, and what uh, Ghanaian government is doing to Nigeria, I don't think if uh, uh, most Ghanaians are aware of that, and, and, and some of them will not come and say pan-Africanism. And, and this is one of the reasons why, honestly, in as much as people hold uh, from uh, Nkume, a high esteem and Zeke, I do not because as an educated person, they could have seen far, at least then, 
back in the 60s when um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah and Zeke were championing this, the, the EU, they could see that EU, they came together as a different country, forming EU for, for economic yeah, purposes. So they should have at least seen that light, but they did not see it. Yes, we all know where they are coming from. Yes, it's good faith, but you, you, know, you have to count one first before you count two. There is a saying in the Igbo that Anhaman Masuno Potesi. What it means is this. You, you need to sort your place out first, then before you can sort others out. If you want Pan-Africanism, it's great. You sort your country. Because when you're able to sort your country out, when you, um, uh, um, uh, then you can be able to negotiate with other countries. Because for you sorting your country out, that means you are civilized. That means you are able to deal with local politics. And then you can now come up on the world stage whereby people will listen to you, whereby you have that person you know, to listen and also to understand how other countries or how other people live their life. I, I, I tell you this, Nigerian government can never negotiate because they don't know how to run a country. If, if you put any Nigerian uh, government official in any in the world state, they will flow because they don't know what it is, you know, to build a country and how can they represent you in the international, uh, 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 on the international uh, stage. So the point I'm trying to make is this: yes, Pan Africanism is, is is great, but you need to count one before you count two, and then we as Africa can, uh, we as African, you know, can unite. And then build a common form, just like uh, uh, we end up with um, uh, this man, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Maman Gaddafi. Yes, so many people do cite example with uh, uh, Maman uh, Gaddafi. Yes, we understand what the guy was uh, was trying to do, but people sometimes. He did not realize that his enemy, his enemies will come for him. And if Gaddafi was not playing a tribal politics, whereby some, uh, whereby some, um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, is marginalizing some tribe, and the West they use that that section, that tribe that he was marginalizing, you have to get him. So the moral lesson here is this. When you are a leader, and you know that you have a genuine uh, um, uh, a project, you have the minds of your people at your heart. You need to be very careful. You need to come with a clean hand, hand, so that your people will always support you. Your people will always back you when the enemy wanna get you. Your people will say no. Honestly, I was surprised what happened to uh, Gaddafi. Yes, but the West, they understood the game, and they knew when to strike, and, and they struck. We, we, we all know what happened to Maman Gaddafi. And oh, that's my Randall case. Emmanuel. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that submission, Emmanuel. We're almost rounding up, so I'll just give one more shot at justice, if you're there. Uh, but if you're not, then we'll take Bo Olutokun. Bo. Oh, Boy. yeah. I mean, I don't have much to say. I just want to big ups to D. I always love your numbers. Um, big ups to my brother, Wonka. You know, your historical perspective is always on point. Well, I, I just want to always say this. I always like saying this to the audience that, you know, the reason why people like D and Wonka are doing this is to enlighten us and, and bring, up to, bring us up to speed on what the realities are. You know, all these uh, economic concepts, historical perspectives that are given is to let us know that we're in dire straits and we need to wake up. 
let us not just take this as some kind of academic lesson. No, let us take this as a lesson that teaches us that we need to wake up, otherwise our grandchildren, our children will be enslaved in perpetuity. The time is now. We are the ones that need to do something. We are the people that we have been waiting for. The time is now. Let us take these lessons, let us digest it, and let us act on it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Brilliant, Bo. SB, uh, you haven't said anything yet. Uh, just if, you, if you've got stuff to say, because we're rounding up. SB? Yeah, sorry, sorry. That is true. Definitely have not. Uh, I've been in and out because I've other, got some meetings other things. But uh, I will support what um, Olu Kotun just said. This is our time now to get this thing done. Let's imagine 200 years ago and war broke out and, you know, either Igbo land, Yoruba land, Efik land is invaded. What will you do? So this is time for us to do what we need to do to protect and just focus on it because if we don't focus on on our agenda of freeing ourselves and part of us is on this political um ladder and part of us is on national um self-determination we won't get there we must not give legitimacy to the fraudulent document. Bunker has been kind enough to give us details and details and details. It's, I mean, I know some people may still find it difficult to want to believe, but we don't need 100%. What we need is more than 50% of support. More importantly is we need to be a good bunch, especially the region of South East, South South is extremely important. There must be closed door meetings as regular as possible to make sure that the two regions act as one, don't act against one another to a point that it may jeopardize this agitation. It's, I mean, it is doable. We better be one than be, than be in line with those who want to eliminate us. Think of the French and the English when they were splitting Africa. I mean, till today, the French, the English are not really, you know, um, great friends. But they respected each other when they were splitting, scrambling for Africa. So we need to be friends and conquer ourselves from these, these animals, these soulless individuals that have no, I mean, they have no, no human feelings at all. We cannot sit around the table with them. We just need to deliver ourselves with, by all means necessary that, that, that is doable. Thank you. Thank you very much, SB. Um, Bam Tefa, any final words? Bam Tefa? Olua Tosin, and then I'm going to round up. Oluwatosin. I'll take one more shot at Bamtefa. Okay. Um, well, just uh, at this point, we'll just round up. We've been here for the last six hours, guys. Um, oh, so uh, it's... I'm sure, sure that, uh, Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, um, there was a question. Uh, someone asked a question. I don't think he was asked. I'm not mistaken. You're, you're underwater in a box. We can't exactly hear you. I'm Can you sorry. hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? 
Uh, somewhat. Give it a shot again. No, I, I was saying that someone asked the question, and I don't know, I don't know if it was answered about neocolonialism. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, a lot has been said. You know, been doing a lot of listening, a lot of back and forth. So, I'm not quite okay. sure who asked the question. Okay, let, let me just be a minute and no, let me just um share a little a bit of bit of light on that. You know, okay, he, okay. He he said that I think he, he said uh he read a book that he wanted to know if the for example the Nigerian leaders now have actually been influenced by you know by the by the West you know not to take care of their people, you know, and uh and I, my answer would be that uh, it depends on who you who who they have in power who is in power and when it comes to africa once you're doing good you're, you're good to your people once you're doing what you have to do to your people you're growing your economy your country is working you become a target because that means that their own needs is now secondary you know the needs of your people are primary to you and they don't want their needs to be secondary to, to you because they, they they need your resources and uh, and of course you need the resources to take care of your people and you taking care of your people with your resources means they're not getting enough or they're not getting any you know even if even when they're still getting a little just, let me bring it back home let's talk about jonathan he might not be the perfect example but look at what happened and uh, an election that that, that, that he, he so called he, he kind of he they say he lost look at how the u.s stopped selling him arms Look at how they, they, they connive uh, with, with, the, with the Fulanese and believed he was killing people in the north when he was trying to fight terrorism. Look at how uh, the, 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 I think that was Secretary of State uh, uh, came to Nigeria on, in, on the eve of an election, a presidential election, and and, you know, and the Nigerian economy was wonderful at that time, wonderful. People were not complaining. Yeah, there was corruption, no doubt about that. But that economy was was wonderful. It was, they were doing good. Compare that to what is happening now. People are dying. People have been killed. The economy is in recession for for for, for years now, and it's like who the the British Science Commission has run around the whole country, telling you that Nigeria is a, a wonderful la 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 la, you know, amazing. That is how it's exactly how it works because they are benefiting, and when they are benefiting, they don't get they, they, once the guy there is doing what he wants, he can do whatever he wants. Nobody's forcing them. The, the, the Nigerian elite today. And not be forced to do nothing because they're actually doing what the, the colonizer wants them to do. You know, just want to shed light on that. Okay, thank you so much, Anna Books, for those insights that you've just shared. Uh, well, just before we round up, I think I'll just make my own final comments. Uh, in my opinion, I think that um, the aim of the British in seeking to engineer cultural and economic sameness by socializing the indigenous people of Nigeria into the administrative mainstream of the Fulanis has been the highest possible achievement of indirect rule. So the aim of the British in, in magnifying ethnic and cultural difference has always been the... Um, establishment of a firm foundation for indirect rule. So it's been an obsession of theirs, but the thing is that the worldview and practices of the indigenous peoples have always been incompatible with the said indirect rule. So maybe Frederick Lagarde operated with the false assumption that Islam is by default the religion of the people, even though the presence of traditionalists was evident, I don't know. Maybe the British administrators uh, assumed that the non-Muslim indigenous people would become Muslims eventually, I don't know. Uh, maybe they thought that the Muslims of the North should be protected from Christian proselytization, but then that would be funny to think of and self-indicting since Britain and most other Western countries were founded on Judeo-Christian principles. So you see, there's a there's a question in there. So basically, the whole Fulani uh, conflict has evolved from spontaneous reactions to provocations and now to deadlier planned attacks. And 
now look, see where we are. You know, we uh, it seems like we're stuck, but then that's why we say what we say. That's why we have the likes of Bo Cardi and the rest of them to come on here and try to educate our people. And like Bo said, this is not just an academic exercise. This is to get you conscious. This is to wake people up, especially people of the southern part of Nigeria, the middle belt. You know, it's time that we begin to take some of these things serious. Uh, we're no longer kids. A lot of us here are adults. Some of us have kids. So we need to begin to awaken ourselves and drop some of the mundane distractions that we like to distract ourselves with. So I'll just round up by saying that once again, this is the Rubicon where we talk about breaking news headlines and all the latest events happening, not just in Nigeria or Africa, but all over the world. We have loads and loads of interesting and informative sessions coming up. So all you need to do is just follow the club Shoot by clicking it. on the greenhouse button. Shoot yes. Uh, can you bring up Adam Mugaba, please? Oh, really? Um, where is he? Adam Mugaba. Okay. Sorry, guys. Hello, Adam Mugaba. Okay. Hello, Hello Adamu. Adamu, uh, Adamu Garba, how are you? I'm doing very good. How are you guys? We are doing very fine. Um, you know, you are you, you are everywhere now. So whenever we see you on the stage, we want to recognize you. Uh, we also appreciate what you're doing. Uh, we've heard you speak in many... Um, uh news channels and everything and please i want to quickly engage you grab your indulgence if you don't mind uh, no, 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 no. most of us here are in diaspora you know mm. and we've been seeing what is going on in the country mm. what can you say it is is the real situation we are seeing so many insecurities. Some of us still don't understand. A lot of us have not been home for mm. some time, for a long time. So what is, you know, you wake up every day is so, what is it about the administration? Is it about the country itself? Because we've also been hearing a lot of things. We don't know how to place the real problem of the country. Please, is there anything you have to say about it? Um, thank you very much uh, for bringing me on board. Even though I was just navigating through um, Clubhouse and I saw the topic Angulo Fulani Jihad from Usman Damfodio to Buhari, I thought this would be a very interesting topic. So let me just say, uh, listen. Um, but I appreciate the recognition deeply. And I'm very happy to, to be among at least uh, greater Nigerians that are making us very proud all over the world, the diaspora community. Um, I think the, based on my understanding, um, the problem we have in this country where you always see crisis all over have to do with the original architecture of the country or the engineering of the making of the country. If all of us would want to be sincere with ourselves, even if you go back to the history of amalgamation of the 1914, if we can get it very clear, you will see that that 1914 amalgamation that took place in January um, just a few months after, I think in July, we now have the beginning of the First World War. And if all of us uh, um, understand a little bit of history, you will see that the main cause of First World War was the control of the oil supply route across the global oceans. That's actually what brings about uh, most of it. Although, of course, there is a precipitation from the murder of, 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 of the, the Archduke of Austria, but, but if you check the main uh, war between German and its allies and the UK and their own allies, it's clearly trying to show that whoever controls the oil uh, supply in the world uh, is actually um, the person in charge. And even prior to that, in 1911, there was an agreement, um, uh, or I can say a legislation that uh, Winston Churchill passed uh, to guarantee the control of the passion oil, whereby the UK will have total control of the 51% of the of the Anglo-Persian oil company.
so uh, which eventually become DP. So when you look at this, you find out that the architecture of designing Nigeria itself, why the amalgamation took place, even though we may want to see as a strange marriage, but it's a colonial system whereby the control of the oil as the de on, in the Delta was the core driver behind the engineering. Because the South uh, has very communities that are, you know, in silos, most of which are operating in their own democratic ways. So there is no central control of the system, but the North has an empire looking control system and thereby merging them together will reduce the administrative cost from the colonial masters and then also give them opportunity to be able to control the oil of the Delta from the people outside the oil region. That is exactly what brings about the amalgamation and eventual independence after Suez Canal crisis that makes the US to mandate all the colonial people to get out of Africa and give independence. So when you look at all those things, you find out that 99% of the crisis that we face among ourselves has to do with the fact that we refuse to look at the root cause of the problem. And the root cause of the problem is the resource that is being extracted. So as long as this resource is there and it has to be extracted, all of us must never discover each other, must not understand each other, must not agree with one another so that we can be diverted away from the main reason why that when we come together, we are going to benefit from the resource that is on our soil. So this is exactly the whole, the whole drama. So again, when we come back to the democracy, you and I know the crisis that happened when Obasanjo was the president, uh, Yoruba man, and there we have OPC. We now have Yaradua when he became the president, a Hausa Muslim uh, Sunni man. You now have a Muslim Sunni group called Boko Haram that wanted to crash the country. When Jonathan came on board, there were Niger Delta bombings all over. And now you have Buhari, a Fulani man, and you have Fulani heart man crisis. So there is a lot of things that is happening, which is not holy, you know, something that has to do with who uh, the, 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 the people that are in charge of the system, but also the control of the system even from outside. So what we need to do, especially uh, the, the younger generation, is to look into the root cause of this problem and see Nigeria beyond the oil resources that has given us so much trouble. Because as long as we keep talking about our differences, instead of looking at these differences as diversity, we will always have problems. I'm sure most of you are from the, most of the most co cosmopolitan co country in the world, United States, where you have different people with different kind of ideology, different religion, different type, but they are one. Why? Because the system is driven by the productivity of each individual who form the component of the sovereignty of that country. So everybody is valued based on his relative contribution. But in our own case, those things are completely shut out. The economic system is driven by oil, and the entire financial system is disconnected from the real economy. Poverty is all over, and once somebody is hungry, what he's looking for is whatever it is you can give him to do what he thinks he needs to do. In fact, some people are even engaged in this kind of crime simply because they have nothing to do and there is no hope. So when you look at all those things, there are a lot of issues that we that have understood, we have studied, we have traveled, we are exposed. We owe it as an obligation to come with a new innovative thinking in the way this country will be engineered so that we can have a peaceful, prosperous, and purposeful country. So all these crises that you see around, we are just precipitated due to the complete confusion that made what is called Nigeria today. Separation cannot be the answer because it's just a drawing a line. So, Mr. Drawing Mr. Line Carver, let me cut you for a minute. You will go on, sir. But you no were problem. talking about the crisis. But one thing you did not put into perspective was that OPC did not go to the north to go and be attacking people in the north. Whatever was going on with the Niger Deltas, they did not go to other people's places. The only people that are going into other people's places and displacing them is the headsmen. And another thing you didn't put into perspective was that Obasanya did not spare OPC. Uh, this, this, this current government has so much sympathy for the headsmen that they've become very invincible. They've made it very hard for us to be able to protect ourselves. So we see a kind of ethnic ethnic um, ethnic support because they are his people in a way he will not have tolerated. You see the extent he goes to get Namdekanu, the extent that he goes to get Sunday Goho, but they are not going through that extent to put the headsmen in check. That's the issue we have.
Yes, I, I, I actually understand you, and I want to also confess with the fact that when the Hartman crisis started, it was actually seen by the, by the leadership as an ethnic issue, as an ethnic castigation issue, more than a serious insurgency that, could, that is capable of bringing serious trouble with the country. And you know, once you have a vacuum of delivering justice effectively and timely, you create that vacuum will not be filled by crime. And this is why we have a situation where we have full-scale insurgency going up in the Northwest. Now, you are completely right with the fact that the OPC and, 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 and Niger Deltas were attacking those areas, but this case was there was an administrative uh, justice lab. But I think the government, also mis on, the government also understood their own mistake. I'm not speaking on their behalf. I'm speaking based on what I know, based on what I, what I understand, what, what, based on my own personal understanding of view. The government understood that they made a mistake that created a monster that give us additional war in the country. Because whether we like to confess, whether we like to, to, to say it openly or not, what is happening in the Northwest today is a full-grown insurgency between the people that are violent, criminal, blood suckers elements, you know, trying to overrun the, even the Fulanis that are living in those villages and the innocent people that are living happily in those villages were destroyed by the same set of criminal elements. So therefore, the state had to respond with full state power to be able to quench them. So yes, there was mistake, you know, in the beginning by looking at it through the et ethnic coloration angle. But now, I think measures have been taken in place, uh, have been put in place to ensure that this insurgency is actually being tackled. And of course, we are paying the price now because most of the money that we are supposed to use to build infrastructure in those places, we are using it to, to just burn uh, uh, bullets and bombs and, and, and then, and then that's it. So it's a problem. I agree there was lack of justice in the beginning. And now the government is taking measures to see whether what they are doing is going to solve the problem or not. But what I'm trying to call our attention is the whole issue has to, to, has to be around humanity. Who are we? What are we supposed to do? Where are we supposed to go to? What is our purpose? What is our goal as a nation? Now, those, most of these people that are suffering, those people that are paying serious price, especially the innocent people in the middle of this insurgency, are looking to us to see what we can do in our own capacity as people that are exposed and intelligent and people that have capacity to be able to do the right thing, to come to their aid. Here we are mostly talking about the differences. So that is why we need to really, really look into this thing very, very deeply and ask ourselves individually that what are we doing to solve this problem? as opposed to always trying to look at it from the ethnic, religious, and sectional angle. What are we really doing ourselves to really, really address this problem? Because there are serious trouble and hunger and suffering and diseases and killing. So, Mr. Adama, is going on in this country that we have to do something about. Mr. Adama, we think it's a jihad going on. That's what we think. And we think that... With you, to be very yes. candid with you, you and I know what is happening in Africa. If you check the history of what happened in Mali, the fall of Timbuktu, everybody thought it was a jihad, the Ansar Dine crisis that went to crash Timbuktu, destroy cities. But this group, where are they today? We saw what happened in Libya. We saw what happened in Burkina Faso, what is even currently happening in Burkina Faso. Even now, you saw what is happening in Sudan.
that guarantees the exploitation of this gold for the benefit of the whole, as opposed to the benefit of the few. So everybody will find excuses, the convenient excuses, religious, tribal, sentimental, as in uh, uh, whatever, just to be able to crash a problem. But there is okay. nothing uh, Mr. Wrong Adamu, uh, you. Mr. Adamu, I believe some people would want to engage you. Uh, maybe we should just give them the chance so you have chance to reply please this back can i quickly go uh, if you want to by the way uh, no one on, no on. one is allowed to disrespect him uh -huh. please no far yeah. word yeah. let's engage ourselves intellectually uh please click your mic um this back I, bola okay can i go bola you are number one wait i'm giving numbers bola you are number one uh justice you are number two g baba you are number three Okay, Lisa B, you are number four. Please, well, number one, you can go now. Okay, um, Mr. Adamo, good, um, good evening, good morning, good um, night. You started off saying that the 1914 is a problem, and then you concluded that we're better off staying together. If you're concluding that we're better off staying together, would you support that we should pause everything that has to do with elections right now and then come together and decide if we want to be together and change the constitution the thing is this is simplistic and easy but it's not as 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 easy as simple as you think because there's already a social contract a constitution that is binding the citizenry with the country so it's very difficult for us to now create uh, to to come up with any anything at all except violently that can say everything should stop no it doesn't because have to be violent so the way to go about doing this is the good way to go about doing this is identify people with such mindset make sure that these people with such mindset succeed in being in charge of the affairs of the country then these people can be able to legislate review the constitution and come to terms of what should be done appropriately to be able to reposition Nigeria to what it's supposed to be. Can I quickly but take your now, on that? But for now, whatever somebody do to the national and international community, because you know how nations are built, there is a responsibility of right to protect that is vested on the leaders of this country, governed by the constitution that was agreed upon and signed based on the standards of UN Charter. Are you serious? Any that rose against the state violating this will now be deemed as that person is being rebellious. And there will be no result that will be realized from rebellion because you will always have other international bodies supporting the state against any other person. And at the end of the day, there will be no winning. But if okay. you have to can do I, it, can I, right can I come back? Can I come back? Yes. Just, okay. Uh, let, sorry, let me just Mr. 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 Yeah, Mr. Adamo, just a second. We'll take a question from Bola. Bola, please keep it brief. 30 seconds okay. to one minute, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, so you said people that have such minds should be elected into office. Do you know that the people that have such minds will be swearing on that constitution that we say is fraudulent to get into office? So how are they to change it? Even the national assembly is not does not have the right to make a new constitution so how is that possible why do you think we should elect people to come into office to change the constitution when we can pause all of that and change the constitution first thank you Bola. thank you for this question but that is why to my own knowledge i told you that it's not as simple as you think national assembly has right to, in collaboration with the executive government, to call in a constitutional conference and review the conference. So, be, without the National Assembly, there is no any other body that can be able to summon the country to come up on the constitutional review process that can re engineer a new Nigeria. So, however we want to look at it, we have to play by the existing rules. And that we have to be pragmatic, strategic, and play with the existing rules so that we can get the right mindset in the system that can be able to affect the changes we are looking for. And we have to be very pragmatic and realistic, knowing fully well that we might not get it immediately, but after some time, when there's a timeline that we can be able to put forward to ourselves, we can be able to achieve that. Because as I can tell you, the same way we see 
that maybe uh, the South is angry about the North, the North is angry about the South, the East is angry about the West, all those confusions. Every other citizen that is outside the cycle of power is angry, regardless of what they come from, regardless of who they are, and regardless of what they believe. So we have to get the right people first, and we have to play by the existing rules. Trying to reinvent or create a new rule now will be deemed, as I said, naturally, will be deemed as anti-constitutional, and it's a problem for us. So that is why it is important for us to look into this existing rule and dilute it and get in through the same window so that we can be able to create the necessary channel that can be able to re-engineer the new process for the country. That's actually my belief. All right, thank you. We'll, we'll go to the next person. Justice, are you available now? Hello, Justice. Let's uh, okay, we'll, go. I'll, I'll come back, please. Okay, we'll move on to G Baba, please. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Adamu, for joining us. Uh, for me, I'm an engineer, and I will give you my thoughts as an engineer, right? So if, we, if I get into, if I have an equipment, right, that is working, or something that is functioning and it goes bad, I try to get, you know, user manual to get it to its original state. Because more than often, if you put it back to its original state, it will begin to work. And the reason why I come up with this analogy is I heard what you said. You have a reference America. America is not a good comparison to the U.S. because the indigenous people of America were actually decimated. There was a genocide that was committed before America became America. And ideology in America is the same. I'm in America, and we have one single ideology. All of us are looking towards what will bring money into our pocket, regardless of what state you are. And as individuals here in the U.S., the president is like our slave. When we speak, we, when we speak, he responds. And I'll give an example. I'm currently working on a presidential response to a single citizen. A single citizen wrote to the president, and we have to pull resources, one person, just to attend to that one person, because the person has his complaint. That's how America runs today. Comparing that to Nigeria, it's not the same. Now, going back to the, my, my engineering analogy, Nigeria, the space was a nation an indigenous, different indigenous nation, nation that was not in any way sick. It was functioning well, but when it was put together, that's when the fault started. What will it take for whoever, for all of us, to sit down and agree that each one should go back to his own state, where they were, the original state, where they were functioning? How we want that state to be? If you, want, if you still want to keep Nigeria as a, you know, just as a figurehead, Let's have this conversation. This is what is not happening. Instead, we are being displaced. We are, in fact, the Fulanis are coming to the Southwest, where I came from, to literally displace my people. And they have started doing that from the, 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 North, the, the, the North East, where we have seen where they have actually literally displaced the indigenous people and taken over the land. This is what we are facing. So what? You said this thing is not as simple, but killing us is not also as simple. What will you suggest? Instead of us going after this political process that we have tried since our lower started, most of our, our representatives, they were, they were actually assassinated. We have Bola Ige, we have Funcho Williams. People who have spoken up on our behalf have been assassinated. We have Sunday Igbo, we have even Kanu. So now, from your submission, what do you think? We want something more simplified because it sounds to me like you speak around these people. What do you think? What are you guys talking about solving this problem? That's my question for you. Sir. Yes, sorry, Mr. Adamo, just before you continue, I think he's trying to make a point about uh, having that conversation. So what would you say about having a proper conversation to solve some of these issues that bedevil us? Thank you. So Mr. Garba, sorry, before you go, I'm, I'm sorry. So what we want is that we want these discussions on fixing this constitution to happen before any next elections. Because um, this election is, is, is like well, forcing us to be under a draconic law. So, but what politicians usually say is, do the elections first and then that will come later. And we see it as putting the cat before the horse, just to put it in perspective. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think trying to bring in um, a solution or maybe bringing a conversation before an election uh, is, is, is going to be very difficult in a very um, politically or democratic way because we did not participate in the process from the beginning. One of the biggest problems we have, and especially all of us Nigerians, those of us that have maybe well-paying jobs and that maybe those that are living in diaspora, is because we did not really pay attention to Nigerian politics over time until it started affecting us negatively. So again, that with that, we also still have to honor with the fact that our participation is still conversational outside the cycle, not within the Nigerian cycle. So it means we still have a gap of participation. We have to still be able to participate in the process. Most of these big politicians you see that the media in Nigeria is painting to you are actually empty, and the structures are usually not even solid as you think it is. All you need is just to participate and get deeper. You will explore more vulnerabilities than you could ever imagine, and you can be able to re-engineer the process in a way that will shock the whole world. But because we don't participate, we put a wall between ourselves and the system and decide from outside the system, from whatever it is we are trying to bring that does not conform to the rule of the game, the people in charge, that the world recognized will always use that against any other activity that goes outside the rule of the game. No, uh, so what we need to do sorry is for continuing, sir. Some of us participated. We actually have been participating more than you think. But these people don't even listen to us. We've participated personally. I have participated so well, but no suggestion that they listen to. Yes, the thing is, the participation is not just about even being close to them and talking to them. The participation is getting into the game. I can give you a personal example. Last time I contested um, in the APC run up to the election, and there were a lot of issues that I discovered personally. They were my mistakes, and I decided to own them up. I didn't participate in the political process simply because I was thinking that is the idea and the understanding of the governance system that will make people to even listen to me. Or not to me, that in the primary election that actually determines mostly the president, not even the secondary election. So except if something happens, a revolutionary action happens, you know. So I now decided to say in the next coming election, I'll participate. I was in my ward, knew my chairman of the ward, voted for him, we went to the local government, we voted for the local government chairman, we went to the state, we now voted for the state chairman. Now we are waiting for the convention, I will still participate as the delegate and vote for the national chairman. But while I do that, I am part of the process. It's mandate for my state escorts to come to me in my house where I go to see them and they give me my attention and also listen to my interests. Similarly, local government and even state escorts. In fact, the state escorts even visited me in my office when they came to Abuja for thank you visit. So you need to understand that one of the problem is we leave these political machines that produce people in power to the hands of the people that don't even care about us, that don't even understand what it means to build a future. That the only thing they understand is how can I plug into the pipeline of money so I can steal and steal and steal till I am intoxicated by stealing. So this is the problem. So we have to really, really participate in the electioneering process. Even if you are not around, you are not here locally, Look for people that you have the same mindset. Pay attention to what they are doing. Advise them and get them in. That's the only way we can be able to make a very responsible and meaningful change to the system. Any other thing like, okay, calling them, we have to come and do constitutional talks. Before we do that, they will just see us violent. And there will be reaction. And these guys are secure where they are living. It's the poor man on the street that will be dying. Thank Those people that are living by the day are the people that will suffer at the end of the day. And there will be no results. Thank you, Mr. Gaba. Let me just follow up on that question that you just, um, thank you for the answers. Um, I just wanted to want to understand something. Uh, one, the first thing is that when you talk about participating in politics, a lot of people, 
actually have. And and in terms of last year's election, the 2019 election, I know personally I did, and I know a lot of people who supported political parties that were not the APC and PDP. And what happened in their primaries, they were infiltrated. We could see factions being created. Um, and before you know what's happening, some of the parties were actually deregistered. Um, the people, or the, you know, people came in and bought over local government uh, chairman that were actually supposed to be for the uh, political parties. Before we know what's happening, people from elsewhere became local government chairman of those political parties. Everything was flawed. One seventy-four political parties were deregistered. One seventy-four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so some political parties who perhaps may have had a chance, um, had their people, you know, almost at the last minute, bought over by, by elements that we, we, we don't know. Before you know what's happening, the people who were supporting the political party, sorry, who were in, in positions like local government chairmen and all that, were bought over by, by, by uh, you know, columnists. Let me say fifth, fifth columnists or whoever it is. And you find out that the party in, ended up being disinting, in disintegrating and being deregistered. So that's one point. The thing is, the whole system is flawed. So I want to ask a question because he keeps saying, follow the process. We have to follow the process in order to be able to make this change. So one question is, who made the rules of this engagement of how people need to follow the, who made the rules of that process you're talking about? Who created the rules? Okay. And another thing I want to, you to consider is, do you think slaves, because, uh, you know, what we are, we have in Nigeria now is, is a slave master relationship. Do you think slaves need to follow the process created for them by their masters? That's, that is the second question I want you to, 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 follow, to, to address. Because what we see in Nigeria is a situation where people are being um, enslaved, their resources are being taken away. They don't have any, 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 any uh, stake, you know, in terms of how, how policies, and, and policies and procedures are being created. So I want to understand who creates the rules that you are you expecting people to follow. Was this a consultation by the government, by the people? To create those rules, who made those rules? Uh, Mr. Garba, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I yes. Can. yes. We took a look at all the constitutions and we realized that they were usually Babangida and Abacha's decrees, right? Uh, the constitution that is talking about um, um, forced subsidy, for example, that was Babangida's decree. The constitution talking about um, security votes, that was Babangida's decree. Niger Delta. 13% derivation, de 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 that's a Bacha's decree. So literally, all we see here is military decrees being, being rolled into a constitution for us to follow by. And the same thing you're telling us is what APC was saying earlier. What they campaigned on was that the constitution will be changed and all that will happen. They got into power and they refused to do it, and we can't hold them to it. So this is like another cycle that you're trying to tell us. Do this, you're all going to get into power again, and then the story changes. So are we going to do this forever? I just wanted to add to what Queen said. Yeah, thank you, Bunka. Yes, yeah, so just to add on top of that as well, the, the uh, restructuring, Buhari campaigned on restructuring, and what happened to that? Um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, on the question of who made the rules. I think that is even the fundamental question behind everything, who made the rules now. If you go back to a little bit of history, you know, after the independence generation, uh, we now had the January crisis, January 15 crisis. Then we now have um, the civil war in the country. And this civil war, uh, we understand that at the end of the day, there are some military generals that took themselves upon themselves the right to victory, victory. So they are the leaders of the new Nigeria away from the independence generation and they set the game rolling from 1970 to the best of my knowledge all up to this very moment the same generation are the only generation that set the rules because they felt like they are the victors of the war so they must enjoy the oil let me just make it clear i think this is this is just the case so these guys still call the shots and make the rules now we have a generation during the pro-democracy activism after of course the the end of the cold war there's this pro-democracy activism all over the world. So we now were, success, were, were successful again to have some people in Nigeria, in Adeko, 
and so many pro-democracy activists then that brought about MK Adiola, the annulment, and subsequently, we still have the same generals again, changing their uniforms into Agbada and came into the system, and they still make the rules. And even though the democracy came back to the hands of the people that are wearing white caps, they now crashed them again and still took over, and they still make the rules. You will never imagine such kind of people to ever begin to think that you have a better understanding of Nigeria than they do because they always felt like they have fought a war and died and shed blood and won. So this is their right. So you are dealing with entitled generation that is almost expired, that wanted to go, but we refuse to make a meaningful, responsible, organized citizenry to go and give them to go arrest. We are still always trying to point fingers at one another. These guys still make the rules. And however still we want to look at it, the two major political parties, they still have influence on these major political parties. So again, but these major political parties is going away from their hands. By the end of this season, this 2023 season, they lost control. All of them, they are losing control. Now, but we, our generation, are still sleeping to their protégés because their protégés are trying to take over the control of the political machinery that produces power. Why? Because we refuse to participate and dilute this system. Whenever you get into the major political parties, keep the other smaller political parties aside. You know, we may want to be idealistic and think we can do something because political parties, any political party can produce the president or the leader. It's not possible. You must get into these major parties. And once you participate deeply into these major parties, a collective action will shut them down. I can give you an example of one thing that shook the entire country. Just recently, in 2021, we had NSAS problem. Almost all the elites in this country were shaken. So many of them were looking at, this is the end of their term. You know? But because of you know, the way the thing all concluded, it now became a problem. So they don't feel like there's still a gap, but that fear is still hanging in the balance. A small, deep level, highly coordinated organization from us and a slight push, I'm telling you, we will not have the new leaders that perhaps may salvage this country. But as long as we still think that same set of generals that still make the rules that we listen to all, that feel like they're entitled to the ownership of the resources of this country, we are not going to get nowhere. So we just have to tell ourselves the truth. Thank you. Let me just follow up on that uh, point. Uh, thank you for that, for your answer there. So you're saying that the people who fought the war, um, fought the war, felt they fought the war and conquered and, and have uh, this entitlement. And these are the same people who create the rules. Can you just please explain what you mean by they conquered? They fought the war and they fought the Biafran war which was only uh, the former Eastern region. So how come they have this mentality of the fought the war and conquered? What does that mean? That is actually the question that all of us need to answer. And by answering this question properly, we set the path to leaving Nigeria. I think we are losing your audio. Can you speak yes. a bit Yes, I said that is, that is actually the question that all of us have that we need to answer. Because these are very exclusive about this country. And if, as we run up to the next election cycle, we have to be very sincere with ourselves about the situation of the country. Because everybody is practically getting, the country is almost from all angles, is catching fire. So we have to just be very sincere. We have to answer this question together. Why do they have this sense of entitlement? And why is it that the country is held to ransom at all corners by the same set of people simply because of that particular event? But Mr. Garba, there's tension going on in the Middle Belt. A lot of killings going on in the Middle Belt. The Middle Belt played a big role in the Civil War, right? And even just area, the president during the time of the war was um, go on. There's a lot of ethnic cleansing going on in the state. There's a lot of ethnic cleansing going on in Danjuma state. So if this is about them, why are the um, major participants of the war also being attacked in their states as well? And this tension between the North and the Middle Belt, what exactly is it about? It's been going on since the 50s. 
since the days of um, Joseph Taka, the team riots. This ethnic cleansing since the days of Mam Larry. So it's more than the, the war, as you put it, sir. A lot of things come from different perspectives as well. No, I think the northern crisis or the division in the north, particularly between the north and the north central or the middle belt, as, as you call it, is also having another set of dimension that still had to do with that same problem that I mentioned, you know, because uh, that I mentioned earlier, because the problem we had then, it was British and America that controlled the oil before the French came. And after the war, they were able to also succeed in getting some shares through Total NI and Aji. Then again, Saudi have to play their own role because they are members of OPEC and Nigeria is supposed to be in the OPEC for the flow to be controlled. And then they now use religious angle uh, by exploiting some sheikhs to go and preach some kind of ideology that might be able to get them some control of the population in that their area so that that oil can also be they, so that Nigeria can join OPEC and then there can be crossbreeding between the Nigerian leaders from the north, especially the Muslim side of the north, you know, even though against all other sides of the north. And the only way to do that is to conform to that their ideology. And that ideology now creates a sharp division between the Muslims in the north and the Christians in the north. And that division was created in order for the international interest of Saudi in Nigeria's management of oil. Of course, so that is the situation that actually happened. If you remember the Constitutional Conference of 1978, where the crisis actually started, um, even Shagari had to walk out of the meeting when there was a request for a grand caddy of Nigeria. Sheikh Gumi wants to be the grand caddy of Nigeria, and the same way we have the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, they are supposed to be a grand caddy. Which is but he was already a grand caddy. Muritala Mohammed no, made no, no, no. him a we don't have We don't have a grand caddy of Nigeria. We have for northern Nigeria, but not for Nigeria. That time, it was requested that we should have part of the constitutional review that there should be a grand caddy of Nigeria. So the, north, the South rejected it. The South were supported by the northern Christians. And when the northern Christians participated, that now became a polarizing point. And we had the first reaction in Kafanchan crisis. And then subsequently, we have other crises in the Zangon Katap and other places in Adamawa, in Taraba, and Co. That now eventually the same set of people become so entrenched into that ideology to the point where we now see the reactions we're seeing with Boko Haram and Co. So we have to just understand these things, its evolution, and how it started. And from there, you now have the reactions that we are seeing today. Th thank so you. For us to be able to fix this, we still have to be able to be open about what the problem was. And how can we fix it properly by addressing the problem from its own root? And that root was something that came and imported into us that made us to look like we, the neighbors, are enemies to one another. That is what is driving all those cleansing and crises that you are talking about, that people may think it was a jihad or an incursion. But invariably, it was just a political issue that some people are benefiting from. Th thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Damo. I'm going to take more questions. I see many people flapping. So, um, Musa, you're going to go. Um, Musa, screen. Screen. I have a question. Hold on. Okay, yes. Smokey. Smokey, number one. Um, uh, Musa, number two. Flash your mic, please. Um, your papa, three. Wale, four. Lisa B5. Um, just to add to uh, the point I made earlier, Adamo. Um, so if we agree, if we agree that the people who are made, who made the rules are those people who see themselves as conquerors, who have obviously plunged Nigeria into crisis, and they are the ones making the rules, then I'm safe to say that we don't have to follow those rules. Because how could you follow the rules of people who and who don't mean well for the country? How could you face the, uh, uh, follow the rules of selfish individuals that have never made any policy that is good for Nigeria? How can you follow those rules that create a constitutional process that 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 makes makes sure that everybody becomes uh, subjugated and not able to to prosper? So I don't believe that we need to follow rules of those people. The, a time has come where the, these youths or young people of Nigeria or this generation need to take back our country from those 
from those fraud stars. But anyway, let me, let's move on to the next person. Uh, number yes, one, Smokey, please, right. Smokey, please start. Please, let's keep the order and let's try to keep it as civil as possible. Smokey, you start. All right, thank you very Sorry, much. Sorry, can I say something before Smokey goes? Justice, don't Sorry. worry, you'll come after. Just let Smokey start, please. Yes, I'm going back to work. Yeah, please, okay. let, let Smokey start, please. I will come to you, Justice. Smokey, please go ahead. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to call, clarify something, Mr. Damu. The legislature and the executive do not have the powers to create a new constitution. What they have to do is call um, a constitutional conference like Jonathan did in 2014. Now, saying that, um, who, these are my questions to you. Number one, who or what constitutional conference was called before we had the 1999 constitution? Because that constitution starts with we the people. And I don't remember we the people ever coming together to write that constitution. Because if the we if we the people came together, we would actually put in a clause or we wouldn't have that section six where our um, elected officials are not able to hold, we are not able to hold our elected officials accountable. That is number one. Number two, do you think the unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable as certain people from the north seem to think? And then finally, um, a minister. Smoky, like Fanta, I think he's not um, available right now. I don't, I'm not sure he can hear you. Okay, all right. Yeah. He's here, Mr. Adamu. Is here, Mr. Adamu. Are you still on the phone? He's on the phone. Okay. Yes, but please, let's not ask too many questions because of other people. The shielded, uh, the mods can go, but other people, please. Justice. I think he left, though. Oh, he ran. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe somebody called him to say, what are you doing there? <laughs> Good readings, because I think we're just giving him undue audience. No, I love the way rubbish. you guys have treated him. I love the way you guys have treated him. But, but my question but could I want to ask her one question. You know, don't make me ask that question. Come on, you said like. You come on now. You got to go now. So. It ain't baby. No, he will come back. Watch. He no go come. But at least, I mean, people can make their comments based on what you've heard. Yeah, but but, but what, I, what I wanted to ask him is that these people, they agree that the problem, he even agree, admitted from his first statement that amalgamation of 1914 is not supposed to happen. And that is the foundation of our problem. And now we agitators are saying, okay, let's go back to who we are before that 1914. So why are we not giving that chance to do that? I see him in a video where he called the Southern people that the Southern people want to take power from Buhari during the SARS. Uh, these are the things I want to ask him. He said it, that we want to take power. That's why we are protesting pol police brutality from his mouth. He have called my leader Nandekalo a terrorist just for saying, okay, that 1914 you are talking about, we want to go back to who we are to renegotiate it. What is wrong with that? But you have run, you know, these people, they always run. No problem. Uh, my, my thinking <laughs> is with detailed analysis we've <laughs> had from people like Bonkai, like D, is this a good way to end this from somebody who is just talking from down below? Uh, I think it's, it's even insulting to the intelligence of this guy. I don't see the need to call him and start talking all kind of crap. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, not a problem with that. Uh, Lisa, no, but, please so, go please, ahead. Hold on one second, Shida. You see, we need to hear from people like this because it, it further validates what we are talking about. Right? This guy has come here to tell us that they have a complex, a superiority complex. This is someone who is very close to Buhari. You know, he's in videos with him, pictures. He's part of the people, right? You know, and we know who Adabugaba is, okay? So he has come here to tell us. And that is why this generation must not sit, we must not sit idle and behave like lame dogs. We must take back our country and take back our sovereignty. Because I mean, these people... I like their honesty, because do you imagine them coming here to say, 
they some they conquered. They fought a war and conquered. No, no, because that, that is what they talk about themselves. They know Bonka, the guy has told we are in the south need to listen on the undertones, right? He's come here to push a thing and he obviously he didn't work what he was trying to push. Turn around, dance like but whatever. Has, has he left? He, well, he has. So the point is that he has told us specifically that these people create the rules. The people who who think that they've conquered Nigeria because they fought the Biafran War. I apologize for going up like there, there, there was a call that came in and I kept coming in from my dad. Oh, we thought you we thought you left not, because not we were bombarding you. Not not a problem, Mr. Adamo. You're you're welcome back. So before you left, uh Smokey was about to ask you a set of questions. So Smokey, if you keep it if you could keep it quite concise so that we could just go straight to the point. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Adamu, um, you made a very problematic statement when you said um the executive and the legislator could um create a new constitution. That's not a that's a lie. Because um, the only thing they can do is call for the national conference like um, Jonathan did when he was in power. Um, so that being said, um, the 1999 constitution that was created, that was given to jo um, Obasanjo when he came into power, um, what national conference was called? Because I don't, um, no, no, I don't remember. But um, if we, the people, as it says in the constitution, actually wrote that document, I don't think we would have agreed to that section six or which whatever section it is that says that we cannot hold our elect, elected representatives to account. Now, the second question, which is going to be very short, is do you think the um, unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable? And finally, Pantami, who has um, terrorism allegations against him, do you think he is still fit to be a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you very much uh, for 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 the question. Yes, on the Constitution, 1999 Constitution. If you remember, um, during Abacha regime, there was this constitutional conference, and again, the Constitution that we are using in 1999 was a slight addition um, from uh, what we had in 1978, and that 1978 Constitution uh, is actually uh, Jimmy Carter organized and influenced Constitution. You know, uh, so that is why we changed from the normal uh, system of government that we parliamentary system we had with the Britain to to a federal uh, system, or I can say the presidential system that we inherited from the United States. So that's exactly how the constitution was. But again, it was full of decrees, as you rightly said, which required a review, and that review must come by the executive summoning it and then approve the, the approval of the legislation so that we can have a comprehensive constitutional review uh, process or conference where we cannot emerge a new constitution for a new Nigeria. I think it's even due because the constitution we have is 1999. By 2019, we're even supposed to have another one because it's like two decades uh, uh, in operation. So we are supposed to make it as dynamic as possible, but you must have people that have right mindset in the system to be able to understand the need and the urgency and also accept some, some, some structures into the constitution that guarantees actual power to the people where the citizens can be able to control and also get the best service from the people that are in charge. Um, the issue of uh, Pantami is a politically sensitive topic. I think uh, you may want to excuse me uh, on that. I may not want to comment on that. Uh, but the issue of uh, the constitutional conference, I think, is something that has to be done, but it has to be done using the current machinery so that you can be able to achieve Sorry, it. Sorry, you forgot Sorry. about the unity of Nigeria. Is it non negotiable? Okay, uh, Smokey, yeah, let so me quickly uh, come in from there. Yeah, uh, okay. Adamu? Yes. Adamu, okay. Uh, uh, okay, let us forget about the Pantami for now if you choose not to comment. Yes, but I was just going I also to believe... that last question. The unity of Nigeria, let him finish that and then.
And for this sort of revelation, what do you expect to be the reaction from the southerners, from the innocent southerners? Yeah, frankly, let me start with your last uh, part where you say the reaction from the innocent southerners. The reaction is naturally going to be scary because people will now believe that there is a grand conspiracy against everything, their humanity. But what David Wundain published in Complex and Jihad, Complex and Jihad, I read it all through. I even bookmarked it, you know, for some references. Uh, but I can tell you, he was able to bring um, some of the salient points that, uh, of course, is even mostly well known in the contemporary Northern society. But the difference is with his presentation and the actual facts is the fact that the gap between the militarization of that ideology and the other side, the peaceful side of the ideology, he tried to merge them together as a one whole body. Meanwhile, in every religious movement, there are some group that will naturally decide to just be extreme. The same way you have Catholics and IRA, the same way we have different uh, uh, Christian liberation movement. You are, know, you to, no, no. are you trying to? Are you trying to say that Catholic I'm, I'm extremists to learn, are I'm the same thing with point. this uh, jihadist no, movement extremists? Yes, I'm trying to learn at the point. Yes, I'm trying to learn at the point. You see, the ideology as it is, has different directions. And some people may just decide to join the violent path. Meanwhile, you may belong to the same religious class. You believe in negotiation and peaceful resolution, while others would now say they want to bring their eventuality more quickly by going into violence. I personally was part, as a young boy in 1990s, when this kind of movement came in in my own local uh, government, in my, in, my, in my local area, I was one of the first person in my family to be able to be going to the box. That, 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 that some ideologies were being preached that I find more cosmopolitan and more appealing. Reciting good Quran, talking more freely. I like it more than the more traditional way. Adam, let me help you here, yeah, please. I'm, let I'm, me I'm, quit. Please, Can please. I just help you a, a little bit? There is a revelation that the accomplices of this jihadist movement, of this terrorism, dining and whining with the government. There is mm -mm. every evidence and fact that these mm -mm. terrorists are whining with the government. The other chief naval officer also came to Channel's television to review the same thing, right? No. And the hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. You will have your time. The chief naval officer was there in national television to review the same thing. David Hude reviewed the same thing. And over time, we have seen the, there is no, that Boko Haram have continuously been uh, pampered and forgiven. Rehabilitated. And Rehabilitated. So with this, with this, what do you think? Don't you think the, co the oh, country, the people that, running the country, the country have been hijacked too. by people that share the same ideology with Taliban? Yes or no? <laughs> also, no. what I, what I, hold, hold on, Mr. Garba, hold on. Mr. Garba, one minute. Yes. So what I want to add is that the Izala movement is no different from the Quadria movement with which Usman Danfodio came to conquer the, to, to build the Chokoto Caliphate. They have the same laws, the same rules. One of these rules is that uh, a Muslim should not let a non-Muslim rule over him. So I know if the government is pampering them, it's saying that we in the South, like someone said earlier, should remain slaves, and only the people that will be ru ruling the country will be will be Muslims. That's one of the things that the Isala movement. So that's why we're saying that we see a jihad like Usman Danfodio's time unfolding in our time. No, I can tell you categorically. No, in fact, the Kadiria movement of Danfodio is is hundred percent different from the Isala movement. 
The Izala movement originated from Saudi Arabia, while the Kadiria movement originated from Iraq. Senegal. Foreign, now, they are completely different. In fact, they don't even agree. So what I'm trying to say here is this. There are so, you may share the same ideology with someone. Like in so many religious cycles that we have seen in different religious movements, the Jewish religious movement, the Christian religious movement, the Muslim religious movement, and different sects within these religions, there are some within that group that may choose to be violent. So that is why you have Boko Haram clearly, yes, I agree as an offshoot from the same Izala movement. But that doesn't mean that the current Izala leadership, by the way, I don't belong to the sect. I belong to the Jania sect. But I'm trying to tell you that that doesn't mean that the people that are leading the Izala movement might have direct connection with the Boko Haram because they suffer more losses from Boko Haram than any other religious organization in Nigeria. Most of the religious clerics that were killed by Boko Haram were from that same Izala movement. And I'm telling you, if Izala movement have opportunity to reach out to these current, uh, more urbanized and more... Uh, conciliatory, the Izala part, which is the more open side, they may keep them. So the thing is, they Boko Haram themselves were feeling like they were betrayed by the same kind of people. So trying to put them and tally them and align them with Boko Haram is like just putting them at the center of the of the road so that everybody is under the bus, so that everyone can just march over them. So that is why I believe what he has said, yes, he has a lot of points in that article, but trying to have a direct connection between the Izala that agree and accept Nigerian constitution and those group of terrorists that don't believe in constitutionality at all, you know, is actually not justice. He didn't do justice uh, to them. That's what I believe. You know, so, so, so that's my belief. And Kadiria, as you said about Manfodio, has nothing whatsoever. They don't even have any connection in any ideological alignment with the Izala ideology. Izala is imported from Saudi Arabia while the Kadiria came from, from Iran. Yes, but well, what I'm saying is that both of them agree that a non-Muslim should never rule over a Muslim, correct? I 100% both... agree with that because yes. I can tell you, I'm, no, 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 I'm coming, I can tell you this, right? IBB somehow was, 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 was a supporter then when he was in government, I don't know now, of the same Izala movement, but he had so many Christian governors. Now, again, if you check about Abacha also, who was also a supporter of the, of the Kadiria movement, he has several Christian governors. And it, it has nothing to do with that at all. And again, remember, Oluchegum Obasanjo was marketed and supported by diff, by so so much of this movement the current sultan of sokoto his problem with the current government was because he supported president Gullo jonathan's re-election and he is sitting on the throne of amphodio so we need to understand these dynamics all those things were just conspiratorial messages packaged to further confuse us but the real fact on the ground always betrays this there is no way Sultan, now you know that Sultan has no romance with the current government. And the reason why he doesn't is because he said, I want Jonathan back. Mr. Adamo, who, who are the Christian? Mr. Adamo, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Bonka, no. Who, who, Musa, hold on. Musa, just no, don't, hold please don't disrupt the table. We'll get to you. We want to know who the Christians that were working, that were friends with Babangida, that run the inner cabinet with Babangida. Can you tell us the Christians you mentioned? Uh, there are many of them. There are many of them. If you check the list of Babangida's cabinet, you will see a lot of... It, it, was, Babangida, it was Babangida who modernized the Shokoto Caliphate. He was the one that brought in the OIC. So his friends were the blue bloods of the Fulani people. And that was what caused the... Do you remember the Gideon Okaku? The, G G G the Gideon...
where like when Nigerians were having problem with the with the West and therefore they turned to Russia to get military aid in exchange of uh, of Ajao Kuta that is not working because of this kind of arrangement. And now those were the period where Babangida has no option than at that time, I'm not giving excuse for him, but the Americans, the Reagan administration want him to be very exclusively clear on religious grounds, supporting the kind of religious Saudi ideology so that the Russians cannot penetrate into the Muslim land. And remember that time when the penetration of the Muslim land was happening in Afghanistan, in 19, that December 1979, when Afghanistan was first uh, attacked, the whole world of Islam were rallied by the Americans on that, they were rallied by the Americans using Saudi France to be able to get all the Muslims to go against the Russians. So anywhere Russians are trying to have a leg, Muslims were asked to draw a line. And that drawing a line means becoming more stronger, sometimes even violent Muslim, because there is this drive for jihad to go to like, Afghanistan and liberate the Muslim land all over the world. That was why Babangida had to play by the rules, by bringing something like IOC, all these pro-Islamic movement and co and co to be able to support winning the Cold War. And after that Cold War, that thing consumed him. He left the seat. So, but again, when you look at this kind of dynamics and then bring them into local politics, you will see very, very clearly that so many things are actually happening behind the scene or outside our shows that is controlling what is happening from within. These guys are acting at the tune of the dancing of their masters. So that's why you have very turbulent a religious crisis of, 19, uh, of, of 1980s. And when we come into 1990s, there was no need for Cold War. All these guys moved out, and we begin to have different clinics in different places, in, in Serbia, in Govania, in, 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 in Rwanda. Even in Nigeria, we now began to have this democratic activism. And then the Muslims area between the Muslims and the Christians, the division became so sharp because of those crises, especially the Gulf War that came in the first time. And so many confusions. So we need to understand at that moment, there were so many critical decisions that are happening that is sometimes even beyond our shores. So, but that does not mean that there is any ideology that I know of in Islam as a Muslim, a son of Islamic scholar, and a grandson of an Islamic scholar. I never believe that there is any rule that says that a Christian must not rule over Muslims. Of course, there are some sects within this religious movement that believe such, but those sects are negligible, that they are just confined to their own locality, where in that locality they don't even understand what is called any other religion other than that thing that they practice. So we need to understand this. Else, why would we support Jonathan? Why would we support Obas and Joe? Why? You know, so we need to really, really understand these things very clearly so that we don't overheat the policy you okay. know, based on the current happening. M Mr. Adamo, um, we're going to proceed. I see you, Musa, your papa, Wale, Lesabi. But I just want to chip in a quick question. If you have any comments on the recent romance between the Nigerian government and the Turkish president what are your thoughts on this you know there have been allegations of turkey sponsoring terrorist movements internationally in other parts of africa and in the levant region and then all of a sudden now we have uh, erdogan coming to visit buhari so lots of tongues have been wagging lots of questions have been asked why is turkey all of a sudden becoming interested in the affairs of nigeria especially at this time. Go ahead. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I think the first statement were made open. Turkey and Nigeria have a very strong um, relationship. In fact, I think one of the largest hospitals that we have, I think, in Abuja, in Zania Hospital, is actually a Turkish hospital. We have different Turkish schools. We even have Turkish university, I guess, here in Nigeria. So uh, I don't, uh, I don't, they may have their own political things, but I personally don't believe that uh, Turkey have anything to do with our local, local um, religious program. In fact, if there's anything in Nigeria, predominantly the North, uh, uh, the, the, the Northern religious establishment, everything goes to Saudi Arabia. And Saudi is 100% US compliant. So that is why you see everything uh, from the northern establishment either ends up in Saudi Arabia or the UK. Why? Because this is actually the alignment. So if Turkey is trying to explore its own opportunity, 
um, but that might not because there are so many imports. I think about six billion dollars they sell trade volume between Nigeria and Turkey. So maybe that's the main reason why he's here. Or maybe he also tried to sell some things that we don't know. But to the base of my knowledge, I don't really believe that Turkey have any hand in any. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to exonerate them, but I don't know whether there is anything that has to do with their own actions in the terrorism that is happening in Nigeria. I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much, yeah. um, Mr. Adamu. Uh, please, I will give you, I will draw you back to some facts again and allow you to tell us. So, one minute is back. After his bar, we will open it for questions for other people. Just hold on. His bar is the last mod. They'll be asking him, and then we'll open the floor. Now, let us ask, ask questions now. What yeah, hold, hold, hold on. Hold on. Sorry, your papa, please. Uh, his bar, please go ahead. Uh, Quincy bar mention one, two, three. Your papa, please just be patient. We'll come to you. Everyone will have okay, their chance, Adamu, please. Adamu, you in your in your response, uh, you try to portray Turkey as just doing business with Nigeria, and I I I bet to differ. Turkey is not just doing business in Nigeria. Turkey is sponsoring terrorism in uh, alliance with Buhari, your president in Nigeria. And I will give you the fact now and allow you to debunk it, okay? Just like you said that, okay, because they has, have hospital, uh, hospital in Nigeria, that they are just doing business. No, I will play you this video and allow you, and just again, like David Hunderin's uh, article, where he in it's, he, he said uh, the the conflicts to to you now. If we don't know about the article, you might also come and say, "Oh, it's just a conflict." Now David was uh, uh, able to unravel that under these conflicts is sponsorship of terrorism that have been going on for years. And again, these same people doing these things finally found themselves in Asso Rock, taking pictures, doing everything. I know if it is from southern part, you will not sound like this. But again, let me play this and let me uh, and allow you to debunk it. The, the Turkish president was here the other time, not uh, about a week plus ago. Now, listen to this news. The seconds, let me connect this. Yeah, just make it a bit louder, please, his bar. Of course, I will. Okay. Really a terrorist state with television news program says that Turkey is clearly a terrorist state with a broad reach. It reports that Turkey is supplying weapons to the terrorist group Boko Haram in Nigeria. 10 TV host Nashat al-Dalhi reported on a leak confirming an intercepted phone call from a few years back confirming the action. He reported in part, today's leak confirms without a doubt that Erdogan, his state, his government, and his party are transferring weapons from Turkey to, this is a shock, to where you may ask to Nigeria and to whom? to the Boko Haram organization. Well, Raymond Ibrahim, a journalism fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center and an expert on the Middle East and Islam, joins us now with more on this. Welcome, Raymond. Hello, Heather. Are you surprised by this report? What's your take on it? No, I'm not surprised. And um, my take on it is that this, the actual tape that was made that you referenced and you quoted was made apparently um, in 2014 or 15. And um, it was reported widely in certain areas in the U.S. and in the West, not so much, and not much came out of it. And the reason, I think, is because Erdogan wasn't so, um, didn't have his fingers so much in um, Islamist politics outside of his own nation. But now that we've seen, you know, um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the ISIS Islamic State Caliph, who was killed recently, and he was found just three miles from the Turkish border, which is, in fact, one of the last, or if not the last bastion of jihadi so-called freedom fighters of attacking the Syrian government, um, it, it's brought it up again, the fact that he's, everyone is saying, well, look, he's supporting ISIS. So now we're remembering, and that's that was, I think, the point of the Egyptian show, where 
we're bringing back to see that there's some continuity here. It's not just right next door to Syria, uh, to Turkey, meaning Syria. He's got he's involved with some of the absolute worst Islamic terror groups. Remember Boko Haram, which its name loosely means um, Western education is forbidden. Haram um, is was basically doing what ISIS was do is is notorious for years before ISIS. So the whole you know head chopping, crucifying, massacres, enslaving women and children, burning people alive. Boko Haram was doing that. And one of the things that international observers have been noticing, especially increasingly, is that their armaments, their weapons, are very sophisticated. Okay, uh, Mr. Adamu, this is a news directly involving the Turkish government supplying arms with Boko Haram. And again, we saw this uh, president romancing with your president few weeks ago. Now, the, another article from David Hundei unveiling the, the, the conflicts of jihad and the sponsors of terrorism. Again, we saw these same people romancing and taking pictures with your president in Asorok. The case of Pantami and his terrorist acts went viral the other time. Again, we saw Pantami romancing, dining, and whining with your president. Now, with all this evidence and facts, we are left with no other option to believe strongly that there is a conspiration, conspirator, Sean, with this government working directly with terrorists, sponsoring terrorists, and with their continual forgiving of um, the, the, the Boko Haram, uh, 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 pampering them and rehabilitating them. With all this thing, can you debunk any of it? Um, thank you, Kizba. And permit me to explain my understanding on this. Turkey used to be an empire on, before 1924. It used to be one of the global powers in the Central Asia and the Middle East, in fact, controlling those areas. And, and so many parts of Africa, the trans-Saharan trade between Nigeria and Tripoli that goes onto the Mediterranean actually had a lot of linkage with Turkey, and there is a cross fertilization of civilization over more than 600 between so many of the Sahara Desert countries, including Nigeria. Now, with the coming of Trump in 2016, there was a global gap in the control of the United States affairs of the world. The U.S. was retreating. In fact, retreated faster than expected. U.S. actually started retreating since after the Cold War because they don't understand their purpose in the global scheme of things, according to all the intelligence here. And, you know, so uh, that withdrawal during Trump period gave vacuum for international actors to keep pushing further into their already conquered territories by the U.S., most notably Russia, we saw their actions in the Middle East, in Ukraine, and in other places in the world. And then also we now saw Turkey also trying to push in, especially their also action within their region. And of course, in Yemen and Egypt and Libya, and of course, so many other places in the world where they try to get control. There is no country on earth that does not take advantage of a vacuum of an opportunity. The fact that the global leadership was withdrawing, perhaps maybe they're exploring this opportunity. And you and I know that the Boko Haram and all the criminal elements in Nigeria all over the country, not east, west, or south, don't manufacture the weapons they use to fight war. They buy it somewhere. And I can tell you again that since we buy it, it might not necessarily be from one source. It may be from most, many yes, other Mr. sources. Yes, Mr. Adamu, and, and the sponsors coming, coming, me, of this me, Boko Haram no, 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 no. Let me, let me have land. been let me, let me just continuously land. dining and whining no, with no, your no, president. No, 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 no,
So, and woe, in as much as is blood let into us in Nigeria because it's happening within our borders, is business to others. We have to be realistic and understand these things. And naturally, each country will want to take advantage. The same way today, we have troubles in, in Ethiopia where there is condemnation of Russia sponsoring um, the Ethiopians against the Tigray region. The same way we have crisis today in Sudan that is still linking Russia with so the So what you are saying military. is that no, those people that, that have that been uncovered to say the sponsoring Boko Haram, what I'm, what I'm dining and whining Russia, with your president, no, 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 what I'm are trying perhaps to say, what I'm, he, he, him finish. What, I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is that all those things are happening, but that does not obliterate the fact that Erdogan is the president of his country, and Nigeria's president also is the president of his country. And there is a diplomatic Mr. relationship. Mr. Adam, I'm will you, be, I'm, will, I'm will you agree with me that no, the no, South no, no, no. are you, only you reacting to, because you they to, are seeing that to, this government to, is whining and dining with terrorists no, with no, the no, facts no, available? No, 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 no. No, you see, this global, this, this affair, you have the hawkish and the dovish in the entire global affair. That's why even in your country, if you are in the U.S., if you are in the U.S., you know, the U.S., System is designed around the red and the blue, around what Mr. And Adamu, what now, do you say by Boko Haram being, uh, being forgiven and being, uh, you know, pampered and being shared in Domi and being brought he's back? Let him finish that. I'm coming no, now. I'm allow coming. He's That's why you should have let, let him finish the first question. If you allow me, Mr. Adamu, this is he's this bad. Let him finish the first Stop. question. We have, him, I we understand. Have, Don't worry. I'll just allow me, please. Yes. Yeah. We so, Mr. Adamu, mm. we have seen the sponsors of Boko Haram being uncovered, I am whining not, and I'm dining not, with I'm the president. Hold on, there because... you will have your time. Hold on. We have seen the sponsors of Boko Haram whining, being uncovered, whining and dining with the president. We have been, seen the suppliers of arms to Boko Haram uh, whining and dining with the president. We have also seen people that have been indicted one way or the other to ter terrorism, having one of the highest appointments with the president. We have also seen how many of the Boko Harams that have been forgiven, some of them being brought back to the system. With all this, with all this, will you believe that this government is directly involved with sponsorship of terrorism or have something to do with terrorism. Or sympathy. Or sympathetic to terrorism. I don't think sincerely that there is even a government that have done so much in dealing, tackling, and destroying the terrorists and the terror regime. But we the see the sponsors in Nigeria whining and than this government. Oh, hold on, hold on, Hizba. Let's let's hear him. No, no. Yes, you want to you want to force the decision. I, I I don't think so. You see, all those things are just something that we just alert in our mind, and maybe because we have a mindset to believe that way, we see it that way. But it's never, never, ever that way. Supply of weapons from one country or the other does not validate the fact that you are a sponsor because you are selling, and so many countries are supplying the same weapons to these same people. And in the case of war. There is always at the end of it some people that will surrender. Because someone has surrendered from a war, is a war. And in every war, there must be collateral damage. And when somebody surrendered and came out and said, Look, I am no longer in this and I want to be able to be part of the system, I don't think it is altogether. Do you a bad believe that Gumi should, be, uh, should have been arrested? No, at least why it's would you? No Gumi, what Gumi but is, what about the soldiers they killed? What, are, what about the people they terrorized? Are they going to get away with that? You see, we, are, we have a situation of war. Even in the US, we have the Confederation War. You know, we have a situation of war where killings will happen. There must be damages. And after these damages, when there is conciliation, there must be consideration. Even in Nigeria, there were this kind of... Oh, okay, the should be in Paris, right? Just, just give us time. Let's... Who's these fighting? guys came out, they accepted... Okay, why, the do you, why is and they Gumi wanted to be reintegrated walking in the freely and then Nam Dekanu is arrested? What is the difference between no, the two? I, I think you should also ask him, what war? 
Who is fighting war with who? Who is fighting war? Who are the parties that are fighting the war? There was a war between Nigeria and a criminal gang called Boko Haram. And in that war, Nigeria was consistently winning to the point where so many of their soldiers are deserting and they are coming back. So now, because why they are they winning a war back, that their sponsors are taking pictures with your president, but you say they are fighting them? No, they are Gumi is going into their forest and coming no out, and nobody have arrested of Boko them. Haram that is taking picture with the president that is that 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 any law in the world confirms. Mr. Damu, will I be right if I say that you are taking us for fools? I just give you facts. Okay, Isba, 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 hold on, Isba. It's time to, let's move to the crowd. We'll come back to Isba. All right, all right, let me, let me pick it up from there. Well, generally, I think what's been, I mean, the conversation is centered around the Fulani conflict. So it's obvious at this point that the Fulani conflict has become Nigeria's gravest security challenge as it has now claimed far more lives than the Boko Haram insurgency of the early noughties. It has displaced hundreds of thousands and sharpened ethnic, regional, and religious lines. It has even threatened to become deadlier and it currently undermines national and regional stability. So at this point, I'm going to take questions. Musa, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, um, Shude. Thank you, Adam Garba. And I'll, my question is actually not a question. I would just want to hear your views around in, like you've been sharing your views on issues, and we appreciate that, even though we, we know the reality on ground. But still yet, because you are also close to the government, I would like you to speak more specifically on uh, the president's um, successful pronouncement regarding uh, reclaiming, actually authorizing the um, attorney general of the Federation, Malami, to not only uh, set up a committee to look at how to reclaim grazing routes across uh, Nigeria, Considering this, the fact that it is actually this um, grazing route that is one of the issues um, causing killings in Nigeria, not in not even in Nigeria, in southern Nigeria, you know, putting into context the Igongon issue that happened not only once, not only twice. Uh, so I want to hear your view surrounding that scenario where we have um, killings happening based on headers, you know, leaving uh, the, the northern part of the country and coming to the south and killings happening not once, not twice, when we still have the... Yeah, population. okay, I, I think you got the question. Let's, let's have yeah. an answer so we can roll down fast, yeah. Let me, yes, um, thank, Let me you, thank you very much for this question. I think my points are very clear regarding that I do not support in the 21st century anything called ground zero. This was ill-conceived policy. We made pronouncement about it. We did press conference about it. We made publication, granted different interview, that this is actually wrong. You have to ranch these animals to create economic value from them. The but Mr. You Tamu, that's a lie. Down, you, you tweeted about cattle currency. You supported yes. dri um, people driving their cars and tweeted about cattle currency a few, a no, few years no, back. No, 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 no. You see, the cattle currency was a process of trying to transform cows into money-making engine. The counter currency was just a program that I was proposing then, trying to substitute us, trying to jump into financializing, financialized market, because Nigerian economy is over-financialized. Everything is just around financial, making money, buy money, sell money, make money, make profit of money. Nothing is coming to the real economy. That's why I was now advocating, why can't we carry this money and use it to set up branches? From those branches, you, shed, you set up a butcher houses where you can extract every part of this cattle and make money from them. That's the whole thing around counter currency. Oh, but don't you think manufacturing is better? Without... Well, um, okay, uh, Mr. Adamo, please take your time and uh, finish up with your response. Yes, so, so actually... I don't support grazing route. I believe it's ill-conceived in the 21st century. We have to create ranching policies. Our ranches are actually businesses. 
and those people that are supposed to ranch this cattle must buy those lands before they can be able to ranch them. Government can also subsidize that. So, Mr. Adamo, outside, outside, outside this clubhouse, have you openly spoken about it anywhere that we can read? No. This comment you just made. No, if you can Google this, if you can go to my Twitter feed, if you can Google my talk about ranching, you will see very clearly I've been very consistent about this since 2017. You have to ranch. Any situation where you say you want to graze cows in the 21st century, you are naturally creating cows. It can't work. And I made it very clear, it's all over papers. You can check this. All right, um, let's move to the next person. Your papa, sorry, you've had to wait for a bit. Uh, thank you very much, your papa. Please go ahead with your comments or questions. Your papa, please make it snappy because of others. Why should I, okay. why should I make it snappy? Why well, are you all too cold the time? Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Adamugaba, I'm one of those people that doesn't like you to speak. But because you are friendly today, we have to talk about some of the disagreement I used to have with you on Twitter. So, um, in Nigeria, somebody asked a question if you believe Nigeria is negotiable. You said it was Nigeria negotiated. Yes, Nigeria is a negotiated country. And nobody under no circumstance should come in, in 1999 constitution and say our unity is no longer negotiable. Even after the 1958 in Lancaster South negotiation, we still renegotiated in uh, 1962, where we now had uh, another region called the Midwest region that was covered from the old Western region and the Eastern region. So for anyone to now come in a fraudulent 1999 constitution to now say, oh, this unity is no longer negotiable, makes the constitution to be a fraud. Because the constitution, as the person said, the, that constitution is not, it's not uh, a people's oriented constitution. That's just my first comment. So secondly, you, you were talking about the, the, the ranching. So the, when the, the, the Southern state governor, especially my state governor in those states, talk about no open grazing. Malami made a statement that if the Igbos can have a free way to do their business in the north, why not the Fulaniest men? Now, the point that uh, my governor made was not saying that the Ondo state, the Katurera should not do their business, but they should buy land and do ranching and do their business peacefully because the Igbos in the north, they are not being given free land. Neither is the government in the north sponsoring their business. Many of them buy their houses, buy, buy their shop or even rent their shop. And they are also adding economic value to whichever state they, are, they live. Now for anyone to now compare that to what is happening in, in uh, where you enter my farm, destroy my farm, and when my wife or my children complain, you kill them on the farm. So I don't know how that you compare that to it. And you supported that notion then. Then don't answers. You also make an assertion. You also you also make an assertion that uh, the the people were trying to remove your president, Buhari, the head of his salah set, or the grand patron of his salah set that is trying to remove him. How can the people be fighting for their rights and it's now being colored in a way that, oh, so is it that, are you saying that Nigerians cannot complain of the way they are being led by anybody, of the way they are, because if you're saying we truly we are practicing democracy, why should Nigerians who are not, who are not uh, in, uh, who, are, who go, uh, the government, uh, policy does not favor them, speak up. And all you you all could say from the north is that it's an attempt, even in most of your mocks, that that was an attempt to remove your president because he's a Muslim. And when I just flashed back, I was, I was like, 
Is it that the Buhari was the first president of Nigeria since 1990 that was a Muslim? Or is Buhari the first president that is a full animal since 1999? Because we had a Yahadwa. And this is the difference between somebody who is a, who is a stark illiterate and somebody that went to school. We had a Yahadwa who, 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 who governed Nigeria. Nigeria never complained about Fulani Esmeral or even about Fulani anywhere. But you, you all could not see that as an example of the type of leadership that the, the South will accept. But you, you all paint that, painted that uh, uh, agitation as a way to remove Buhari. That, that being said, I also have a question concerning the, the somebody has asked this question before, but the, the Boko Haram and Isala and everything, the David Adipu and everything. Now, do you believe that if it was written that, oh, this social person, this social person, this social group are sponsoring Biafra or they are sponsoring Yoruba agitation. Do you think that the president of Nigeria wouldn't have uh, gone to arrest those people to question them? Why are the Salas terrorists? I call them terrorists. So permit me, I don't, they are, they are terrorists. The Salas terrorists are not being uh, looked into because they are actually disrupting, uh, disrupting the, the the economy of Nigeria, which I don't know whatever they are fighting for, because I know what many people believe in Nigeria is that whenever okay. you are looking yeah, for papa, an interest, round up, please. Yeah. One minute. Whenever you are looking for an interest, you need to arm, you need to arm some youth so that you, they go and be fighting for your interest. So why is it that the Isala terrorists and those people that have been fingered by UAE, that as the as the sponsors of terrorists, are not being brought to book? But your your AAGF went ahead to say Sunday Igbo is part of those uh, sub, uh, sponsoring terrorists in Nigeria. Please, can yes. I just clarify uh, how? Thank you. Thank you very much, your papa. Uh, Mr. Adamo, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. I think on the first one, the Nigerian issue is non negotiable. Maybe you misunderstood what I said earlier. I don't agree with that assertion. I believe if we want Nigeria to remain together, we must be able to resell Nigeria's unity and its value to Nigerians. So the issue of Nigeria non-negotiable, I don't agree with it. On the issue that you mentioned again on, on ranching, you say I supported Buhari. No, I didn't support this government. I had my own views were very clear that we have to do ranching. And that view has been available since 2017. I remain consistent with it throughout, and I'm still standing on the fact that in 21st century, you don't allow cattle to graze around, you must ranch them. So that one, I think we're also in agreement. On the answers issue, I cannot speak for the people that stood in the mocks to preach. I spoke on my own understanding of international politics, and also as a tech person who had access to so many things in the darkness. You will see very clearly as at that moment that there is a direct involvement direct involvement of foreign interests about the situation in Nigeria. It wasn't the people on the street that I am against. I was going against foreign interference into the answers process. What is and your proof? Is even when I went to court, even when I went to court, I directly challenged Twitter CEO for directly involving into it. I didn't challenge any person within the answers. So my target as a then is to see that we do not allow any foreign infiltration. And immediately it was discovered that there is an undercover action. People, criminals, hoodlums, have taken advantage of this otherwise very peaceful and purposeful movement and transform it into a violent one. I have to speak to the people that can hear me to not to participate because it's going to cause more uprising and crisis that may bring down the government. We have references on the same thing in Africa, in Libya, in, in Egypt, in Tunisia. We have it, and it all started this way. So we are not, that, that is why I came out and spoke about it. I wasn't against answers. I was even part of answers from 2017, but I am against any foreign interference in our own local politics. 
I am not sure there was any foreign interference, but anyway, can I, can we'll uh, move on. Question, yeah, so, I, I just want to move on to. No, no. Sorry, think I actually except if you want to chip no, in. Related to the answers, yes. Okay, go to... go ahead, please. But 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 before that, to... I just want to think. Let me just you? state that uh, Wale, Lisa B, and the rest of you, Bam Tefa, I see you guys. Okay, so let's just take this in order. Think, okay, please just speak related that. to the answers. By that token, can we as can we say specifically and assume? Now, the Occupy Nigeria protest, which uh, Buhari participated in, uh, and it was active on Twitter as well, was an attempt to bring down the government of the day at the time. By this, your assertion? Yes, um, the Occupy Nigeria movement, I wasn't part of it. I didn't support it. I was supporting Jonathan then. But I can tell you very clearly that the Occupy Nigeria movement was simply precipitated by the increase in price of oil. It was the labor movement. And labor has been striking in Nigeria for a very long time. They've been protesting for a very long time. So it was a purely labor movement. They were not saying, although there were so many calls that Jonathan should resign, but there was no any attempt to go to attack uh, vital areas like the police station, uh, prison, and uh, attacking businesses and uh, trying to uh, hold the uh, CBN to ransom, going to judiciary and start visiting things. Those things did not take effect that moment. It was a coordinated movement, and therefore it cannot rightfully be termed as an attempt to bring down the government. But this one, you and I know the outcome of NSAS. So uh, the, the and NSAS is not the NSAS. NSAS. It was the NSAS protest has was... not had nothing to do with. Okay, it. Let, let's move on. Please, let's, let's move bunker, on. Bunker, bunker. Just, yeah. were, just allow. They had nothing to. Those, those things were orchestrated by certain elements who had armed militia mm -hmm. and also that, that, people who were also in government, in Buhari's government. They were the ones no. going around destroying police stations no, 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 and no, destroying no, no. them. It was act, the government was actively involved. We saw, want... we saw DSS officers in Abuja driving around and moving people around to destroy things and to attack protesters. This was orchestrated by the government. It had nothing to do with the NSAS protesters. I, but personally, I don't know this one. All I know is that there are criminal elements that decided to take this responsibility and then use you it saw those to videos their online. Crime. Yeah. Mr. Adamo, please uh, finish up. Yeah, so I think I think we are in agreement. I think uh, what he said is that he believed that there are some government officials. I said I don't believe, so I believe that there are criminals that decided the videos to are take advantage of, of the carrying people around. Please stop using our plane to play football. Okay, right. let's, let's... <laughs> let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, Lisa B, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much, Lisa B. No, Allah, you be my man. So. Oh, Mr. Ademo, my question is of two parts. Do you believe that Nigerian, the constitution of Nigeria as of today is a fraud by saying we the people solemnly accept to be governed under that constitution? So that makes it a fraud. Should it be taken off all the table or be amended? So my, that question is of two. Do you believe it's a fraud? And should it be taken off all the table, not be amended? Why the second one is, do you believe, um, or do you, how will I actually put it? Do you have this belief that all ethnic nationalities that make up Nigeria has to come to a round table to renegotiate what makes them Nigeria? What makes them, what makes them a Nigeria? So that's, those are my questions. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you very much. I believe in the ethnic nationalities sitting down to renegotiate. And there are some countries that have done that and they have recorded success. We have it in Philippines. We have it even in Russia. In fact, Russian Federation, to the best of my knowledge, have about 22 countries in that large continent, sub or maybe let's say mini continent. They have about 22 countries because if places like Tatarstan have a president and a parliament, Moscow approved president. But they are all belonging to the Russian market, the Russian Federation. So it's okay. Many countries have this configuration and it works for them. It can happen. But the issue of trying to create this order before trying to set up order in the already crisis-ridden country cannot work. 
So therefore, we have to leverage on the existing order that we have, the current constitution, the current structures, get in there with the right mindset, and then be able to advance the, the cause that we believe is the best for the country. So removing the constitution and calling it fraud cannot work. This is something we have been using for since the independence. So, and then we now just keep editing and editing, and this is where we are now. It doesn't make sense for us to say we are going to just throw it all out the window and then sit down all over again to begin to talk. This it might be idealistic, but in practical sense, it's not going to work. So the best solution is get into the system first with the current structures, then redefine it to suit the best way forward for the country. Thank you. Uh, Mr. 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 Hold on. I, Mr. Mr. Adamu, do you have Bonka, political you're aspirations? Not, you're not allowing anybody else to talk, Bonka. You're not it's just a quick question. Else. It's just a quick question. Do you have political aspirations? You sound like it. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, thank you, Bonka. Uh, let's proceed with a few questions from some of the members of the audience. So, oh, Fela, I got a one from my bank channel. Can I yes, well, to... well, let, let me just say this. Fela in the audience, Fela mm -hmm. Sophist, is asking okay. that since you say that you were not against NSARS, why did you sue 50 NSARS coordinators to court? Why did you sue 50 NSARS coordinators to court since you said you are not against NSARS? Um, thank you very much. I am not the one that sued 50 NSAS coordinators to court. I sued Jack Dorsey, Twitter International, Federal Government of Nigeria, Ministry of Justice, the DSS, the police, and all the organs that are responsible for security of the country. Those are the people I sued. I did not sue any Nigerian at all, other than the Nigerian government and Twitter International with Jack Dorsey. Mr. Damo, what happened during the case? What happened during the case? Did you appear? Did you show up at the court? At the time, the court was, uh, the, the, the case was called or upon. I wasn't uh, in Abuja, so my lawyer was unable to go. So, uh, but uh, that's why we didn't show up in the first hearing. So there, there was a fix for the second hearing, I think, on 22nd of April. But we were unable to go because by then I had withdraw the case from the court. I, I asked my lawyers to write and withdraw the case simply because I think the objective must have been achieved. Uh, it's not about fighting to the end than this. It's about stopping the crisis that is about to consume our country, which worked because immediately we sued Jack Dorsey. He has never tweeted about donation again for the movement to continue. He stayed out. He didn't even tweet about answers again till after three days perhaps maybe after consulting his lawyers. And what I did was to make sure that they don't take advantage of this thing for their own ad uh, and, and advance because of, of, of their surveillance capitalism with their platform. I'm a platform technology person, and sometimes I understand how these things relate to local politics in countries. And if you mistakenly allow them to continue to leverage on this technology asset that gives them profit at the expense of your blood, you are not profitable to the citizenry. And I know that the best way to handle this kind of people is not to go to protest or fight them, is to go through the courts. Because if you continue to do anything and the courts have a registry of what has been reported about that, that team might be able to hang on his neck for as long as he oh, remains. Mr. Mr. Adamo, Mr. Company. And that's why Mr. I Adamo, that. I'm sorry. I, I think the point is that on the day of the court hearing, you did not show up. So why did you not show up? Twice, twice, twice. No, the first one, I wasn't in Abuja. I asked my lawyers to go, and the lawyer did not go on time. By the time the lawyer arrived the court premises, they had already passed our case. The second one, before that second adjournment, we have already withdrew the case from the court. Then was it after that that you launched your Crow Hub or before that? No, Crow project has started since 2016. The first published Crow application was done in July 2020. So that by that moment, we don't even know something about NSAT. In fact, I was promoting it prior to this insight. It's just unfortunate that at the point when I was still running the promotion on Crow, those series of events came and people began to connect them together, but they are completely not connected. Okay, can, All right. can we then say that? I have... 
uh, okay, sorry, let, let's just, because there's lots of people asking questions. I have a question from Austin Yu, and he says that you made inciting statements against Twitter, and you pushed that it should be banned, but unfortunately, you still use Twitter. Why is this the case? And also, you have been accused of applauding Gumi, visiting terrorists, mm -hmm. and relaunching them into the Nigerian army. So what, what comments do you have to make about these um, damning comments? Yes, I was not asking that Twitter completely should be banned from Nigeria. I was asking Twitter to be banned until they are willing to give $1, $1 billion for Nigeria so that we can settle the victims of NSAS. To the best of my knowledge, I'm negotiating for more money for Nigeria. You know, so if you look at the case, it's very clear. Again, I will have to still use Twitter if it comes back today because I love the platform. And Twitter is not our competition. You know, Twitter is our complementer. I love the platform. I will still continue to use it. But I want them to set up office in Nigeria, according to my case, hire Nigerian labor, pay Nigerian tax, and bring $1 billion and compensate the families that have suffered the mm -hmm. NSAS problem. That's what I said. And again, on the second question um, about applauding Gumi, absolutely... And, and asking and also supporting the fact that these terrorists, after being uh, disengaged from their activities, are being brought into the Nigerian army. Uh, I'm not sure about them being, being brought to the Nigerian army, but I supported Gumi's initial um, attempt to discuss with the bandits before it gets escalated. We had that opportunity in Borno, where the so-called leaders of Boko Haram, especially Mohammed Yusuf, was openly pushing for negotiation with the state authorities and he was pushed away. And of course, him who is seeking for a softer landing eventually got killed by the same authority. The same police brutality took him off. Then we now have the violent guys, the vile blood-sucking followers of his decided to start to come against the country and kill 30,000 people. So what I was doing in the case of Gumi, since we have some of their leaders opening up and trying to get mainstream into the system, he should be encouraged so that the crisis should not escalate to the point where we are now. But again, because of the interpretation of the whole issue, uh, everybody just got confused and nobody really gave him the support and they were neglected. Now we are seeing a full-scale insurgency in the northwestern Nigeria. All right, you but so Mr. Adamo, is, is, the, is the detention of, of Mazi and Namdi Kano, is it justified? Do you believe that is truly justified? I want you to say it out here. In public, uh, the detention of Mazi Inamdikanu. Inamdikanu is a Nigerian and he is angry because of the injustices that he sees in his environment. And what happened to the justice, the injustices he experienced in his environment, if we can see it much wider, is the injustices that affect the entire country. The same problem that the Southeast is complaining or the IPOB is complaining is the same problem that is happening across the country, including the North. So, but violently sitting outside the country and asking people to be violent about it is actually what is a wrong approach. And with that, he is supposed to come into Nigeria and Mr. answer for Mr. Adamo, I think you should speak on the issues of him being kidnapped but he was, by the he, he was in the country. He was in the country when Operation Python came to attack him, and he had to run for his life. Yes. So it wasn't like... Sunday Go, Sunday Go wasn't violent. The government still you went see, after him also. You see, that, that still comes to the fact that, in the initial sense, these people were complaining against injustice. Instead of the system to listen to them properly, the system began to castigate them. And when the system castigate them, they went back and become violent. And the system now have to pay a huge price to be able to contain them. The same way I was talking about supporting Gumi. That's exactly the same way Namdi Kanu was in Nigeria. He was organizing everything he was doing in Nigeria. Instead of the system to see that they meant to bring him to the table and understand what is inside the and an attempt to address these things, the system decided to send military deployment. And that was very wrong. He left the country. But again, there was this violent call from him. These people should do this. These people should kill. These people should do this. So I believe as a Nigerian, 
he's supposed to give an answer for why he did what he did. Why Mr. He did Adamo, he was, he was kidnapped. He was kidnapped by the Nigerian land. government. Yes, even if he was kidnapped. To the no, but he was kidnapped, Nigeria. but that's an international crime. I think you yes, should speak no, 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 on that. No, it, was, it was according to what was reported. It was international police that actually issued the warrant and then brought him in. But, but the then, government gives orders to the Interpol to make Interpol such arrests. So, so that means, that that means, no, 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 there was no, we have not international warrant. That that there was no, that, that means it's not technically, it's not technically a crime. But the issue is that now he is in his country, in his own home country. Adam, Adam, and I one believe so. So, he, so no, hold on, Shida, Shida, now. Shida, one it's second, one second. Now. It's now, it's one now second, legal. hold on, hold on, hold on, mm. Smokey. So, so the, the United Nations has asked the Nigerian government to provide the details of his kidnap or the uh, or the uh, how he got to Nigeria. So, if he says Interpol. How come they've not been able to provide information? Is the Interpol nameless? How have they provided also... the red notice for it? Yeah, yes, and also uh, so they... with this, with this, with this, I think both I and you are waiting for the response from Nigerian authorities. So wait, Adamu, do you believe in freedom of speech? Just from what you're saying, because you're you're uh, talking both sides of the mouth right now. One hundred percent, I believe in freedom. Okay, of let me ask you one question. So, so on one hand, you say Gumi uh is right to you know talk with the terrorists and all that um and and also they're being they're being brought in they're being pardoned um and these are people who are killing on the other hand you just said that nandi kano should be called in to answer for his uh, crime which was to uh, according to you to call for violence so my question is which is worse the person who speaks if, if in quotes to your what you said, it, it speaks violence, allegedly, I would say, uh, speaks violence, and the person who actually goes out to kill, which one is the one that goes out to kill does not speak about it. They doesn't they don't announce uh, on on uh, on YouTube or Facebook or whatever that they're coming to kill, right? So they just go and carry out the action of killing. And this is thousands of people being killed. And then on the other hand, you got one man who says, according to you, uh, 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 calls for violence. So which one is worse, the one that speaks about violence or the ones that actually do the killing? And then they are pardoning the those that, doing the killing. No, no, pardoning those, those ones, let him answer the question, that, which is first. Ones, those ones doing the killing are being killed too. That's why I keep talking about full-scale insurgency happening in the Northwest. They are being killed too. And no, the no, no, that's not the question. Good. Which one? I'm, I'm sorry. Which which is worse? And they are the being pardoned. Who calls... So that's yeah, hold on one second. No, 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 no. The, the, the one, let's let's, the one, let's address the, the question. I'm sorry. Let's address one after one question after the other. The person who calls who in quote calls for violence and speaks, and but doesn't do the killing, and another person who actually kills in mass do does like a lot of killing which is worse now these are two things naturally you don't hold people accountable for their intentions or their speeches you hold them mostly accountable to their actions good that's what the law says <laughs> so that means the person <laughs> doing the killing the person doing the killing is always worse than the person that is doing the talking. But, but, but they are being but killed. I'm coming. But, but in an organized way it? where you have a body that has leadership and that leadership is charged with commandeering authority, sometimes even to instruct killing, then that person also is responsible for the team he is leading. It's as simple as that. It's like saying that I am going to war and I am the military commander. And then I am, of course, naturally. So, Mr. Adamu, even if it is in self defense, this is. Frontline soldiers to do the killing while you stay at the back line. If there is any problem, you will be the one to be held accountable for the success of Helloa of the instructions you have given to your military frontline. So, that's exactly the kind of scenario that is happening here. So, are you saying self defense? The killing, the killing was in self defense. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Mr. Adamu, do we, um, whatever Namdi Kano was talking about is about self defense of his people. So, are you saying self defense is a crime? Self defense 
is not a crime, but self uh, action is right. Like to create to take laws into your hands is actually a crime. But self-defense is not a crime. And self-defense is when somebody approach you directly and want to do something to you, you are allowed to defend yourself. But preempting a, a, an attack on you by preparing to respond, even though there is vacuum for such action, now becomes a crime. But is, all those is preempting self-defense a crime? Let okay, sorry. Sorry. Let's, let's be orderly, please. No, no, Let's no. be so, honest. So he's saying don't prepare. Don't prepare to be killed, basically. No, 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 no. You can prepare to be killed, but you can act only when you are about to be killed. What? Seriously. So, no, that, that is <laughs> Adamo. Adamo. Okay, right, okay. Uh, Mr. Right, Adamo. You don't have uh, right to start, Mr. Start, Adamo. to start the killing when you're not doing it. Thank you. Adamo. Oh, Adamo. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, well said. Please, please. Let's, let's right. keep the Take order, case, guys. Let's, let's keep the order. Yeah, we're about to... We're about to take a cue. Please. Guys, 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 let's calm down and, and take a, a new cue, okay? Uh, so, well, I have a few people already on cue. I've got Wale, Gogo, Balogun, Danny, Lupin, Natasha, Bo, and um, who else is there? Olof uh, Mojo. Uh, okay. Put me in the queue. Yes, of course, you're in the queue. So, Wale, please go ahead. Wally, are you there? Okay, hello? go, go. Yeah, hello? Please go ahead, Wally. Yeah, hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, give me... Thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I've been listening on and off. And I think that I, the last statement I heard, uh, Mr. Garba said that he wanted to... He wanted Twitter to pay $1 billion for the NSAS victims. Did you really mean that, Mr. Adamo? Exactly. That was my question. Wow. That's a big lie. Because you deliberately, you went after the NSAS protesters and you're here. What are you trying to prove? Like, are you, I, this is unbelievable that you're saying this. What did Twitter do to pay to the I actually went through your Twitter now and I couldn't even get through the, the tweets beyond uh, around that insult time. Perhaps you have disabled it. But I think that is a total lie that you just told, Mr. Adamo. And uh, we have what amnesia. actually broke my heart, what actually broke my heart was, you know, when Garba came uh, to the limelight in 2017, when he wanted to start um, a campaign for election, I was following him very closely on YouTube because I was quite enthusiastic and I was I was ha I was happy, but I didn't really know, understand his ideology or what values. I just know him. Okay, I was like, wow, this is great. I was actually following him very closely and I was happy, but um, unfortunately, um, I saw that he. At the end of the day, if you, if you go back in two thousand seventeen. He eventually dropped out of the race, not because he wasn't um, he, he wasn't selected, but I think because of the you know the the general thing that you usually do in Nigeria, where you have a lot of multi parties, and at the end of the day, they all just uh, uh, support one major candidate. That was actually what, and that really really uh, broke my heart that I, that he, that happened, and uh, and then. Mr. Garba, did you really? I want to really ask you directly now, and I want you to explain that. Do you really mean that you were trying to raise a billion dollars for the NSAS protesters? I really wish you can get the copy of the of the of the podcast. I think it's on my Twitter page. I published it very clearly that they have to be comp compensated one billion dollars from Twitter. It was very very clear. However, and you were the one of issue of Go ahead. Go ahead. So the issue, the issue of do I really mean it is absolutely true. And every single thing I said, I think I'm one of the young emerging politicians in Nigeria that has remained consistent on his policies. From the beginning in that 2017 till now, if you want to properly diagnose me, forget about my affiliations with the party in power or any other thing, just go to my raw message. 
you will see clearly that I remain consistent. And I really hardly ever double talk. Hardly ever double talk. One of the reasons why so many people that have been supporting me then, even though some of them, you know, I was being castigated for the same reason they are supposed to even left me, but because they understood the core of the message, they are there. Now, it has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that Nigeria need to benefit as opposed to get destroyed by NSAS from the international platform that the people are leveraging on. That's what I do. Excuse me, please. Can I just come in? So why did you withdraw the case? I withdrew the case completely from the court simply because at certain point in time, people themselves began to realize some of the point I was making was justified. After all, there was a heavy castigation and misunderstanding by so many people in Nigeria, especially the people of Nigeria and even the government. Even the government were not happy with my case. If you don't understand, people thought I was doing it for the government. No. Just read through the case, you will see. So, so, so there, was, there was this general castigation and then Twitter decided to be acting against presidents in the world, especially the president of the United States and so many other issues. And many people were coming to say, after all, Adomogarba has actually foresaw these things. It is actually good. And there was nobody is even giving the case attention. So the best solution is with this, with the satisfaction that people have identified that what I have done was in the 100% interest of the peace and security of the country, mm -hmm. then I can take out the case. However, Mr. Adamu, Mr. Adamu, Mr. Adamu. Let, yeah, Wale, please round up with a quick one. Five seconds. I haven't, I haven't really even spoken much, but anyway. Yeah, Mr. I thought Adamu. you had a question. Yeah, because we have loads of other questions coming and we want to keep this as okay. concise as possible. To, I'm going to be quick. Yeah, yeah but Mr. Adamu, uh, during the NSAR's time, you went, you went after the NSAR's protesters. You uh, called their hoodlums. You totally trashed them. And you even claimed that, uh, Perhaps no one died, and and then you're here uh, claiming that you tried to raise a billion dollars out of from the lawsuit, and I think that is totally um, um, you, you're not being honest here, and I don't think I, I'm I'm not buying it, honestly, and then uh, when it comes to the issues of Nigeria, um, you know if you go back in history, everything that is that has been happening in history is like history history repeating itself. Yeah, the way um, from 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 how, I mean, a certain ethnic group under the guise of something try to invade other. I know that this has been happening all over uh, the history of Nigeria. That is how it has been. But if you go back in the history, how uh, the uh, the case of Elori and the uh, invasion of uh, the Yoruba land. Uh, around the 1840s, before they were stopped around the uh, Bumosho area, uh, and I think that is what is still going on. If everyone, uh, if people are paying attention, even though I am a uh, proponent of Pan-Africanism, which I actually wanted to re respond to um, uh, earlier on when I was listening to uh, Bonka, I wanted to respond, but I didn't have time. So uh, that is another case because I, if I am to go there, it will take more time. So. Um, Mr. Adamu, what is going on in Nigeria is a case of invasion, as has been happening in our history. If anyone can pay attention, um, that is just what it is. And they are, you know, painting, using other uh, coloration. That's what I have to say for now. Bye. Yeah. Mr. Adamu. Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, we will be having a topic on Pan-Africanism. Bonka, yeah, thanks. Mr. Adama, please. Yes, I think um, um, the Wale made this point very, very clear. Um, there is a clear misunderstanding uh, of, 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 of his understanding of answers properly. And uh, also my, my understanding of answers. So I think it's not a problem from that side. Uh, so on the issue of history repeating itself uh i think uh, we also have responsibility to to reenact the history and make it better i think that is even why we're on this platform talking about this at this hour so thank you very much okay thank you go go please um thank you very much that um thank you Adamu, for your time so i was trying to get sorry um wally i was interjecting as your question because i had that as my first question 
but what I was trying to do was get my head around why you were suing Twitter. Why did you say you wanted a uh, billion dollars from them? Like, uh, where was it because they were um, passing information about NSAS and and broadcasting what was happening or helping people understand what was happening? What what exactly was their crime? Um, that's Twitter itself. Um, that's my first question. Do you want to take that or should I go on? Let's, let's let moments. him take that, Mr. Adamu. Why would yeah, you just even to consider? Yeah, why would you consider suing Twitter in the first place? Yeah, the only reason why I sued Twitter was because the leader of Twitter, the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, tweeted in support for donation funding for Ensas Mofen, and that's not his business. That's our country. But, uh, but that's the only reason. He, he can post answers and every activity that is going on on Twitter. I was also part of the hashtag. But I would not agree we have uh, somebody like him who, 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 who has a very strong commanding influence globally to ask people to pay money to continue to sustain what internally has been organized. Because I know usually it's not free. And that is why I went against that, his intention of... Uh, of, of, of asking um, his audience to donate, you know, for, for the NSAS movement, which worked very well. Because to the best of my knowledge, after that uh, uh, court uh, case, he never um, asked for donation after that, which is, which is good. He knows that he violated um, the principles of international rules. He knows that, and that's why he stayed away completely. That's just the only reason, nothing more than that. Okay, um, uh, 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 go go. I know you have a quick. You can make it real quick, so we can move on to FBI. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will leave that there, even though I have my reservations about it. But my other questions were uh, actually two questions. Um, one is uh, with the bandits. You talked about the bandits and Gumi trying to negotiate with them. So, and you also mentioned that the bandits had killed three thirty thousand. You said. If I could tell you right, but I heard you say that. Now, why have they not been proscribed terrorists? Is my first question. The bandits who you've uh, agreed have killed 30,000 people and we're trying to negotiate with them, but yet they're not on the list of Buhari's terrorists, but IPOB is. That's number one. Number two is um, you talked about the constitution and you talked about all oh, your the young, quote unquote, a young politician coming on board. But this is what I sense from you. You're saying, oh, we should leave the constitution, who, which you have agreed is fraudulent. No, but we should not touch it. We should, because it maintains a peaceful status quo just now, which I don't understand what peace is maintaining, but we should leave it and we shouldn't touch it because it's that's going into too much just now. So you're saying, bringing people on board to discuss a fraudulent document is too much for you as a young person. This is not Buhari who is 80 something years old. This is you as a young person talking about a constitution which you're going to rule under. You're, you're previously a political aspirant, a presidential aspirant. That constitution was to be, it's something you should have been ruling with and you realize it's fraudulent but you, you can't touch it now because it's too much for you to talk about. That's what I'm hearing you say. Why is it too much for us to discuss something that is but that is clearly, I mean, it's clearly the issue in Nigeria currently because all the leadership problems and everything that we're facing is as a result of that constitution that subjugates one region and gives power to just one person to control the, everything that is happening in the country. And you think we should just allow that slip and not touch it and discuss other things? Right. Why is that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much for your question regarding the proscription. Actually, it's not a bandit that killed 30,000 people. I believe it's terrorists with Boko Haram. The bandits' can't, numbers are still counting. Um, or I think both of them are still counting, but I think bandits uh, is a different case with Boko Haram. And I believe uh, the reason why. Uh, bandits are not yet proscribed as terrorists, uh, although there are a lot of processes in place to be able to coordinate and organize that, is uh, what delayed the process, I believe, is before an organization, before a terrorist organization can be declared, 
they must have a name and they must have a purpose they are trying to achieve and most purposes have to be territorially involved not necessarily economics you know and uh, and 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 also there must be standing leadership that is identified so currently no one knows the bandits whether they are fighting for certain territory they don't even have an association name nor have a standing leader you have group of people in silos all but when are they asking for ruga who is their so, leader who is their leader is always no 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 so this is so this is don't interrupt don't interrupt please yeah this is this is what you just said but uh but i don't believe that if he's their leader they will declare him and he will declare himself there is no organization in the world that was ever declared terrorist without having these basic structures first leadership second organizational name and five organizational third organizational goal which is territorially involved and these bandits i don't think these criteria are part of it but i think there are some um, legal framework that is being created to quickly find a way to put them because they are terrorists clearly but because they don't have these structures that should define them uh, as 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 a terrorist organization so that is why but i think these structures have been put in place on the issue of constitution you it may be very simple to talk about it very 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 simple to talk about it but we need to move around nigeria once you get out from abuja and lagos and then move down you will begin to see the real nigeria and this real nigeria don't even know that there is anything that is governing them other than the people that is in front of them that believe that these are their leaders they usually listen to the way they are being led from the radios and what they see from the tv and what they read around and also the conversations they have around them so we that means the constitution that is accepted by nigeria by african union by the united nations by almost all the 200 and so number of countries in the world should still be the gateway to making this Nigeria better. Any other way that we think about it, it might appear very simplistic based on our standards. But these things are what has been registered all over the world. So the best solution is to find a way to get ourselves through that same system and make that change. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Did you say our constitution is accepted by the UN and by everybody in the world? Exactly. If the that's constitution why, is not accepted by its own people, no, 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 no but that's, it. That's, that's why, you see, there are some people that don't accept it, there are some people that accept it in democracy, there are two sides. So the best solution is, we have to find a way to be pragmatic and deliberate about getting through to what is available before we can create what is not available. This is just a natural thermodynamics order that even governs everything that we do in our, in our lives. So we have to start from these structures we already have a structure there are so many people that are trying to get into the system and then all of us also have to participate into the process of trying to get into the system then we can be able to to to, to make a change all right so Mr. That, is, that, is, that is the best way I think. yeah mr dam just because we're keeping abreast of time we have about eight or so people lined up uh, so let's just make this real quick think if you can drop your thought uh, quickly please Think, are you there? Okay, um, think if you're not there, then let's move to the next person. Hear me. Think, are you there? You... Yes, can you hear me? Okay, good. Go ahead. Okay, so I was going to say, uh, you said something about um, the, um, the prevention, I mean, the, how did you put it? You said that the um just a minute i think i made a note self defense that the attempt to prevent uh, the use of i mean to defend yourself amounts to a crime um by international law um the right to self defense article 51 let me just quote it briefly um just a minute Article 51 states that uh, nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent right of underlying individual, I'm underlining that word, or collective self-defense. If an armed at attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. 
So the, the, the word there, inherent right of individual. Now, the, the cha that charter does not, there are no exceptions. So you, 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 the, what you presented was that something like anticipatory self-defense in which you have to prepare to prevent an attack on yourself is a crime. Under international law, it is not a crime. Anticipatory self-defense, self-defense against non-state actors, self-defense against low gravity use of armed forces, of armed force, are permitted under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. So how does this pan out that you say when people try to prevent attacks upon themselves by I mean, based on anticipation that it is a crime. Is there is there anywhere in the Nigerian law where this is stated? Can you please tell me? Thank you. You see, the issue of defense, human rights, is actually an international law that is enshrined on almost all the constitutions uh, of 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 the of every country, especially those that believe in the existence of the UN. But like in our own case, in Nigeria or any of the modern countries that we have today, the right, the definition of state itself one of the characteristics of definition of state, the state is its capacity to mobilize uh, legitimate use of, use of violence. So it means um, it's only the state that should have responsibility to have organizational capacity to exert violence. Apart from that, no any other body in the state without the without privilege or authority from the state that should organize itself and try to use violence. How about if when the state has failed to have responsibility? I'm coming. I'm coming. No, I'm coming no. To I have that. just read I'm Article 51 to, article. to you now. Sorry, the I'm inherent to right to self or collective, collective no, 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 to right to self or collective self-defense. And no, it doesn't, no, no, that's why, it doesn't, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, no. The collective is the state. Why? The individual self-defense is a different thing. I cannot begin to say that I and all my community will not mobilize against the state because of some threat we have seen. Collective is not what the state. Do, collective can be at subnational level as well. It does, it does no, not only represent that, the state. This is you where you can make do that state. at subnational level with the authority of the state. But the monopoly no. of that violence it, is it, it does right not preclude the state. It does not require, if it required the authority of the state, it will have been stated in this article. It does not preclude the authority. It does not have to get authorization from the state. No, because it's an armed attack. Yes, it when is no longer self-defense if it's when, relying when, on the state. When the state security collapses, then who do you expect to go and get authority from? You, are you going to get authority from now. the masquerade? Now we have we have these discussions about the constitution currently, and that is where the breaking point is coming from. Why don't we think of state policing and local policing? Now, if we are state if we have the, not the question, state policing, the question is right to self defense. Have, and I'm the, the stop trying no, to I'm dodge not, the shift the goalposts. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's not it's the same like thing. It's two different things. All right, Smokey, Since just let him respond. The system is broken. You need to have a state policy and local policy, but there are still state, a state, state police where you will give organs. people dang guns and security is under the exclusive list of this same constitution that you are exactly. upholding. Exactly, he thinks people are stupid. That state police why, that you will give people that dang people are stupid. That is why the constitution with people carrying AK-47 uh, 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 guns. That is why the constitution we all agree that it needs a lot of panel beating. And we have to get in there to do the panel meeting. Don't need the panel meeting, Adamu. It needs to be completely overhauled. Yes, completely that's fine. Let it be. Let it be completely overhauled. But but we have to. People have to be there to do it. The right mind, mind the right people with the right mindset have to be there to do it. But again. With that, you can now have organized defensive mechanism, all which will be a functional part of the state. How can you do but it anything... when you agree that your constitution is a fraud? And who are you going to send to go and do it, to swear by a fraudulent constitution? Like, no. you keep moving this goalpost like people on this app are stupid, or we didn't go one to of the problem, okay. One of the problems we have, especially in Nigeria or Africa, is thinking that constitution is what guides somebody to 
what, what, what guides the moral conscience of a leader. The moral conscience of a leader is something that needs to be, to, to be troubleshooted at the point when the leader is aspiring for an office. He has to move around, he has to talk, he has to convince and make his own views very open and assertive and clear beyond reasonable doubt that uh, he has the capacity Mr. to do that before they get there. But we all depend on this paper that once they get in there, they just keep it aside. Mr. Adam, uh, um, please, let's just move on to the next person. Uh, FBI, please. <laughs> FBI. <laughs> Hello, FBI. Yeah, what's up? What's up? Yes, it's your turn to <laughs> have a go at him. Okay, we'll move on to the next person. Natasha, are you there? Hello, I am there. All right, please go ahead. Hi, it's just a quick question, and it's basically a continuation from GoGo. And I just wanted to ask, is it that the Constitution itself is flawed or is it the implementation of the Constitution that is flawed? Can you please clarify that? Thank you. I think both. There are some aspects of the Constitution that is flawed that need to be fixed and there are also implementation gaps in the Constitution that need to be attended to. Please, what aspect of the Constitution do you not agree with? Thank you. Yeah, the parts of the constitution um, that 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 federalize the security structure, I don't think it is actually to the benefit of Nigeria. Natural and, Yes, that federalizes security. Everything will have to come from the center at every time. That I don't think 